Honorable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Call the clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as shown on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Uh, yes, President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, Senator Waters. Uh, hello, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the sixth Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report as circulated. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Waters. Did you? I'll put it again. Sorry, Senator Waters. Uh, I'm, I'll put it again. So, uh, Senator, Senator Waters is seeking uh, leave. Is leave agreed to? Uh, Senator's order, order. I've just put the question for the second time. So, Senator Waters is seeking leave. Is leave granted? I'm sorry, Senator Waters, leave is not granted. Contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the sixth IPCC synthesis report. The Greens are suspending standing orders in both chambers today to discuss an incredibly depressing and landmark report that was released overnight, which is the last wake-up call for this parliament and, frankly, every other parliament around this whole planet. <laughs> the findings of this report are no, are no surprise, but they are incredibly challenging. And the motion that we have moved today notes that the release of the synthesis report uh, overnight relating to the climate emergency, and it notes the statement by UN Secretary-General Antonio Guterres that there can be no 
new coal, oil or gas projects uh, in Australia, and that in fact Australia and other developed nations must phase out coal by 2030. And it calls on the government to heed the call of the IPCC and the UN Secretary-General and stop approving new coal and gas projects. Now, the synthesis report shows that we're already at 1.1 degrees of warming, and it also says that projected emissions from existing fossil fuel infrastructure will see us blow any chance of constraining warming to 1.5 degrees. It says the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. Now, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres puts it beautifully when he says, Humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. The climate time bomb is ticking. But today's IPCC report is a how-to guide to defuse the climate time bomb. It is a survival guide for humanity. It shows the one and a half degree limit is achievable, but it will take a quantum leap in climate action. The report is a clarion call to massively fast-track climate efforts by every country and every sector and on every time frame. Specifically, and I'm still quoting here from the Secretary General, no new coal and the phasing out of coal by 2030 in OECD countries and 2040 in other countries, ending all international public and private funding of coal, ensuring net zero electricity uh, generation by 2035 for all developed countries, ceasing all licensing or funding of new oil and gas, stopping any expansion of existing oil and gas reserves, shifting subsidies away from fossil fuels to a just energy transition, and establishing a global phase down of existing oil and gas production compatible with 2050 global net zero target. I don't know how much clearer this guy is going to be. No new coal, oil or gas. And yet what have we got here in Australia? We've got 116 projects in the pipeline. They were in the pipeline under the last terrible government. They're still in the pipeline under this new government. And I thought we had an election. And I thought people voted for a change. So you kind of expect that there might be a policy change. But right now we've got 116 of these projects in the works. And the government is proposing a mechanism that's going to do absolutely sweet nothing to stop any of them. It's an absolute outrage. 116 new coal, oil and gas projects, $11 billion a year in taxpayer money going to subsidise the fossil fuel sector. I mean, seriously, are we in a budget crisis or not? $368 billion for nuclear subs for some phony war when the real war is against our planet. And it's being driven by greedy fossil fuel companies that are reaping billions for their own personal benefit. Meanwhile, ordinary people are paying the price. We've seen floods, we've seen fires, we know what the devastation looks like, and that's at 1.1 degrees. Seriously, wake up, folks. Please go and read this report. I know we're all busy, but go and read the damn thing. If, you, if you're not awake after having read that, then honestly, I don't know how many fossil fuel donations you need to accept to continue to have your head in the sand. This parliament has a decision to take. And as the world scientists have said, the decisions that we take today will influence the next thousand years. This is serious, folks, and I do not want the might of the fossil fuel companies, their dirty donations and their promises of incredibly overpaid lobbying jobs after you folk leave this place. I don't want that making the decisions for our nation. We have a chance to actually make a difference here. We have all of the world's scientists laying out the roadmap for us for what to do. You, you can't say we weren't warned. We've had years and years of these reports. They've now synthesised it for us. No new coal, oil and gas. It's what the Greens will always fight for. We can have a discussion about how quickly we exit, and the UN says let's exit by 2030, but no new coal, oil and gas. Stop giving them public money. Stop giving them approvals. Stop taking their dirty donations and stop going off to work for them after you leave this place. Yeah. Uh, Minister, and then I'll give the call to you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a brief contribution on the suspension of standing orders today. The government will not be supporting this, the suspension, but I do want to be clear that we do think the issue of climate change is real and requires serious action. And uh, to uh, start where Senator Waters um, finished, 
uh, to quote her, we have a chance to make a difference. Well, the government um, supports that and we agree that we do have a chance to make a difference and the most pressing opportunity we have to do that is to pass the safeguards legislation that will be coming before uh, the parliament in the, next, um, in the next week. The latest intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC report, released last night makes uh, the case for urgent action and confirms what we already know. It puts in pretty stark terms that there is a rapidly closing window for transformative climate action both here and around the world. And it shows that global warming has increased at an unprecedented rate over the past decade, resulting in more frequent and severe droughts and cyclones. By the 2030s, every region in the world is expected to face increasing risks from climate change. It's already at our door. And this report, unfortunately, just confirms yet again the wasted decade under the Liberal and National governments where they refused to accept the science, refused to take action when they were in a position to do so, and were more preoccupied with fighting each other, on, particularly on climate and energy policy, than doing their job. And that's having real consequences for our nation, our region and our world. Australians already know that they're being imp impacted by catastrophic climate change. Severe flooding, drought, megafires, lower quality air quality from those fires. Every Australian has felt the ferocious effects of a warming planet. So we all know that climate change is real. Well, most of us in this chamber know that climate change is real. It's here and it's starting uh, to have an impact. And it would be great if this fortnight, instead of having suspension motions and things like that, we could actually pass the legislation that is going to give us the opportunity to start making or start doing the work that should have been happening for years but hasn't been happening. And I accept that not everybody agrees with um, the, the um, detail of the design, that it's not perfect in everyone's sense, but it is a start to make a difference. If we genuinely, if we genuinely want to make a difference, we have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. We can't have those that want more action on climate change and those that want no action on climate change determining that nothing happens. I mean, that's the risk that we face here. And we will continue to work with anyone in this chamber that wants to deal uh, and make a difference and to start reducing emissions and to do it in the way that we've got the policy design through the safeguard mechanism and the regulation that will come down, down the road to actually start doing that. I and mean, that's what needs to be happening. That's the, that's the biggest, no, no four or 10 hour debates on the IPCC report will actually do what passing the legislation that will come before this parliament will start to do if it gets the support of this chamber. I mean, because the counterfactual is that it doesn't pass and we don't put um, reform the safeguard mechanism and we aren't able to reduce emissions in the way that the safeguard mechanism is designed, that is the counterfactual um, of, of this chamber not, not supporting that legislation, that we're stuck again with nothing happening. So we do think um, that we should be progressing the most obvious, the most pressing and the, the legislation that is actually before this parliament, that will make a difference. And we can work together to do it. And we can't let those opposite who sit there and say they support uh, a net zero by 2050, or you used to support that anyway, and you used to support a safeguard mechanism and you want to see change, sit there and block everything. The coalition who block absolutely everything in this chamber. You are, going, you are setting yourselves up to be the most obstructionist opposition in recent times. Absolutely. The way you are uh, not involving yourself in, in legislation. I mean, what are you guys getting paid for? You come here and you don't even um, play yourself into the discussions because it's just a straight up no. That's, that's, the, uh, that's what the people that support you are getting out of this. They're getting. Uh, bodies that sit in this chamber and don't participate and don't involve themselves and don't negotiate. And, and that's what has led to this policy failure or the effect Senator of Scar, this. Have a point of order. The minister's reflecting generally upon uh, members of this side of the chamber, I believe, in a in quite a personal and disorderly fashion, and she should withdraw. I'm not quite sure. I get, I'm not sure I could get to that bar, but I'd ask the minister to reflect on her comments. And I'll reflect on them, but remark. it seems that it's pretty standard Senate operating procedure. Um, but that is the opportunity that 
the Senate is faced with in the next little while, in the next two weeks, we can actually start to make a difference. We can show Australians that we're taking this seriously and that we're working together to, to um, mitigate some of the risks of climate change. Senator, I'll go to Senator Dunningham, then I'll give you the call, Senator Roberts. Yes, that's me now. Um, thank you, <laughs> Deputy President. Sorry. It's a delight to be uh, <laughs> participating in this debate. Uh, but look, um, of course, the opposition won't be supporting uh, this um, suspension, uh, not, not because we don't deem the issue important. It's probably just not the form to have the debate. I mean, Senator Waters herself did concede that most of us haven't yet had a chance to read it. Some important points are made. But look, um, you've read it. Well, good on you. That's excellent. I'm pleased for you. We'll take the time to have a look at it properly and respond properly as well. Um, but look, it, there's a couple of things in there that uh, are important, and uh, I think the motion highlights them well, and I'm pleased that it is here for discussion. But there are other elements to this that aren't considered in the motion. And I just was listening to Senator Waters' contribution there, um, and the point was made that uh, the ordinary people of Australia, the voters, the people who send us to this place, are the ones who are going to be paying the price. And that is true, both with the impacts of climate change, but more importantly, with the impacts of higher power prices, which is what you are advocating for when we talk about this carte blanche banning of coal and gas. The one thing that no one seems to, from that corner of the chamber over there, inject into this debate is concern for those who actually are doing it tough. The businesses, the people that work in them, the households, those people who actually are struggling with increased costs of living, including, including through higher power prices. And it is something that we actually need to deal with, and I would love it if that were in the motion. That might be something the people of Australia would like us to be dealing with. Yes, there are bits of legislation before this chamber, as the minister outlined in her contribution, the safeguard mechanism. Um, interesting contribution from the minister, though. Um, it was made clear to everyone in this chamber that the opposition will be opposing the amendments to the safeguard mechanism, and it was something that Senator Wish Wilson pointed out by interjection earlier on, that the coalition brought in. It was a structure that was put in place to incentivise investments in emissions reduction through better tech, better R&D, working with big emitters to actually bring down their emissions rather than taxing them, which is the model we have before us. And so we proudly say no to a model put forward by a government that is going to drive up the cost of living. And it's not right for the minister to say, well, you know, you don't come here to contribute to legislation, you're dealing yourself out of the game. The reality is we're happy to work with anyone that comes forward with a good idea. Bad ones should be scrapped, come forward with something better, and we'll work with you on that. You can't just come in here and say it's our way or the highway. You might start by providing us the modelling, the modelling that everyone in this chamber except for the Australian Labor Party wants the world to see. Every senator in this place, every party, want the government to table the information we're expected to trust them on that is the basis for the legislation they claim is going to fix climate change in this country. They've refused on numerous occasions to provide the Senate with that information, and I hope they come to their senses, because if they don't, it's going to be them who are going to be preventing the world from dealing with climate change in this country, as they put it. If this bill doesn't pass, we've lost the one opportunity to deal with this issue. Show us the modelling. If it's good modelling, if it actually speaks to what the government says the bill will do, the impact it will have both on emissions reductions but also availability of carbon credits, what impact there may or may not be on the cost of living, on power prices, show us the modelling. What is there to hide? There hasn't even been the offer of a, a private briefing. That wouldn't be good enough in my books, but not even that to convince senators who are going to be asked to vote on this legislation uh, the opportunity to see this and make a decision for ourselves. But I come back to the points in Senator Waters' motion here. Uh, there are some comments around uh, reference to the UN Secretary General's comments, and I was uh, uh, actually I did see some interviews taking place this morning. Um, a scientist from the ANU, who works uh, in the area of climate change, characterised the Secretary General's uh, uh, takeout on the report as uh, fairly flourished and a lot of emotion in it. And he had a slightly more tempered view on that. He also referenced the multiple tools that are available to governments to deal with these things, including, including uh, investments in technology to reduce emissions, something I talked about before, something the coalition has a proud track record of. Characterised 
uh, most unfairly and incorrectly by the government and others in this chamber. But we're proud of the record and the investments we have in renewables and our plan to reduce emissions. But we're not going to do it by making Australians pay through the nose, keep the heaters off in winter, not be able to turn the lights on, not be able to open their businesses. It's the wrong way to do it, and we won't be supporting this suspension. Senator Roberts, I, I indicated that the crossbench, and then I'll come back. I note that you wish to call. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. One Nation will not be supporting this, suspension, this motion to suspend standing orders. The real question is something that, that lies beneath this suspension order request, and that is, are the Greens patsies and fools, or are they complicit in fraud? Now, they're claiming an escalating climate emergency, a climate breakdown. Here we go again. No data to back it up. We know that the Greens have never provided any empirical scientific evidence or logical scientific points to back up their assertion of an escalating climate emergency. Senator Waters, I challenged Senator Waters in a, to a debate in public in 2010, 2010, 14 year, 13 years ago, and she still will not debate me. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you. I challenged her again, almost daily and weekly, since the 9th of September. Now we hear calls of, leave me alone. I haven't got the data. No. So there is no evidence that these, these uh, Greens have that, that back up their claim. Secondly, secondly, I'll get to the report in a minute. The second thing is that the United Nations Secretary General says that is, is the, her, her reason for the motion A2, statement by the Secretary General. Do we know that Greta Thunberg, who did not finish high school, was yesterday given an honorary doctorate in theology by the University of Helsinki? It's a religion. It's a religion, this climate stuff. And the great God is the United Nations. Did you elect the United Nations uh, Secretary General to run over our country? No, I didn't. Never been elected. Let's have a look at the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports. The first in 1990 was built, built on a fraud, but even that showed that the medieval warming period was warmer than today's temperatures. Warmer than today's temperatures. That was quickly whipped out of the United Nations next report in 1995, which was which the scientists gathered in, under the UN banner said there was no evidence of warming due to human production of carbon dioxide. Yet Ben Santa, one of the scientists, went in and changed that report and presented it in 1995, based on a fraud. In 2001, 2007, 2013, 2020, there were reports by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Let's look at chapter 12. In each of those reports, there was only one sole chapter claiming warming and attributing it to carbon dioxide from human activity. In, chapter, in 2001, it was chapter 12. 2007, it was chapter 9. 2013, chapter 10. Not one of those reports, sole chapters claiming warming and attributing it to human carbon dioxide, contains any evidence for that, that uh, claim. Senator Not Wish one. Wilson, Same in 2020. Do you have a point of order? Order, President. I can put up with a lot in this chamber, but having Senator Roberts directly yell at me from five feet away is very difficult to take. Could you ask him to address, address he, well, the chair as he should? He was, he, was to parliamentary going, he was going through me, but it's a lesson to us all to speak through the chair. We always see that when someone has no evidence, they rely upon slurs and innuendos and misrepresentations. Thank you for not being able to challenge my argument. Now let's have a look, let's have a look at uh, the basis of this United Nations reports. Maurice Strong was a crook. He died in 2015 after returning from exile, self-imposed exile in China. Maurice Strong started the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as a political tool to get his way for his objectives globally. Maurice Strong started the Chicago Climate Exchange. He was a director of the Chicago Climate Exchange. He sought to make billions of dollars of profits from the Chicago Climate Exchange. He was then pursued for the oil for food scandal in the United Nations, complicit. Another scandal in the United Nations. He was also wanted by the American law enforcement agencies for crimes and serious crimes in the United States, including one very big crime in the, in the Western United States. He fled in exile. He's a crook. He's a crook. And that's what the Greens are basing their policies on. That's what the Labor Party is basing its policies on. And that's what the Liberal Nationals, with a few exceptions, I note Senator Rennick, with a few exceptions, are basing their policies on. 
the basis of these policies destroying everyday Australians' lives economically, socially, mentally, morally, is based upon a crook. And you've fallen for it. And what's more, you're now getting the people of Australia to pay for it. That is inhuman, it's irresponsible, it's dishonest. Are the Greens guilty of fraud or are they simply patsies fools? I note that China produces 4.5 billion tonnes of coal and gets more of our coal while we're not allowed to use our 500 million tonnes that we produce in this country. They produce nine times as much and yet they have got no agreement with the 2050 net zero. This is a fraud and this is, this is why we will not support this suspension. No, Senator McAllister indicated she wanted the call and then I'll look to the call after. But I can't quite remember who spoke, uh, came first. So. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, well, the government welcomes the report that was released over, the, over last night. And in commencing my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge the Australian scientists and experts who contributed to this report and to the IPCC process. Australia has a strong track record of producing world-class climate science and research. I thank them for their work. Well, this report will be concerning for many Australians. Scientists have been telling us for decades that without significant emissions reduction, we can expect worsening and cascading climate events. And it, report, it also confirms what we already know, that there is a rapidly closing window for action on climate change. Actually, Australian communities know this. They know this in their hearts because they are already experiencing the reality of climate change. And even when faced with devastating bushfires, with devastating floods, the previous government refused to act. And those on the other side, along with their enablers on the crossbench, spent 10 years arguing among themselves, refusing to do what was needed to lead Australia out of the worst effects of climate change. And they presided over a decade of delay and of denial and dysfunction and delivered nothing. And finally, we have a federal government that is committed to strong and swift reform. We are unapologetically focused on transforming Australia's domestic economy to a low carbon economy. And I want to make this point. It is the most important thing that we can do to support the ambitious international action, collaborative, collective action that is necessary to contain global warming. Now, we can't control the energy choices of other nations, but we can make sure that Australia makes our own contribution to build confidence that collectively, as a globe, we can do this. And of course, this is, the, this is the point of the report. It sounds the warning bell of the dangers of inaction, but it makes the point that there is still a pathway, a pathway to stay below two degrees and to come as close as we can to one and a half degrees, as we agreed to in our international arrangements. This is, of course, the focus of our international effort, and we are working closely with international partners to advance practical action on climate change and build new clean supply chains. But most importantly, we are acting at home. One of our first acts in government was to legislate an ambitious but achievable emissions reduction target of 43 per cent by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And the Powering Australia Plan invests in this transformation—$20 to upgrade, expand and modernise our electricity grid to support more renewable power. $1.9 billion to establish the Powering the Regions Fund, which will support new jobs and the decarbonisation of emissions intensive industries and help ensure that regional Australians drive Australia's transformation into a renewable energy superpower. The Driving the Nation Fund and the National Electric Vehicle Strategy provide us the opportunity to invest in cleaner, cheaper transport. And while we work, while we make every effort to limit future climate change, there are some changes that we now can't avoid. And we need to support communities to adapt to the impacts that are already baked in and build their resilience. The parliament is currently considering a most important bill, 
a bill to reform the safeguard mechanism, a mechanism that, until the last election, was the stated policy of those opposite. But after 10 years of denial and delay, that mechanism never actually achieved what it was supposed to do, it didn't contain rising emissions from our biggest emitters. And this is the first opportunity we'll have, after nearly 10 years of these guys, to turn that around. And our proposal will deliver 205 million tonnes of emission reductions by 2030, a workable policy that will reduce emissions and reduce the emissions into our atmosphere. And the Chamber has a choice. The Chamber has a choice this fortnight to continue to allow big emitters to continue with no real restrictions on how much they can pollute or to require them to drive down Australia's emissions and put us on track for net zero by 2050. Every bit of emissions reduction makes a difference, and that's why we have to seize this opportunity and not squander it, because that is what the Australian people expect. Now, I'm going to give the call to Senator Hanson Young, and then the remaining minutes of the debate I'm giving to Senator Thorpe, which is about three to four. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an important suspension today because there is no greater issue facing the future of our country, indeed the future of the rest of the world. And I want to address my comments to the children uh, who are watching us in the gallery today because this report paints a warning sign and a very bleak picture about your future. And I want to say through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, to the kids up there watching that we have a responsibility to secure your future, to look after the planet for you and your children, to ensure that we take the warning signs that have been given over and over again by scientists seriously, that we act on them. This report shows clearly that runaway, dangerous climate change is here. And rather than sprinting, as authors of the report have said, we are simply walking. And we are sleepwalking into climate catastrophe. We know what needs to be done. This report outlines clearly what needs to be done. We have to stop expanding fossil fuels and we have to phase out our current use of the dirty pollution from coal, gas and oil. We need to get out of coal by 2030, this report says very clearly. We can't keep spending taxpayers' money and public subsidies on the fossil fuel industry. And for every dollar that we're spending on fossil fuel subsidies, we need even more to be spent on responding to the climate crisis that is here right now already. We've seen some debate over the last few days about the enormous amount of money, the $370 billion that Australians are going to fork out for submarines in this country. Because of a threat, we are told, a huge global security threat. Well, there's nothing more threatening to our survival as the human species on this planet as climate change. Where is the billions of dollars coming from wealthy countries to address the climate crisis? We know that the climate has already changed. We're already dealing with the threats to our livelihoods, our homes, our jobs, our economy. We've seen the floods. We've experienced the heartache of people's homes being destroyed their businesses demolished and, sadly, the loss of lives. The fires are still burnt into our recent memory. And what science is telling, that the scientists are telling us already is that before we know it, we are going to be back there again. It is not negotiable to sit here and take piecemeal action on the climate crisis. No no we need to make sure 
that we take these warnings seriously so that we can actually address the crisis that we are confronted with. It has been greed and complacency that has ruled the day, Mr Acting President, and it's time it stopped. Senator Hanson, thank you. To the question is that the suspension of standard order is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required, ring the bells. Order. Uh, close, uh, close the doors. Close the doors. Okay. The question put by the Greens, uh, Senator Waters, was that suspension of standard orders be 
Agreed to. Uh, the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim to tell it for the ayes, Senator Cadell to tell it for the noes. Well done. Order. The results of the division there are 11 ayes, 27 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative, and I'll let senators vacate the chamber. He won't be participating before I call the clerk. And while I'm at it, welcome back former Senator Rachel Seawood from the great state of Western Australia. Welcome back, Rachel. I take it you're not taking up an advisor's position. You've just come to say hello. Clerk. Government business orders of the day number one. Referendum, machinery provisions, amendment bill 2022, second reading debate and amendment moved by Senator Hume. I will call Senator Davey and remind senators if you're not participating in the conversation, if they could quietly leave, please. Thank you. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I was speaking on this yesterday, and uh, for those viewing at home, I, I started out by absolutely saying that we all support the right for Australians to have a say on this very important issue. We all want to support a referendum, but we want a fair referendum. We want to make sure that the referendum is conducted um, with, with full disclosures. And um, we, on this side, as I said yesterday, raised three very important points. And I got as far as talking about the equal funding for both a yes and no campaign. And we want the equal funding because we want the referendum to be conducted fairly. We want both sides to be able to operate compliant with all our disclosure and regulatory regimes. By having a formal structure, by having yes and no campaigns that are identified by parliament, recognised by parliament and funded, um, we will have a formal structure to minimise the risk of foreign interference to minimise the risk of um, misinformation and, as I said yesterday, to also minimise the risk of letting the Googles and the Amazons and the Metas of the world act actually run this debate. And we believe that we need to look at simple and practical steps that put structure around this process to help our regulators to help our agencies manage the referendum and to give Australians confidence. That is why, on this side, we have been advocating so forcefully, particularly for the inclusion 
of a pamphlet outlining both the yes and no sides of the debate. We know from past referendum data from the Australian Electoral Commission that when they provide mailed material to voters during elections, at least 40 per cent of recipients actually use that documentation as a main source of information on casting their vote. We also know that electoral events are increasingly influenced by misinformation. And we've all spoken about misinformation in this place. So for the government to refuse to recognise yes and no organisations, um, they are opening the door to more misinformation. I, I do want to, though, acknowledge that the government has now agreed to our call for a pamphlet that outlines both the yes and the no campaigns. Um, it does, however, look like the government is putting caveats around uh, those pamphlets and how it will be produced, and, and I would implore the government to just let the pamphlets go out, uh, acknowledged and recognised by this place, sent out to all voters and made available in different languages to ensure that people can make their own informed decision. Having an official yes and no campaign will make things simpler for Australian people. It will make it simpler for the regulatory environment and will make it simpler for the conduct of the referendum. Um, we know that there will be a significant number of participants and organisations in this referendum who won't be associated with political parties and who don't regularly participate in electoral events. And we want to make sure that by having a single point of coordination for both the yes and the no campaigns to provide education, there is a capacity to have an audit process, an audit process for donations, an audit process to ensure there's no foreign inter in interference, an audit process to ensure the integrity of the referendum. Um, we've also called for equal funding, which I believe the government has said a flat out no to, and yet um, the government has set aside $9.5 million for a Facts of the Voice campaign, which it does say is not a de facto yes campaign. It says it's an awareness campaign to include the Facts of the Voice. Um, however, we've only got their word for that. We've got no oversight into how uh, this um, education or civics campaign will be run, who will be in charge of it. Um, we know that there is already um, significant act activity by our government agencies promoting the yes side. Uh, the National Indigenous Affairs Agency, um, which ironically, with its 1,200 staff and 39 officers around Australia, actually has as one of its um, reasons for being is to uh, work with the government to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' interests are considered in developing policy. Kind of sounds a bit like a voice to me, but obviously it's a bureaucracy um, and not the voice. But they are also out there um, working hard to ensure people are aware of what the voice is and what it means to them and, and uh, what the referendum means. Um, I note that the um, National Indigenous Australians Agency is also uh, will be have processes upgraded through this expenditure of this 9.5 million. Um, it will upgrade their website, will provide information in 30 languages, and will develop a more comprehensive information program 
on the facts of the voice and the relevant civics information. Now, we do need to be confident that it's not facts of why we need a voice, but it is outlining the, uh, what the voice could mean on both sides of the debate, both for and against. The money also, according to a report in The Guardian, the money is also for paid media placements for the voice information program to significantly expand the reach across the broader community. Again, we need to be confident that it is unbiased information being presented under the banner of a civics education campaign. We need to ensure that we give Australians balanced information so that Australians can make up their own mind. Because, as I said from the outset, I absolutely support and respect the right of Australians to have their say on this issue. Absolutely. But when this issue is run, we want to make sure that it's run fairly, uh, that it's run by officials in an unbiased manner, and uh, that Australians can have confidence that when they do access information, it is legitimate information, that it's not uh, information that's being rolled out by keyboard warriors, uh, that it's respectful. Importantly, it's got to be respectful information as well, because we want this debate to be respectful. Um, we want this debate to be conducted openly and transparently. And that's why we've put forward our, our three key asks. To have an official yes and no pamphlet, and I acknowledge the government has now agreed to that request. But importantly, to also uh, identify official yes and no campaigns so that we can verify them, not have them Twitter verified or <coughs> Google verified or Meta verified, but actually verified by this place, and also to fund it. So it's funded fairly, but also so the organisations uh, can ensure that they do meet our regulatory requirements. Um, I know there is a lot to go in this debate. There are a lot of speakers on the second reading list, and I will listen to all their contributions with interest. Uh, there are also a lot of questions that need to be answered and will be answered, hopefully, uh, during the campaign committee. So I do reserve my right. Um, I, I have not yet finalised my position on this very important matter, and I will listen to the, the committee uh, stages with interest and uh, reserve my right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Davies. Senator Lambie. Ah, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Two weeks ago, or about two weeks ago, I spent five days on the ground in Alice Springs. It wasn't my first trip to Alice, and no doubt it won't be my last. I've always been a big believer in listening and talking to communities on the ground. I find it's the best way to find out what is really going on. Alice Springs is full of people trying to do the best that they possibly can under the circumstances to make their lives and their children's lives better. I arrived just after the alcohol restriction had, had been reinstated and I was told by the locals and the police that rate of violence and crimes had already, had already started to fall dramatically. Senators in this place might like to know that most of the Aboriginal organisations in Alice warned the Northern Territory government not to lift that alcohol ban. But like too many in government, they didn't listen. I met with many Aboriginal people and organisations again providing great service to their community. I want to give a few examples here. So like Jason, who with his partner Steph runs a boxing academy a small club hosting between 20 and 50 kids every day at the Alice Springs Community Centre. They are operating out of a tin shed that is not fit for purpose. The kids there, they love it though, they are happy, they are strong, they are fit, and Jason and Steph do a lot of work, they work hard, and they get almost no government assistance. 
The kids see the same faces every day asking them, how are you going? Three simple words, how are you going? Consistency and structure is what these kids need, what so many of us in this place probably already take for granted. These kids know, need to know that they are safe and that their homes are safe. And Alice Springs is not short of organisations providing services across the board. That may be a good thing, but what I keep hearing from the Aboriginal people in Alice and abroad was, there's lots of money in Alice, but things aren't getting any better. Gee, I don't know how many times I've heard that after chasing for that cashless debit card over the last nine years. Where's all the money going? Where's all the money? In the 2021-22 budget, the Australian government allocated $5.7 billion to the Indigenous Advancement Strategy over four years to 2024-25. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm like many other taxpayers, and we have no problem in giving taxpayers money going, when it's going to programs and when people need that support. But we need to know, is it working? And if it isn't, why are we still funding it? Why? The Minister for Aboriginal Affairs says the voice will improve the situation. Oh, yeah, OK. Because the gap isn't closing fast enough. It's not even close. Especially when you consider the billions of tax taxpayer dollars that have been spent. Another place I visited in Alice was the Central Australian Women's Legal Service. The demand on their services has been increasing dramatically. These amazing women and people in there that work want to do more and they get lots of requests from remote communities, especially across the whole central desert. There is a huge amount of need for regular legal education. They want to do more, but they don't have the funding. Last May, all of the women's legals, legal services across Australia lobbied hard and got $129 million. But according to the Central Australian Women's Legal Service, and I quote, and I quote, the funding has not reached the intended beneficiaries, but has been distributed broadly to include mainstream service providers, end quote. What's new? In other words, the money didn't go to where it is most needed. It wasn't targeted. What's new? Government money not well targeted. I would have thought you guys in the red would have learned for nine years in the blue. Not well targeted. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for funding programs at work and listening to Aboriginal people and community is crucial. Because you know what? Not all communities are the same. How about that? You wouldn't know that unless you'd been visiting them on a regular basis, year in, year out. I spent a lot of time in Alice just listening. What I heard over and over again is there is cash, lots of cash, but we, always, we almost have no data on what is actually working and what isn't working. Could it be that there are too many organisations, shop fronts? We need more accountability and transparency. We need more rigorous oversight on organisations that don't report on their success or, or the lack of success of programs. And please don't think that I'm just having a go at Aboriginal organisations, because I can assure you past government ministers have also had their paws in the honey pot. Part of the royalties from the mining companies on Aboriginal land are invested in the Aboriginal Benefit Account, or ABA. In 2006-08, the federal government took some of this money away from land councils and gave federal ministers more control over where the cash went. So in 2006, Minister Mao Bruff went into the honeypot to fund a festival. I'm not sure how that's helping the Indigenous. In his own electorate, mind you. How about that? How convenient. I'd love to know what the positive outcomes of that were. Then in 2017, then Minister Senator then Nigel Scullion used an ABA grant to pay for an Indigenous employment program headed up by, you wouldn't guess it, you just wouldn't guess it, the President of the Northern Territory Liberal Party. Jobs for mates. And the government talks about unprecedented investment to close the gap. Oh dear. All Australians want to know is is that their money is going to programs that are effective and are closing the gap. That's all we want to know. I've seen the gap with my very own eyes for way too long. I've seen young Aboriginal girls with babies on their hips and tracking bracelets on their ankles. And I tell you, it bloody brings tears to my eyes. That's where we're at. 
We're having girls that aren't even old, old enough to be mothers. They are children having children themselves with bracelets around their ankles. That's where we're at. I met a young teenager who was described to me as Alice Springs' best car thief. This young boy has been in and out of detention. When he gets out, he doesn't go home because his home isn't safe and he isn't the only one. He sleeps under a bridge and steals food until he ends up back in detention again. That is his safety net. That is very sad. The detention centre is his safety net. That is where he is at. And like I said, he is not the only one. I have to ask, where are the services at the front gate of the detention centre? Why is this a revolving door for this young man and many others? Where's the money going? Where's the money? I said, as I said, this wasn't my first visit to Alice. In 2020, I spent some time in Alice and a lot of time in communities in Northern Territory, Western Australia and South Australia. There were highlights and there were lowlights. The highlight of my trip was the community, community of Millingimby in the top end. This community has its own thriving design business and their own credit union. The most heartbreaking day was another community in the Northern Territory making concrete crosses as part of their work for the Dole program. This is what we did to a 17-year-old in one of those communities. This was his working for the Dole, painting a white cross. And you wonder why they're taking their lives. That is what your programs are paying for. And it is shameful. It is shameful. We need solutions and we need programs that work. And those solutions must be done in consultation with local communities and must be programs that have track record of working and must continue to show that they are working. We must get that. We have to get that out of the taxpayers' money. They are tracked, so we know that they are still working and they are making positive change. That's what we want to see. Here's one for you. Here's one that you could do today. Here's the, the governor of the day could put this in today and make a significant difference even before we go to vote for a referendum. Here it is. The old Community Development Employment Project, the CDEP. CDEP. Every Aboriginal person I spoke to over the last 10 years has told me the same thing. Bring back the CDEP. That worked. It worked. It worked. I've heard that from the white community. Everybody in those communities knows that worked. While a staff in my office was researching the CDEP, she came across a Curtin University study published in 2007 that looked at all of the government employment programs that worked and what didn't. And of all the schemes, all the schemes that past governments have tried, the professor who did the study says that the CDEP was the most enduring and most successful jobs program we have ever put in place in this country, ever. But you would know that if you've been running around like I have for the last nine years on the job. I don't care what electorate you're in. When things are hurting this country, get your boots on, get on the job. The other point made to me is that programs that aren't designed, that aren't designed with the local Aboriginal communities do not work. The CDEP, also known as the CDP, prioritised giving remote Aboriginal communities the schools and the hardware to build, repair and care for their own communities. This is where we want them. I caught up with an old army buddy while I was in Alice and he's been married to an Indigenous, Indigenous woman and has been working with Indigenous organisations for the last 20 years. In the days of the old CDEP program, my mate got to take on apprentices for four years. But guess what? Now he's only able to offer them six months. They cannot finish their apprenticeships. So how do the Indigenous kids get a trade? Not in their communities. Not helpful. Not helpful. He told me about the houses that had been designed, designed with Aboriginal people involved. They were involved. They basically said, this is what I want. He designed it. They said, yes, this is exactly what we need so that those houses were absolutely suited for Aboriginal people. He also told me that all of those houses, every single one of them, 20 years later, is still standing strong because they were built for them. They were built for them. The CDEP's focus was creating jobs on, on community that increased cultural connection and gave those communities ongoing practical skills. Money well spent, I would have thought, 
a system that works, I would have thought. A system that, if it is not broken, we would have left in here, I would have thought. But no, not politicians. The government has changed its focus and decided that it was just about how many people got jobs. This is where we got to. This was the, this was the exchange. Any jobs, it didn't matter any jobs, but this is a non-starter for remote communities where there weren't any jobs to begin with. The government just wanted statistics. How unusual. Who got a job and who did not, who did not, um, who, and, and did not really care what sort of job that they were given, and that's why they don't stay in those jobs. Common sense prevail. Hello. Worse, and what's even worse, when the government stopped the CDP and the CDP program, the local councils took away the roles so those communities can no longer do their own repairs and maintenance. There we go, back to scratch. What a waste of money. We did this for year in, year out. It was working. We removed it. That's what we did up here. Shameful. It is baffling to me that the fact that a program works or doesn't work does not appear to matter to the Commonwealth, not one bit. The money is often handed over, no questions asked, with little or no accountability. Let's be honest. But what people on the ground are telling me is that this has been going on for years, and I've seen it going on for years. What Alice does not need is more money thrown out with no positive results. We must have positive change. The communities are screaming out for it. Alice Springs and the people of Alice Springs need services that are well targeted at the problems they are experiencing there today. They need programs that have accountability and are trackable. They need programs that are making positive change and they need programs that achieve what they say they will achieve. And I assure you, you'll be hearing it all from Tasmania because it's coming, because we have the same problem down there. It's not just in the Northern Territory. The Central Australian Regional Controller, Darrell Anderson, has been tasked with reviewing the appropriateness of all these services. Well, that's a great start. But what are the, what are, what's the criteria? What's the parameters? When we rang her office, we were told no criteria was set as they were still in consultation phase. How ridiculous. You wonder why you don't have success up here. When will Australians see where the money is going and what programs are actually working, making positive changes in their lives? The minister says having a voice will fix these issues. That's all well, well and good, but we need solutions today, and you can actually fix solutions today. All the families and kids of Central Australia are hurting because the single biggest message I got from Alice, Alice in the last few weeks is that less can be more. Before making any more decisions to throw more money at Central Australia, let's make sure those programs work and that they will stand the test of time. That is our job. And again, I have to ask, are there too many organisations? We have about 40 of them in Tasmania, and some of them, like land councils, are exempt from FOIs. I mean, seriously, if they're exempt, why are they exempt from FOIs? Aren't they getting the job done? Are you too embarrassed? Is it a smoke screen? It's time we FOI. We should be entitled to FOI anything, pretty much, especially when it comes to the Indigenous, to make sure that we're getting the results that we need. There is a motion coming to this place, and it's been sitting there for, since the last uh, sitting, and I will be supporting that calls for transparency around the funding of all large organisations that get taxpayer money and it's time it happened. The Federal Labor government doesn't seem interested. That really baffles me. They're going to vote against it, which I find absolutely disgraceful. I want you to know one of the biggest problems you have out there of nine years is this, is no transparency. There is money going everywhere to the Indigenous out there and we have no results. But you don't want to know why. It is time they were hauled over the coals hold up here and we'll ask questions where their money's going and what it has achieved. And it's a fair question. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this referendum machinery provisions bill is about updating the mechanics of referendum voting as in, and is entirely appropriate and necessary. It has, though, unearthed yet another Labor Party deceit on its voice proposal. While many senators have chosen to speak about the voice proposal itself, I speak primarily to the bill's mechanics. My comments on the voice proposal for now are that if passed at a constitutional referendum, it will entrench and deepen the neglect and suppression of Aboriginals in our country. It will do so in favour of the Aboriginal industry that fattens the bank accounts of parasitic white and black academics consultants, lawyers, activists, ignorant, uncaring virtue signalers and politicians at the expense of taxpayers and everyday Aboriginals in communities across our nation. The flood of amendments from across the Senate re-emphasises the need to update the referendum process. The amendments, though, include one that's very disturbing to me. 
namely Senator Pocock's addition of Schedule 9 on the referendum pamphlet review panel. It flushes out yet another example of the Teal Senator Pocock working with the Labor Party to advance Labor's deceit. This amendment is disguised as Senator Pocock's, yet seems to be in reality a Labor Party amendment attempting to enable Labor to take control of the referendum pamphlet's content. Now, firstly, my understanding is that if this amendment is successful, a Labor minister, Ms Linda Burney, who has already declared support for the Yes case, will nominate a Labor-controlled review panel that must approve the pamphlet's contents. There's no requirement for a balanced view. And the panel can censor and exclude material. I suspect that the No campaign material will be unfairly censored. The panel will include people who were part of the working groups in favour of the Yes campaign, academics and other ministerial appointments. So the panel will be weighted in favour of a Yes vote. Secondly, why is this panel not comprised of persons with an independent background? Thirdly, why is the panel not designed to represent all the varied views from across all the parties and independents in Parliament, and especially from all across our nation. This is a terrible amendment designed to appoint a pamphlet review panel whose purpose is to produce a biased pamphlet with taxpayer funding, abuse of taxpayer funds. This seems to be yet another example of Teal Senator Pocock working for and serving the Labor Party. While I will support this bill at the moment and most amendments, if the Teal Pocock amendment is successful, I will oppose the bill. I cannot support such a dodgy amendment. I will wait, though, and listen to opposition speakers raising specific concerns regarding funding, tax deductibility, audits of campaigns, security from international interference. The Labor Greens Teal campaign for The Voice is becoming a train wreck for Labor. The Voice is a, is a racist proposal that will divide the nation on race, based on race. What happened to the fundamental principle of democracy that started with ancient Greece 3,000 years ago? Namely, every person has an equal voice and equal vote. As we've seen with the Labor Greens Teal Pocock behaviour in the Senate in guillotining and ramming through damaging bills with horrific future consequences for our nation, in just the few months this government has been in, in power, the abolition and bypassing of democracy is yet another trait of this Albanese government that is a reincarnation of a Soviet-style Politburo. History shows what happened to that after the people endured decades of needless, inhuman pain and suffering. In Australia, we have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we must stay as one nation, made of people from many backgrounds, all with an equal voice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Deputy Acting Deputy President, um, and I rise to make my contribution to the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022 and make the point at the, at the outset, Acting Deputy President, that this is a very, very important piece of legislation. This country, quite reasonably, has very, very strong regard for its constitution, its founding document. It took a considerable, considerable period of time uh, for that document to be negotiated amongst the states when they came together to form the Commonwealth. Uh, there's been about 44 attempts to uh, modify it since Federation, and only eight of those have been successful. So Australians, quite rightly, have very, very strong regard for our founding document. Uh, and the form of governance that it provides to us. And I think, in my conversations when talking to people out in the broader community, that document provides us with the best form of democracy, the best form of governance in the world, despite its failures. We are very fortunate to live in a country 
that has the constitutional foundation that we do and the structure and systems of governance, governance that we do. We may complain about them at times, but if you look around the world, where else would you want to live uh, and under what form of governance would you like to, get to live? Uh, and I think here is, if not the best, one of the best. And so it's in that context that the debate on this piece of legislation is extremely important. The provisions for referendums have been established in legislation going back over 100 years. Each time there's a referendum, there's a machinery of um, referendum of a bill that sets out the parameters for that referendum process. And quite frankly, this bill, this bill should not be controversial. This bill should not be controversial. It should be within our capacity, within our remit, to be able to sit down and agree the terms under which this bill is managed. The opposition doesn't come to this debate to be political about the issue of the referendum. That's a point of discussion for another debate, quite frankly. What we should be able to do is effectively have a situation and a circumstance where, absent the issue of the referendum, take out the question, provisions largely remain the same. Now, it's worth noting that those provisions have evolved over time um, and for good reason. And the issues that the opposition is very reasonably raising in this debate come about because of the ev evolution of things over time. Now, we very much appreciate the fact that the government has been prepared, for example, at this point, to agree to a yes and no pamphlet. It's a very important document. It provides information, clean information, which is important for the Australian community as a part of this debate to provide the arguments for the yes and no case to Australians. Not just English speaking, but speaking in a whole range of different languages. All lang and, and so providing good information, that information prepared by uh, participants in this place as to the yes and no cases. We appreciate the fact that the government has come on board with that. But if you look at the broader circumstances where we sit in the world of information right now, the government's refusal to accept an official yes and no case, which provides some process of oversight to those yes and no cases, the capacity to track donations through those cases, the capacity for the yes and no cases to be able to assist people with false information in this world of information overload is greatly concerning. The opposition doesn't raise this to be obstructionist. We raise this genuinely because we want a good process. We want a good process. We want the opportunity for people to have their say. We want the opportunity for Australians to be able to listen and hear those messages to understand which are the effective and appropriate and, and, and yes, and official messages. And I just really don't understand why the government isn't prepared to agree to very reasonable requests that we will make in our amendments to this legislation. Can I say, I think, I think the unwillingness of the government to agree to those reasonable requests gets this whole referendum process off to a very bad start. To a very bad start. I said earlier in my presentation, only eight of 44 referendums have been successful. The only times that they've been hugely successful, which is, we want, which is what we want with an issue such as this if we're going down that path, is that when both, when both major parties of politics are on board. And the fact this early in process, the fact that this early in the process, the government's not to prepare, be prepared to go along with sensible, reasonable amendments that the opposition is proposing for the purpose of good process raises real alarm bells with me because it effectively will reflect, in my view, 
right down through the referendum process. It's almost as though the government is trying to sabotage this process from the outset. Now I understand that this that the issue of the voice is something that the government took to the election. Uh, and they take their victory at the election as a mandate to progress with that. I have no problem with that. I actually have no problem with that. And I recall standing in the Great Hall at the beginning of this parliament when we were undertaking those initial ceremonies for the opening of this parliament that we really do have to reconcile our place in this country with our first Australians. And when I have conversations with people around this country, they acknowledge the history of first, first Australians in this country before European settlement. And they ha don't have a problem with that being recognised in our foundation document, the document that decides how we're governed. But they want to say appropriately, they want to have a say appropriately in how that's put together. And so, the, in my view and from my conversations, the only way that that has a chance, the only way that that has a chance, if the process that puts the referendum in place, the processes around deciding the question of the referendum, have an appropriate level of bipartisanship involved with them, that will lead to that view across the parliament as to the question that's going to be asked and the perspective on it. But when I see the Prime Minister appoint the uh, special panel uh, to advise on the voice without any reference to the opposition, and when we ask questions about it at estimates, the response is, well, they're all good people, who, who would you replace? Which is not the answer. It may very well be that the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition could sit down and have a conversation and agree on the same people, but the Prime Minister didn't do that. When the Prime Minister went to Gama with a proposed question for the referendum without any reference to the Leader of the Opposition and acknowledging that he wants to maintain momentum in this debate, I get that, but a consultation with the Leader of the Opposition would have put a completely different perspective with respect to how the Parliament, how the Prime Minister was trying to bring the country together on this question which has a range of different views. We all need to acknowledge that. I'm concerned that those processes, the one that we're having a debate about today, actually undermines the possibility of success in the referendum. Now, some people might say, fine, that's good, that's our view, that supports our case as it may be. But the, but the opposition is being extremely genuine in this place. We put our views in the additional comments to the Senate report on this piece of legislation. We've been very genuine in our discussions with the government in relation to this legislation and the amendments that we want. We've been very upfront with the reasons that we want them. Acting Deputy President, I don't want Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of those other big tech platforms determining or editing what goes on those platforms in relation to this referendum. And I don't think they actually want to be the arbiters of what's true and not true on those platforms either. But without the recommendations that we've made to the government, we actually don't have the capacity to do that. And quite frankly, I think that's a sovereign question. On, on what basis should we subcontract? What should we forego? Should we give away the capacity to determine what's true and not, not, what's not true in relation to this debate to those global tech platforms? We've seen examples of foreign interference into other elections, recent examples in Canada, for example. And it wasn't necessarily in that circumstance, in the Canadian circumstance, it wasn't about picking a winner or a loser or deciding which side of politics would govern. It's about creating division was the rationale for the foreign interference. We don't want to see that in this debate. 
I mean, what, we've, what we're looking for, what the Prime Minister has said he wants to see, and what we would like to see is some, a process that brings this country together, not divide us. So why would we not? Why would we not have processes in place that will allow us to be the arbiters of what's not true and what's true? Why would we not do that? I genuinely do not understand why the government is resi resisting well thought out, considered, sensible proposals that are based on the realities of today. I mean, we talk about foreign interference. We've passed foreign interference laws. We've talked about the way that the big tech companies operate. We've talked about funding and foreign interference through funding of campaigns. Why would we not put in place provisions that would actually allow us to monitor that? That's what we're asking for. I don't think it's outrageous. I don't think it's anything other than a request to put in place good process. There are different views with respect to the voice. Those arguments can legitimately be had once we get to that point in time. But I can't believe, I really cannot believe that we are having a, a disagreement over the mechanics of the process. The Australian people will see through in a heartbeat any attempt or perceived attempt to manipulate the process on this referendum. They will see through it in a heartbeat. Their BS detectors are pretty good. They know. They know. And I have to say, I think that what we've seen with respect to support for The Voice over recent times is being affected by the way the government is managing this process and the BS detectors are going off big time. And all the government needs to do to mitigate that is to sit down, talk to the opposition, take up our considered, reasonable proposals to ensure that there is a good, proper, effective process in place that ensures there is integrity in the referendum system and the process that we put in place. Australians value and will protect our, our constitution appropriately. We know how conservative they are. And so when we're at this stage of the process and we're having arguments about the integrity of the process, I think the government runs a great risk, sadly a great risk, of undermining the whole process because we should not be having this argument right now. We should be agreeing on what is the appropriate process for our referendum to be run with integrity, controlled by Australia and Australians without interference from outside, so that when we go to vote, at whatever point in time the Prime Minister decides the question will be put, people know, people know that the process is being conducted with integrity, but also, importantly, with the support across the parliament. And I think all of those things make a difference, and I urge the government to consider Thank our you, recommendations. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. I will call you Senator Reynolds, but I will remind the chamber that at 1.30 we will be going to Senator's two-minute statements. Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy uh, Chair, oh, President. Uh, I too rise to contribute to the debate on this incredibly important legislation that we have before us today, the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill uh, 2022. I want to make it very clear from the outset that, sadly, I'm not in a position to support this bill as it currently stands because of Labor's complete lack of support and uh, for fearless integrity in this bill. Instead, it is quite clear they are seeking to stack the deck in favour of their upcoming referenda question and potentially for future referendums. Uh, while this bill does contain many non-contentious and much-needed reforms uh, to the machinery mechanisms, there are three issues of grave concern to, the, to those on this side uh, of the chamber, which, uh, while there has been some movement by the government, uh, will wait to see uh, what the detail is in the amendments, but there are still remaining concerns. So this bill removes the requirement to provide all the households with a pamphlet outlining the yes and no cases for changing the constitution. 
Uh, I welcome the government's movement on this, but again remain highly sceptical uh, on what they will put forward. This information has been provided to all Australians in every referendum since 1928. So for nearly 100 years, this information has been provided to Australians to assist with their deliberations on whether they will support the proposed changes uh, to the Constitution. I also do agree with the general proposition that the parliament should treat changes to the machinery of referenda without considering uh, what future referendum questions may actually be. Now, the Act itself has not been uh, used since 1999, and it clearly has not kept pace with changes uh, that have been made progressively since then uh, to the Electoral Act. So, since the introduction of the referendum pamphlet uh, back in 1912, there have only been three occasions where a pamphlet has not been provided and has been provided, as I've said, in every referendum since 1928. Now, the AEC has provided a lot of very uh, helpful information to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters on this matter. Uh, the cost would be about $10 million and noted that around, uh, for every election that around 40 per cent of Australians rely on the printed material that the Commission provides. And the reason for that, I think, are very simple. Uh, Australians trust and rely on official information from the Australian government, and that has never been more important than today in the day of fake news, in the day of social media algorithms and echo chambers uh, where what we see, read and uh, learn about uh, is fed to us in a highly uh, sophisticated way. And it has given rise to what has now become called fake news. So in this age of disinformation, it's important that the government take the lead and provide clear information to Australians and a strong Senator, referendum it is process. It's now 1.30. You will be in continuation. So we will move now on to Senator's two-minute statements. And Senator Hugh, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, as many of you know, last Friday was St Patrick's Day, and I had the pleasure of attending a St Paddy's Day lunch hosted by the Lansdowne Club. Now, the Lansdowne Club was founded in 1986 by a group of Irish-born business people, and today many of its members hold senior positions in Australia's largest corporations across a wide range of industries. And while St Patrick's Day is a tradition of marking the passing of Ireland's foremost saint, it is also the most celebrated holiday in the world. Ireland has influenced so many other countries with its history and its celebrations and, of course, its wonderful, gregarious, world-travelling people. Our close relationship with the Irish goes right back to modern Australia's beginnings. Many Irish men and women were among the first European settlers in Australia, many of them below deck when they arrived. And today, a staggering 11 per cent or 2.4 million Australians have identified their Irish heritage. And I uh, had shared uh, last, uh, last lunch on Friday with Senator O'Neill, who is one of the great attendees of the Lansdowne lunch. So nearly 80,000 people who were born in Ireland also now call Australia home. Last year, there were over 14,000 Irish citizens on working holidays here, and so they continue to play a part in shaping our Australian way of life. We have everyone from prime ministers and premiers, ministers, scientists, investors and jurists have all celebrated their Irish heritage. So I want to honour our Irish Australian community for their long-standing and continuing contribution to this country and its people. And I apologise in advance for my Gaelic, and I will do this the best I can. Slancha quignafer August go mafig na moi gojo. Health to the men, and may the women live forever. I won't repeat my Irish in response. Um, and I call Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy um, President. And may I say I join with uh, Senator Hughes in, in her comments around St Patrick's Day and the Irish community. Tasmania is the home of renewable energy, and that's worth repeating. Renewable energy, energy, energy. Tasmania is the first Australian state and one of the few places globally to achieve 100 per cent renewable energy 
electricity generation. Now, that is something to be proud of, and indeed, Madam Acting Deputy President, Tasmanians are. This was a vision of a former Tasmanian Labor government led by the inspirational Premier Eric Rees, also known as Electric Eric. What's more, the Albanese government has a plan to rewire the nation, which will fast-track clean energy jobs and security across the country. The October budget delivered our $20 billion Rewiring the Nation Fund. The Rewiring the Nation initiative will deliver a modern electricity grid at the lowest cost, with more jobs and investment and, importantly, lower pollution. <laughs> The, re re -wiring the, <laughs> the rewiring the nation plan <laughs> is just another example, uh, Madam De uh, Deputy President. The interjections are getting out of hand. The rewiring uh, the nation plan is just another example of the Albanese government getting on with cleaning up the mess left behind by the former coalition government. The first investment from the Rewiring the Nation plan is to fast-track critical Tasmanian projects to unlock, unlock cleaner, cheaper and more reliable energy and put downward pressure on energy prices. Now, how Thank good you. is that? Senator Brown. I call Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The IPCC report released overnight has to be a game changer for Australia. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres puts it starkly and clearly. He said we need to massively fast track climate efforts by every country, every sector, and on every time frame that warp speed action is needed to save humanity from the thin ice it's on, and that what happens this decade will be key to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C or overshooting it with catastrophic consequences. And Guterres asks countries, including Australia, to commit to no new coal and the phasing out of coal by 2030 and to block the exploitation of new and existing oil and gas reserves. Australia is critical. We are the biggest exporter of gas in the world and the second biggest exporter of coal. What we do in this place matters to the future of humanity and healthy life on this planet. And we know what we need to do. It's to keep coal and oil and gas in the ground for our future, for our security, for our food, for, our, for First Nations justice, for totems and protecting country. It is too late for half measures, for greenwash, for fig leaves. There's no time left for the 116 new coal and gas projects that this government is planning. That will not safeguard our future. I just joined the chorus of women in the marble hall, singing with them about turning lament to renewal. I just sang to give our voice to the song of life, to give our promise to children and earth, to sing for peace, through the power of love so that lament will turn to renewal. It is very clear what needs to be done to turn lament in renewal, and that is no new coal, oil and gas. Please listen to the scientists, listen thank to you, the women Senator and take Your action. Time's expired. Call Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, this morning there are reports from Trudy McIntosh of Sky News, as reposted by Andrew Clennell, that three Labor MPs have raised concerns about the AUKUS agreement, including the member for Karangamite and the member for Higgins in Labor's caucus this morning. Yesterday in the parliament, the member for Fremantle said that while I support the work of the government, I'm not completely convinced that nuclear-propelled submarines are the only or best answer to our strategic needs. This is a deeply concerning development. This morning, as I understand from reports, concerns were raised in Labor's caucus about the cost of the nuclear submarine program and Australia's sovereignty. The question needs to be raised as to whether these concerns are well-intentioned. Given that the member for Karangamite is a member of Labor's hard left, I am not convinced. The member for Karangamite is part of a government which has broken so many promises on lower interest rates, cheaper mortgages, lower power prices, no changes to super, all broken. 
Now the broken promise on aged care after the government conceded it could not have a nurse on site at all times by July in every aged care home as it promised. Of course, the member for Corangamite has been a hardline campaigner against new investment in coal and gas and could not care less that plans to build a gas import terminal by Viva's Geelong refinery, capable of importing half of Victoria's annual gas supply, including from WA, have been derailed by the Albanese government's chaotic energy cap laws and the Victorian government's refusal to approve this terminal. Now we see the member for Corangamite and some of her colleagues doing their best to cause division over AUKUS. You, AUKUS is Henderson, too important to fail. Time has expired. Call Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise today to speak about the Murray-Darling Basin um, and some amazing students that I got to spend some time with uh, the week before last. The Murray-Darling Basin is one of Australia's most important river systems. It continues to face critical threats to its health following nine long years of neglect by the previous government. In my home state of South Australia, the River Murray supplies vital water for agriculture, for domestic use, it sustains ecosystems and unique wildlife and plant life that populate the Murray-Darling. It is a critical part of our country and we need to ensure that its health is secured into the future. And so I was quite delighted uh, to meet with a bunch of PhD students from the Fenner School at ANU. They are a range of really, really impressive young people who have fixed on concepts and ideas that they believe will improve the Murray-Darling Basin. They have some excellent projects that they talked me through, including things like climate adaptation in the Coorong, freshwater conservation, water security in small towns in New South Wales, horizon scanning to predict long-term futures, and ecological forecasts, and a range of other um, elements that, that, um, that I don't have time to go into uh, in just two minutes. But I am emboldened to have met with them and to hear what they're doing when we think about what we can and we must do for the Murray-Darling Basin into the future now that we have a government Thank that you. cares. Senator Grogan, your time's expired. I call Senator Wish Wilson. Act now or it will be too late. That was the key message from the IPCC synthesis report out overnight. Eight years of work by the world's key climate scientists. And when they say act, they are calling for a massive acceleration of climate action, fast-tracking climate ambition. Every country, every sector, on, on every timeline. They're also calling for no new fossil fuel projects and a net zero target for each nation by 2035. That's what the science tells us we need to do to keep global warming to one and a half degrees. So why in this country are we voting on a piece of legislation, the safeguard mechanism, that has a climate ambition of two degrees warming, significantly above what the IPCC scientists tell, we, tell us we need to achieve, and legislation that is not massively increasing our climate ambition, legislation that will allow for the unfettered development of hundreds of new fossil fuel projects. We have a responsibility to the world to play our part, and this piece of legislation will not do that. So why? That's the question that we all need to ask ourselves. The only response we've got from the government so far is it is what is achievable, whatever that is supposed to mean. Perhaps it means achievable because that's what big business will accept, or that's achievable in terms of their political ambitions to win power at the next election. But either way, I'm looking forward to the debate, Acting Deputy President, in this place, because it has Thank never you, been Senator more serious Wilson. than Your now to get climate action. 
Senator, I call Senator Little. Thank you. Celebrating our nation's cultural diversity, inclusiveness, respect and belonging is the purpose of this week's celebration of Harmony Week. It also coincides with the United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination today, 21st of March. Harmony Week is full of activities as diverse as the people who participate in it. Orange is the colour expression for Harmony Week as we rightly pursue a nation where every individual thrives and is empowered to fulfil their dreams. In Central Australia, played out over a couple of weeks, is a case study example of what happens when there is apathy, excuses and dodging accountability. A family doing the best while calling a concrete slab their home for two years. Amplified in this case was everything that needs to change. No more excuses, no more blaming the very people with the least power, the least influence and the most hurdles in front of them to effectively navigate the system that supposedly exists to assist them. I'm thrilled that the family was, after more than three weeks of coming to national media attention, moved into temporary accommodation. A large family, nine children, one adult with a very serious medical condition. No power, no water, no shelter except a tarpaulin, and yes, in plain sight, yet seemingly invisible for years. It was breathtaking to see how they lived, where they lived. The shame of this example in Alice Springs is not of this family. They were doing the best they could, hoping that one day someone would believe, like they did, that their future could, should and would be better. Evaluation of programs, scrutiny of governance to avoid an avalanche of waste, apathy and poor performance is what's needed to get rid of the organisations and programs that don't work. It's not complex. It's about acting on evidence, acting with courage and never accepting that, is, that it is acceptable or OK so that everyone in Australia has a chance at harmony. Thank you, Senator Little. I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And the voices of young people can be underestimated, but they can also be powerful, filled with hope and solutions, and they are the future of our parliament. I'm happy to have been invited to participate in the Youth Voice in Parliament campaign, spearheaded by Raise Our Voice. Raise Our Voice aims to increase the number of young female and non-binary voices from diverse backgrounds to engage with politics. They invited young people to answer the question, what is your vision for Australia in 20 years, in a short speech? One of the speeches that I received was from Sasha Sri Dinathalian, who was unfairly treated at her first job. Her working conditions were poor, and she touched on the importance of work rights, especially for young people. As a proud, lifelong union member myself, her speech resonated deeply with me. Here it is. Sasha said, I want Parliament to address workforce shortages by providing young people with the skills, safety and security of the workplace. In doing so, putting in place things such as higher pay, incentives, policies that ensure managers do not exploit young people and their labour. In addition to this, I'd like Parliament to put in place things to push the climate change agenda because I believe that sustainability will result in new jobs, secure work and a healthier future for all young people everywhere. It is important our voices are heard everywhere, but especially the workplace, as this is where it all begins. I'd like to thank Sasha for her contribution to the Raise Our Voice campaign and hope she continues engaging in politics and raising her voice. I'm proud to have helped her do just that today because governments have a vital role in the future of our young people. And it's our job to make sure that voices like Sasha's are heard. Thank you, Senator Walsh. And I call Senator McKim. Overnight, the United Nations has released what it describes as a lesson on how to defuse the climate time bomb. It makes it very clear that the most urgent action we need to take is to stop new fossil fuel projects and stop them now. But what has Labor presented to this parliament? The safeguard mechanism, a blueprint written by the psychopaths running fossil fuel corporations for implementation by the psychopaths who do their bidding here in this parliament. A culpable act of delay and deception that large numbers of people will pay for with their lives. And of course, the big polluters are cheering hard for it because they know it's a deliberately crafted 
protection racket for business as usual. Now, Labor has created a narrative supported by a craven press gallery in this place, with only a few honourable exceptions, whereby somehow aiming for a safe climate is seen as unreasonable. Where the Greens, the only party taking the looming catastrophe seriously, are told we're being too ambitious. Where the Greens are somehow letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, as if there's anything good in the steaming pile of dog vomit bowled up by Labor, and when it's the Australian Labor Party who are lining up to join in on what Greta Thunberg today described as the greatest betrayal in human history. And the Labor Party wants the Greens to join them in that great betrayal. The planet is literally cooking. Labor needs to get serious or get out of the way. Thank you, Senator McKim. I call Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to talk about the IPCC report released overnight. Uh, it is right that we turn our attention towards it, this survival guide for humanity. The report paints a bleak and sobering picture if we do not act decisively, but it also offers hope. If we are able to muster up the political will to implement the solutions that we already have, there is a narrow window where we can secure a future for all the people and places we love. In all of the debate, in this place, the thing that is often not talked about is this is about the people and places we love. The report says that the world is likely to hit 1.5 degrees of warming within the next decade. We've just lived through a summer with 1.1 degrees of warming. This, this is the new normal. This is what we're facing as communities and as a nation. And it is irresponsible to put up policy that isn't up to scratch, policy that doesn't guarantee that emissions start to go down, policy that hopes that our biggest emitters will do the right thing, policy that puts us next to Kazakhstan as one of only two countries in the world that allow unfettered access to offsets. We can do better. When then Prime Minister Tony Abbott repealed the carbon tax, there was an IPCC report. There's now an IPCC report and a Senate that wants bold climate action. I implore the government to take up that offer and to head in the right direction, not to continue on this path that we've been Thank going you, down. Senator Pocock, the time's expired. I call Senator Davey. Thank you very much. I rise to talk about regional health. And now we all know I live regionally. I keep talking about it. I gave birth to my daughters regionally. My family's health is reliant on an effective regional health service. In my state, the New South Wales government have been investing in health infrastructure. They've got more. They've delivered more than 180 projects. They've got 130 projects currently underway, and a new newly elected. Uh, nationals in government will in inject $1.2 billion into critical health infrastructure and hospitals, including in my own hometown of Deniliquin. But all this infrastructure means nothing unless we can staff it. Now, I commend the current Albanese government for adopting the nationals' policy to waive hex debts for medical and nursing graduates who commit to working in the regions. And I encourage any students out there to take up the offer and move to the regions, because you will stay there. I promise you, it is such a good place to live. But I deplore this government's decision to change the distribution priority area arrangements such that now our regional communities are competing against peri-urban areas to try and recruit doctors. This is a move that has been decried by the Rural Doctors Association and makes them, and I quote, fearful for rural communities. Labor are not committed to regional health. At a state level, the uh, Labor Party won't commit to matching 
the regional health funding of the nationals. And at a federal level, they won't commit to addressing our workforce shortages. We need to do better. Thank you, Senator Davey. I call Senator Hanson. Perhaps the most outrageous idea to rise out of racist identity victim politics is that rent should be paid to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by other Australians. Well, it shouldn't. The idea that Australians should pay rent for living in their own country is offensive. It's based on the idea that only Aborigines own Australia. They don't. Australians belong. Australia belongs to all Australians. I was born here and no self-identifying Indigenous Australian, including those with minute amounts of Indigenous heritage, has more right or connection to this land than I do. We have all contributed to this country and we all share in its achievements, failures, resources, disasters, virtues, values and shortcomings. The only good thing about the race-based base rent idea is that the activists who want it reveal their true motivation. It's not about justice or redress. It's just about money, other people's money. It's just about their greed. If this mob succeed in their bid for a race-based voice to parliament, it's only a matter of time before this idea is on the political agenda. It's only a matter of time before non-Aboriginal Australians are forced to pay yet more tax, a race-based rent tax. As usual, the Aboriginal industry will keep all the money and truly disadvantaged Aborigines in remote communities will continue to suffer poverty, unemployment and crime. One Nation calls on all sensible Australians to reject this discrimination. We urge the government to audit the Aboriginal industry and to finally act to fix the real problems in Aboriginal communities. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I call Senator Steele John. Thank you. Everyone should be able to go to the dentist without worrying about how much it will cost. In today's reality, where corporate profits are soaring and so many people are feeling the pinch, more folks than ever are delaying or simply denying themselves a visit to the dentist because they simply cannot afford it. Myself, along with my Greens colleagues, have heard from people um, all around the country um, who have shared stories of relentless tooth pain, um, experiences of really ongoing uh, chronic headaches as they wait for the removal or save for the removal of wisdom teeth. And indeed, uh, so many older people making do with dentures that are ill-fitting and contributing to gum disease. There are tens of thousands of people um, in Australia who end up in hospital for treatment uh, of dental conditions that could have been prevented had they been treated earlier. Now, we must move to a publicly funded universal dental scheme that tackles uh, dental disease proactively. That's why I am so pleased. In fact, that's why I sit here with the biggest smile on my face, uh, to be able to share that the Greens have established a committee of the Senate to review the provision of and access to dental services in, in Australia. In the coming months, this committee will hear from people all across the country about their experiences of oral health care. And I would encourage everyone to make a submission so that the parliament can hear from you about the challenges that you have experienced, the impacts of not being able to afford or access a dentist, and hear your ideas about how we can end up in a place where when you go to the dentist and open your wallet, instead of needing to reach for your credit card, you can reach for your Medicare card. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, I call Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, often domestic problems, as we know, require global action to tackle. Australians supporting overseas orphanages is one of those issues. Last week in Bahrain, MPs from 178 countries gathered to deliberate exchange views and take action on key global issues. Uh, last year, I was appointed by the IPU as a rapporteur on orphanage trafficking. And last week in Bahrain, I was successful in obtaining IPU support for parliamentary action globally on this despicable form of trafficking and child exploitation. 29 countries spoke in favour of Australia bringing forward a draft resolution for global action at the next IPU Congress to be held in Angola this October. We will also be preparing a guidebook for MPs globally uh, so to take action on how to stop their citizens inadvertently supporting 
uh, this evil trade in children. Um, and at the heart of this handbook will be how to implement the three P's of dealing with trafficking, that is protection, um, prosecution and prevention. And now there's a fourth one with global action, and that is with international partnerships. I welcome the IPU's appointment of co-rapporteur Dr Ernesto Bustamante, uh, a Peruvian MP, and I sincerely th thank him for working with uh, the IPU and myself on tackling this problem. But also a huge uh, shout out and thanks to the other Australian delegates who have been so supportive. Uh, the Speaker, Mr Warren Inch, Dr Gordon Reid, and of course uh, my colleague Senator Payman, who has been such a great help in uh, this issue, and I thank you for that. Uh, final thanks for departmental staff, Jane Thompson and Alicia Westgate, who tirelessly worked to get this great outcome and take it to the next step. Australian thank citizens you, have Reynolds, unwittingly created this new form. I call Senator Payman. Today, 21st of March, is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. It marks the day in 1960 when police in Sharpsville, South Africa, opened fire on peaceful anti-apartheid demonstrators. 69 people were killed and 180 were wounded. 19 years later, the UN coined the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The international community has built a framework for fighting racism. However, in Australia in 1999, this was rebranded to Harmony Day and Harmony Week, changing the meaning to be one of celebration. Now, we do celebrate Harmony Week and recognise our diversity and bringing together of all Australians, which I think everyone can support. But it is important to recognise that many people still face racial discrimination. So, in, in light of that, it is very important and we need to be careful when making this week and marking this week that we don't miss the racism experienced by people. We all have a responsibility to call racism out in all its forms and take action against racial discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. The time for this debate has expired. We'll move to question time and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, did Mr Albanese promise to cut the energy bills for Australians by saying, and I quote, our plan will cut family power bills by $275 a year by 2025? Um, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Birmingham for uh, his, uh, his question. Um, it is a little bit rich after years and years and years and years of failing, of failing, of failing to, do, of failing to uh, do anything about energy prices or failing to do anything about a plan to deal with issues related to climate change. Uh, that the opposition should be asking this question. Um, what, was, what was the first thing that, or one of the first things, that um, Prime Minister Albanese did on coming to office? He realised, realised, he realised, he realised the inaction of the opposition on, on this issue of electricity prices, and he took action, and he took action. He took, he took action in a way which. As Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Ten Senator Birmingham. Order on the question of mm -hmm. direct relevance by the minister. It was a very narrow question, asking specifically to confirm or not whether or not the prime minister made a particular statement about cutting electricity bills by $275 a year. Thank so yes you. or no answer, minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will direct um, the senator to the. A body of your question, Minister thank you, Farrell. Uh, uh, thank you, um, President, and thank you for that uh, clarification by uh, <coughs> um, the uh, leader uh, <coughs> on the uh, on the question. Um, look, you can't you can't answer that question in the way in which the opposition would like it answered. You can only answer that question. You can uh, only Minister, that question. Minister, just a moment, Senator Birmingham, Minister Farrell, Senator Birmingham. 
President, a further point of order in relation to, to relevance. The minister is now claiming that he can't answer a question as to whether or not the now Prime Minister said something or didn't something. Well, I seek leave, President, to table the speech by the Prime Minister to the NFF 2022 National Conference, in which he said our plan Senator will cut Birmingham. family power bills Senator by $275 Birmingham. a year, one of the 97 occasions on which Thank he made you. such a statement. Thank you. Sleep uh, Senator Birmingham, I will I check to see if leave is granted. Is leave granted? Customarily, uh, President, uh, an opportunity is given to um, the uh, other side to uh, look at the document. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to uh, examine the document closely and uh, uh, advise uh, um, you. the leader. Uh, Thank you. So, Senator Birmingham, I understand the government will come back to you. I will again remind the um, minister of your question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, uh, um, President. Um, <clears throat> look, the point I was making was was a simple one. Uh, you cannot you cannot answer um, in a simple way the question that you're seeking an answer to without explaining the lack of action. Uh, by the previous government on, on electricity prices, we came in. We came in um, to government, um, <clears throat> finding all of these areas where there's been uh, uh, neglect, and we've set about one by one um, seeking to uh, fix. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Is it still the Albanese Labor government's policy that Australians will see their power bills fall by $275 a year by 2025, as stated by Prime Minister Albanese on no fewer than 97 occasions prior to the election? Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, it's still. It's still the uh, wish and the desire of the Albanese government to ensure that we do everything as a government to put downward pressure on electricity prices for ordinary Australians um, in terms of their household bills uh, and um, companies um, who operate now in an environment uh, where um, there's upward pressure on um, electricity bills. We are about putting downward pressure on those, on those bills, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. Why did we cap? Why did we cap? Why did this government cap um, uh, um, uh, gas bills, um, Madam President? Why did we cap? Um, um, why did we cap um, coal, coal prices? We capped them to put that downward pressure on, on those bills. And, and to your everlasting disgrace, Thank you, you opposed it. Time for you answering it. has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. <laughs> President, will the minister admit that the Albanese Labor government has abandoned its promise to cut power bills by $275 a year by 2025, and that in fact, on the 97 plus occasions it promised that prior to the last election, it was simply seeking to deceive the Australian people, deliberately so, before Order. they got the chance to vote. Order. I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence. Order on my left and my right. Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank you, President. Well, well, what a cheek. What a cheek. Asking the question about deceiving, deceiving the Australian people. Who, 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 who replaced you? Who replaced you as finance minister? It was Scott Morrison. But, but did he tell you? Did he tell you? Did he tell you? He didn't. He didn't even tell you that he replaced you as finance minister. Minister Farrell. Minister Farrell. Just a moment, Senator Birmingham. There needs to be order. Senator Birmingham. The direct part of relevance there. You couldn't be more irrelevant or more hopeless or more uh, unable to Senator answer the question Birmingham. or less willing to talk Senator about $275 than Senator Farrell Senator is. Birmingham, resume your seat. Order. Order. It is the custom in this chamber to allow leaders some leeway, but seriously, points of order need to be made directly. Minister Farrell, I remind you of, the, of Senator Birmingham's question. Please continue. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, President, and uh, 
I, I can assure the opposition and I can assure the Australian people and I can assure businesses in Australia that this government they 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 us this government this government this government this government is serious about putting downward putting downward pressure on electricity prices that's why we've taken the hard decisions that's why we've taken the hard decisions contrary to uh, a lot of interested uh, groups in this country uh, we've you, taken Minister, the time for answering has expired senator stewart thank you um, I'm smiling because it's like those opposite don't own a mirror when they're talking about lies and deceit. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the government's proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism will ensure Australia meets, it le meets its legislated emissions reduction target? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Stewart uh, for the question on this um, a really important question, particularly on the day when we've got the latest IPCC report. Right now, the parliament has an opportunity to get Australia's biggest emitters to reduce their emissions. The safeguard mechanism reform is key to meeting our legislated emissions reductions target, which is something that this chamber uh, supported late last year, a 43 per cent uh, reduction target. The Liberal National Government wasted a decade with inaction on climate change. We all know that. But this reform will give the market and heavy industry the certainty that they have been seeking and asking for for some time. It will drive change amongst the 215 biggest emitters in the country, who represent 28 per cent of our overall emissions. It will take, if it's passed, 205 million tonnes of carbon out of the air by 2030. Wow. That's the equivalent of taking two-thirds of the cars off Australian roads. As former Energy Security Board Chair and current Chair of the Carbon Market Institute, Kerry Schott, has said about these reforms, it will drive decarbonisation in Australia's highest polluting industrial facilities. She explained that it is designed to benefit the companies already doing a lot while allowing others to catch up without a prohibitive upfront expense. The reform has strong and broad-based support across the economy and community. We are in good faith negotiations with those senators who are engaged, none of those opposite, of course, who have dealt themselves out of any discussion. And I support the comments made by Senator Lambie this morning on ABC Radio National when she said we could have a starting point through in early 2011 and 2012. We missed that opportunity. This is a great opportunity. Let's pounce on it. At the last election, the Australian people clearly voted for change. They wanted to end the Thank climate you, wars, the and we've got the chance to has do expired. that. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Could the minister update the Senate on the findings of the latest IPCC synthesis report and how this underscores the need for the parliament to support the government's proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Stewart, for the supplementary. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest synthesis report makes clear there is a rapidly closing window for action and economic transition. Simply put, action is needed right now. We are starting well behind where we should. After a decade of the denial, delay, dysfunction from those opposite, they had 22 failed energy policies and couldn't land one of them, including um, the safeguard mechanism now, which they seemingly oppose. We have not wasted a single day since coming to office. The IPCC synthesis report highlights the need for action. To keep one and a half degrees within reach, we have to act fast. The safeguard reforms could start to take effect on July 1, just over 100 days away. So it's, it's action that's needed now that will determine the future of our planet, and I would urge senators to support the safeguard mechanism bill when it comes to this chamber later this week. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can Minister Gallagher update the Senate on what opportunities are presented by the Albanese government's plans and what the potential costs of squandering those opportunities would be? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Stewart for the supplementary. The Albanese government has worked constructively with businesses to formulate a plan that will end the policy uncertainty and enable a predictable emissions reduction pathway to net zero by 2050. The safeguard mechanism reforms are the next step in supporting Australia's biggest emitters remain competitive in a decarbonising global economy whilst reducing their emissions. 
These reforms, importantly, are supported by the Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who have, have publicly supported uh, this uh, approach through the, the reforms to the safeguard mechanism. We cannot squander this opportunity that we can to get moving, to cover the 215 facilities covered by the mechanism. Many of them already have uh, signed up to net zero by 2050. We don't want to end, back, end up where we were years ago under this mob, where we had um, lack or total Can lack of action on expired. climate change. Senator Cash, first, up to, uh, primary, first question. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Uh, Minister, your government's submission to the Fair Work Commission last year recommended that the Fair Work Commission ensures real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards. Will your government's submission this year still include this recommendation? Minister Farrell. Energy, now it's Deliberate design feature. Order. I've called the minister, Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator um, Cash for uh, for her question. Um, so you've correctly uh, identified what uh, um, uh, the submission that we put to the um, Fair Work Commission um, last year, and uh, of course we will. Uh, prepare uh, an appropriate response to um, the next um, national uh, national wage case. I think um, it's important to um, realise that under your government, um, of course, uh, low wages were um, a design feature of right. your your economic uh, overall economic uh, strategy. And when we went to the election, we said we were going to um, turn things around and start putting upward pressure on um, uh, wages so that ordinary working Australians who uh, work very hard for their living got an appropriate um, recompense uh, for um, their labour. Uh, and that's what we did. And of course, within weeks, I think it might have been, of uh, coming to um, coming to power last year, of course, there was a national wage uh, uh, case. My uh, <clears throat> recollection was that we um, proposed a 5.1 per cent uh, increase, and of course, the commission, um, in a structured sort of way, started out at uh, 5.2 per cent. So um, I think, in term, you know, if the Australian people think about the difference between the two uh, governments um, and what we've done in terms of putting uh, upward pressure on wages to try and give people a chance to deal with the issue of rising prices, uh, then, uh, of course, we have delivered for the Australian people. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering is expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you, President. In May last year, Mr Albanese was asked if he supported a pay rise of 5.1% the rate of inflation at the time. He replied, absolutely. Further adding, we think no one should go backwards. Inflation is now at 7.4 per cent. Is it still the government's policy that wages shouldn't go backwards? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Farrell. Well, of course it's, it's our policy. Years of, course, of course, if that's uh, our policy that uh, wages uh, not uh, not go backwards, and we've we've delivered on uh, on this um, in the first national wage case that uh, came before uh, uh, the Fair Work Commission. After we came to uh, to government, of course, we um, put a submission to um, the uh, the Fair Work Commission on that uh, on that very point. And of course, as I said in my previous answer, that was in stark contrast to. Um, <coughs> Uh, your uh, position in, in, uh, in government, where a design feature of your economic policy was to keep downward pressure on, on wages. Um, there is a new national wage case. Of course, um, we are preparing the <coughs> minister. We've got an excellent minister, Minister Burke, uh, in, this, uh, in this portfolio area. He's in the process of preparing his submissions. Thank you, and Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you. And given the minister has confirmed that it is the government's policy that no one should go backwards, I again ask the minister 
Will your government's submission to the Fair Work Commission recommend the Fair Work Commission ensures real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards, consistent with your policy? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, everything, everything, uh, Senator Cash, that this government does is all about uh, trying to uh, assist, uh, particularly low-paid um, workers, but workers generally. Um, deal with the economic mess that your that your government left us to fix. I mean, I mean, all of these problems, all of these problems Order. like uh, inflation, were all problems that uh, developed and uh, became problems under your your government. You failed to do. You failed. You failed Order. to do anything about it. You failed to. Um, uh, support Australian workers getting uh, wage rises. We've got the runs. We've got we've got the runs on the board, Senator Cash. We've delivered. We we delivered. We delivered in the first few weeks. The first few weeks of Thank coming you, to government. The time we for delivered. Answering has expired. Order, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watt, representing Minister Giles. Today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. It's observed throughout the world on the day police in South Africa killed 69 people at a peaceful protest against apartheid in 1960. But only in Australia is 21st March celebrated as Harmony Day with barely a mention of racism. Harmony Day is a Howard government invention that whitewashes racism and sweeps it under the rug. We know that in Australia too many people feel the sear of racism every single day. The, on the weekend, Melbourne saw the despicable alliance of hate with neo-Nazis saluting on the steps of Victorian Parliament. Will the government ditch Harmony Day and Harmony Week and restore the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination with its original purpose of recognising the pervasive nature of racism and combating it? Thank you, Senator Fruki. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, you are indeed correct uh, that today is the International Day of, uh, for the Elimination of Racial, racial Discrimination, and as you say, uh, this uh, recognises uh, both the tragic events that occurred in South Africa all those years ago, uh, but it also marks 75 years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and focuses on the urgent need to combat racism and racial discrimination. Uh, and the reason I am aware of that is that I am reading directly from the tweet that Minister Giles, the Immigration Minister and Multiculturalism Minister, has put up today in recognition of this important event. Uh, so, to the extent that um, your question suggests that our government does not adequately recognise the importance of this day, then I have to reject that. Uh, and, and, you know, the Minister himself has made public uh, the fact that this is an important day uh, for us to remember. Um, the importance of eliminating racial discrimination. Uh, he's gone on to make the point that the Albanese Labor government has invested $7.5 million to the Australian Human Rights Commission in order to develop a national anti-racism strategy to tackle racism and promote racial equality in Australia. And of course, he makes the point, which I would hope that everyone in this chamber shares, that no matter where you were born, the language you speak or the faith you practice, the Albanese government is committed to a multicultural Australia where everyone belongs. So I don't think there can be any doubt where this government stands uh, on these issues or, or the minister himself. Uh, I think there can be some doubt about the level of commitment uh, across the political spectrum to eliminating racial discrimination because I, like you, Senator Faruqi, was highly disturbed uh, to see the neo-Nazi demonstration outside the Victorian Parliament and the fact that it included a serving Liberal Party member of the Victorian State Parliament. And I think there are some serious questions uh, for the Victorian Liberal Party and indeed Mr Dutton as to where his Thank party you, lines Minister. up on these issues. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, last week was the fourth anniversary of the Christchurch Mosque massacre, where 51 Muslims were killed by an Australian white supremacist driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. This morning, the fourth Islamophobia report in Australia was launched, and it shows hatred towards Muslims in Australia remains high, with women and children bearing the brunt of this on the front line. What will the government commit to today 
to obliterate Islamophobia in Australia? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi. Well, as I, as I said in my answer to the primary question, we have already made a commitment uh, that backs up our position on the need to eliminate racial discrimination. As I've said, we have committed $7.5 million to the Australian Human Rights Commission to develop a national anti-racism strategy uh, to tackle racism and promote racial equality in Australia, and we've commenced work on our election commitment of deliver delivering a multicultural framework review. Uh, I noticed, Senator Faruqi, that your primary question uh, asked uh, when the government intends to eliminate uh, a Harmony Day or words to that effect. I guess that might be a question you might also like to put to Mr Bant, uh, who in, in March last year hopped on Facebook to say, fantastic to be at Carlton Harmony Day at Carlton Primary School with Ellen Sandell today, celebrating just what makes Melbourne so brilliant. So maybe we've all got a little bit to think about on this International Day of needing uh, to eliminate racial discrimination. Once again, the Greens like to tell people what to do, not so Thank good you, at doing Minister, it themselves. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, the climate crisis is a racial justice issue. Those who contributed least to the crisis, black and brown people in the Global South, are and will experience the worst of it. The IPCC report today makes clear that a livable future means no new fossil fuels. Will the government finally listen to science and rule out new coal and gas? Prime Minister uh, thank you, President. Well, I think we're sort of jumping portfolios here, but, um, but I, I, I do agree that uh, it is people living in the developing world who are most at risk of the effects of climate change. Uh, that is self-evident, uh, and, and it is an important reminder why all of us in this chamber should get behind initiatives uh, to do something serious about climate change. And you know what? I've got an idea. It's called the safeguards mechanism. Perhaps that might be the kind of thing that the Greens might choose to back in as a means Order. of trying to reduce emissions uh, and, and reduce the impacts on climate change, whether they be here or in developing countries. This, this fortnight, this parliament, this chamber is going to have the opportunity to actually do something about tackling climate change, not just performing, not just doing stunts, not just doing memes for social media, but actually doing something concrete to tackle the impact of climate change in developing countries. So, Senator Faruqi, Order. I look forward to your support when it comes to a vote for that, to have an opportunity to actually do something real. Thank you, Minister Watt. The time has expired. Senator Stirl. First question. Thank you, President. And while the Minister is on a roll, uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. The Albanese Government's National Reconstruction Fund promises to be a landmark policy that will transform Australian industry and revitalise our manufacturing sector. How will the NRF benefit Australian agriculture, Minister? Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl, who is known throughout this chamber and throughout this parliament as a strong supporter of Australian agriculture, uh, including as the uh, fabulous chair of the, of the IRAT committee, um, and where he does a terrific job. Um, the, uh, and he, good to see he's not lacking in confidence in that respect. Uh, the Albanese La Labor government wants Australia to be a country that makes things again. What a revolutionary idea that is, uh, to be a country that makes things again. After more than 10 years of our manufacturing industry being run down by a Liberal and National Party government that literally dared our car industry to leave this country. We want a country that supports Australian manufacturing and the development of our sovereign capabilities. We don't ever want to be in the same situation that Australia was in through COVID, where all of a sudden we didn't have the capacity to make ventilators, to make PPE, uh, to make all the other things, the rat tests, um, all the other things that we were caught short on. And that's why we need to be able to stand at our own two feet and have greater sovereign capability. And that, that's exactly what the Albanese government's National Reconstruction Fund is all about. The National Reconstruction Fund is about transforming the Australian economy. It's a $15 billion investment in securing our future prosperity, adding value to our natural resources and bolstering critical supply chains. The National Reconstruction Fund will provide finance to drive investments in seven priority areas of the Australian economy. And pleasingly, one of those areas is via a $500 million sub-fund for value-adding in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. This fund will unlock potential and value-add to raw materials in sectors like food processing, textiles, clothing and footwear manufacturing. 
Importantly, it would also invest in agricultural supply chain products, such as fertiliser, which would help drive down input costs for farmers right around the country. And I can tell you over the last few weeks I've been meeting with quite a lot of farmers' organisations, telling them about the National Reconstruction Fund and how it can help with fertiliser costs and everything else, and they all think this Thank is you, something Minister. we should Why all get behind. Thank you, Minister. the time for answering has expired, Senator Searle, first supplementary. Thank you, President. The National Reconstruction Fund will invest at least $500 million in value-adding in the agriculture, forestry and fisheries Order. sector. Continue, we, know, we know that these sectors generate economic activity and jobs in regional Australia, Minister. So how will the NRF support businesses and create manufacturing jobs in regional Australia? Uh, before I call the Minister, I remind Senators that interjections across the Chamber are very disorderly. Uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl. Well, the National Reconstruction Fund is about creating jobs, secure jobs, well-paid jobs, blue-collar jobs, jobs in our regions. And a number of the NRF priority areas have a strong regional presence, sectors such as resources, agriculture, defence and renewables. In fact, one-third of manufacturing jobs in our country are located outside our capital cities, and that's exactly why we should get behind the National Reconstruction Fund, and that's exactly why any party that claims to represent regional Australia should be backing in the National Reconstruction Fund as well. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Let's just have a look at what some of the stakeholders who actually care about regional Australia have to say. The NFF president, Fiona Simpson, when this was announced, I am heartened by Mr Albanese's support for the NFF's call for a renaissance of regional manufacturing. Labor's announcement is a step in the right direction. Geelong Manufacturing Council, Senator Henderson, you might be interested in this. We strongly congratulate the government for a focus and emphasis on regional development in the National Reconstruction Fund Thank consultation. You, Get on board, back our regions. Has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. <laughs> Order. Order. Senator Henderson. Order. 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 Senator Ayres. I have the senator on his feet. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Thank you, President. <laughs> President, I can't even hear myself. Um, just resume your seat, yeah. Senator Stirl. I've just reminded senators that interjections across the chamber are disorderly, and I expect you to cease. Senator Stirl, please continue. The protection, President. It is clear to me that it is, the vit it is vital that the National Reconstruction Fund passes this parliament to support economic growth and secure jobs in our regions. So, Minister, are there any risks to these reforms passing the parliament? Minister Watt. Well, Senator Stirl, I'm very sorry to inform you that there are some risks to part these reforms passing the parliament. Unfortunately, not everyone is on board with backing our regions and with the Albanese government's plan to transform Australian manufacturing and back good blue-collar jobs. Now, the opposition had the choice to say yes to Australian manufacturing, but they've chosen to say no. They've chosen to say no to new jobs, no to new investment, no to new opportunities, especially in our regions. Whatever the issue, they just say no. It's like being caught in some never-ending loop of Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. That's what the opposition do under the leadership of Peter Dutton, and they're doing it again when it comes to the National Reconstruction Fund. We've been clear from the start. This is a fund which will revitalise Australian manufacturing and develop Australia's industrial capability. It was never about investing in coal, gas or native forestry, despite the Greens patting themselves on the back for getting a win that they didn't actually get. This is about rebuilding manufacturing in Australia. This is about good blue-collar jobs, Thank and it's you, about time Minister the opposition Watt, the got time behind for it. Has expired. Senator David <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communication, Senator Murray Watt. Uh, is the government aware that Australians are being exposed to illegal advertisements on their social media feeds from online casinos? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Obviously, you didn't get the memo that all the questions were, going to, were supposed to go to Senator Farrell this week, uh, but uh, happy, to, happy to have an attempt at this. I have heard uh, the media reporting about this issue this morning. Uh, I'll attempt to get some more information on this point for you during question time. Uh, but I do think that all Australians are concerned about the growing proliferation uh, of gambling advertising on online forms. There's, of course, particular concerns when it comes to the, the risk 
around those advertisements being accessed by children. Uh, I know as a parent myself I'm pretty disturbed about the on amount of online advertising that goes on around gambling, which can clearly be accessed by children, if not being in fact targeted by children. Uh, and of course there are additional concerns about uh, the risk of online gambling advertisements to the adult population as well. Um, we, 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 this is something that needs a close exploration of to make sure that our regulatory systems are adequate for the task. Uh, and this is something that I know Minister Rowland takes very seriously. Uh, she has already commenced work uh, on, on a range of fronts when it comes to online uh, advertising, uh, particularly in relation to gambling, and that's something that our entire government supports because we do want to make sure uh, that the regulatory settings that we have in place uh, for online advertising uh, are suitable. Uh, this is obviously a fast evolving field. Uh, it's one of those areas where the minute that governments intervene uh, and create regulatory, a regulatory environment, new operators come on board and find loopholes, and it's something that we do always need to review. Um, I think more generally, when it comes to gambling advertising, I can assure you that the Albanese government recognises the importance of gambling promotions uh, being presented in a responsible manner. Uh, we also recognise that there is ongoing community concern about the harms associated with online gambling, including advertising material, and I think that it is timely for Parliament to consider what more should be done to address this issue. And Senator Pocock, I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, will the government commit to taking action to close these loopholes and ensure that the regulator ACMA does have the power to enforce them? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Um, thanks again, Senator Pocock. And, and as I say, the Albanese government does recognise ongoing community concern about harms associated with online gambling. Uh, and that's exactly why we have established an inquiry into online gambling and its impacts on those experiencing excuse me, gambling harm. That inquiry is being conducted uh, by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. And if I'm not mistaken, that's being chaired by Peter Murphy, uh, uh, one of our outstanding members in the, in the House of Representatives. And I've seen some of the media coverage that she's obtained in talking about this important issue. Uh, this committee is considering the effectiveness of current gambling advertising restrictions on limiting uh, children's exposure to gambling products and services, including through social media, sponsorship or branding, among a range of other issues. Uh, and you're asking Senator Pocock what the government intends to do about it. I guess the first step is to consider the committee's recommendations when it releases its final report, and I can assure you they Thank will you be Minister, properly considered. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Mm -mm. Uh, once, once the committee reports back and, and you make those changes, will you commit to ensuring that ACMA can actually in, enforce them? At the moment, there's, there's a variety of areas where ACMA has no uh, jurisdiction, and it seems to me that's something that also needs to be updated. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. <clears throat> um, thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, it would obviously um, be premature for me or anyone from the government to comment on what we will do in response to that inquiry and its recommendations. Uh, but, but I acknowledge the issues that you've raised about the jurisdiction of ACMA. Uh, and if that is something that the committee finds is something that needs uh, some changes made, then of course we would do that. Uh, Senator Pocock, I'm not sure what engagement you've had with that inquiry up until this point, but of course you, like every member of the public, are entitled to make a submission to that inquiry, and I'd certainly encourage you to do so if you haven't done so already, uh, because we do think that this is a really important issue. We want to hear from the broad range of the Australian public about how we can best address it. Uh, and as I say, should the inquiry recommend that we make the type of changes that you're talking about in relation to ACMA, uh, then I'm sure that we would uh, listen very closely to that. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, yesterday in question time, when asked if your government would scrap stage three tax cuts, you declared, and I quote, our policy on these tax cuts hasn't changed. Can you clarify for the Senate what exactly your policy is? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I'm uh, very happy to. I've been saying that in this place uh, for some time. I think Senator McKim asked me virtually every sitting uh, uh, week uh, an answer about stage uh, three 
um, tax cuts. The fact is, stage three um, tax cuts has been legislated by this, this chamber. They are in place. Um, the stage three, I think, will commence in July next year. Um, the, Labor, um, the policy we took to the election was that those um, tax cuts remain in place, and our position hasn't changed. Um, so that, that is what I was saying yesterday. Um, that is, continues to be our position. I don't think it's a, a surprise to anyone. That's the position that we have had uh, for some time. And of course, um, I think the position that uh, Senator McKim raises with, with me on, on this issue is um, you know, related to the budget pressures that we have and how we're going to meet those pressures. And they are real. We've inherited a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. Uh, the debt had doubled before the pandemic. Um, we've got a lot of pressures coming our way. We had a lot of uh, time bombs or little booby traps built into the, the budget that we inherited, and we're working through all those. So there is enormous pressure on the budget, and that's the context with which I, I gave that answer yesterday. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, given you've stated numerous times that your government policy hasn't changed in relation to the stage three tax cuts, can you guarantee it won't be subject to change in the future? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Well, our policy on, them has, uh, on the tax cuts has not changed. Uh, that is the position that we are in. We have made it clear that our position in relation to taxation changes around multinational tax reform, which was um, put in place in the October budget, and the modest change that we've announced in relation to superannuation. Uh, but um, the, the issue more broadly around um, how we manage the budget is real. And I, I want people to understand that we inherited a budget in a um, complete— Minister, well, I've answered the question. And uh, Minister uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, on relevance to the question asked, uh, Madam President, I asked if it wouldn't be subject to change in the future. The minister, uh, in my first question, answered whether the policy had changed to the present. My question was about future changes to this particular uh, policy thank you, area. Senator McKenzie, uh, and the minister has answered the first part of your question, and you've just reminded her of the second part. So, Minister Gallagher. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And I did answer the question when I uh, answered uh, Senator McKenzie's supplementary, which is that our, our position on tax cuts hasn't changed. But we are in the position of having to repair a budget that was vandalised by those opposite for a decade. Budget va vandals that have left a $50 billion structural deficit despite themselves uh, rorting and pork barrelling all around the country. Senator McKenzie, uh, second supplementary. Order. Thank no, when they're on the run, when they just go on the attack and refuse to answer the question. Absolutely. My second supplementary then, Minister, why won't your government demonstrate the same level of transparency it called for in opposition and actually rule out further changes to the stage three tax cuts? I'm going to wait for order before I call the minister. Order. Minister. When I think, when I reflect, thank you, President, on ways to describe the Morrison government, <laughs> transparency is not one of those issues that springs to mind as one of those first ways that you would describe it. I think there's a lot of words, there's a lot of Order. adjectives that you would use, but transparency is not one of them. Uh, we, are, we are ten minutes, Minister ten Gallagher, months. Please sorry. resume your seat. I'm going to wait for order again. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Uh, thank you. Transparency is not um, one of those words. Anyway, we're ten months in to cleaning up. No, integrity would not be the, another one. No, we could play word rorts? bingo, what couldn't we? Rorts. Rorts. Minister rorts. Gallagher, rorts. please rorts. resume your seat. Order, order, order on my right. Senator Watt, Senator Watt. I've got a senator on her feet. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. Again. It was relevancy to the question. You called for a level of transparency in opposition, and I'm asking you why you won't demonstrate uh, that level of transparency when in government. Thank you, yeah. Senator McKenzie. That was part of your uh, question, and you also referred to the previous government, and I believe that the minister is being 
um, response is being um, relevant. Senator McKenzie. Point of order. Just the question doesn't refer to the previous government uh, at all. Senator McKenzie, I, you said as we did, which does refer to the previous government. They did. Uh, thank you, Senator McKenzie. I believe the minister is being relevant. She has 21 seconds to go, Minister Gallagher. Yeah, the question was about why, why, uh, transparency, and we are being transparent. We're being very transparent with the budget mess that we inherited right. from those budget vandals opposite. A $50 billion structural deficit every year, pork barrelling all around the country, a trillion dollars of Liberal debt and not enough to show for it. That's the transparency, and we are being honest with the Australian Thank people you, Minister, about it. The time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. The AUKUS submarine deal appears to be creating division within government ranks. The Labor member for Fremantle was reported to have said, and I quote, while I support the work of the government, I'm not completely convinced that nuclear-propelled submarines are the only or best answer to our strategic needs. End quote. The Labor member for Higgins, after questioning the decision to buy submarines in the Labor Party room, later issued a statement saying, and I quote, I now fully support the government's announced AUKUS plan. End quote. Fully support, huh? This deal reportedly doesn't deliver a submarine to Australia for 10 years, and I'll tell you from where I'm saying that's going to be on a good day. What's more, this government doesn't start building submarines in Australia for two decades. Can the minister explain to Australia how we can trust the government on this purchase when some of its own backbenchers do not? Thank you, uh, Senator Lambie. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, for her, um, for her question, and I'll start my answer by sort of saying we, we're a democracy in the Labor Party, and uh, people, people, people can Order express, express, Order. express, uh, Order. Uh, express a point of view. Um, and, uh, Minister Farrell, I, Minister Farrell, would... please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. Order. This is a question asked by Senator Lambie, and the disorder coming particularly from my left is making it impossible for me to hear the minister's answer. Minister, please continue. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Um, so, look, we um, we've got uh, a history of democratic uh, thought in the uh, in the Labor Party, and uh, and people people are always. Always, always been free. Always to been free to uh, express uh, a point of view. But I think, I think, I think the important uh, thing here is, uh, and I, uh, you know, the AUKUS, the AUKUS announcement last uh, week was obviously a great triumph. It was obviously a great triumph for uh, Prime Minister uh, Albanese, but a great triumph for our our country. Um, but look, there are um, lots of uh, lots of details about the AUKUS uh, decision, and uh, I'd encourage everybody to ask questions. Even the opposition, we haven't. I don't think we've had a single question in the last two days about the about about uh, about AUKUS. We haven't had a single question. So I give you credit. I give you credit, uh, um, Senator Lambie, for focusing on the issue. Um, but look, can I say? Can I say? I've um, got Minister complete Farrell, faith. Minister Farrell, please resume I've... your seat. Senator Hughes. Thank you. Please continue. Thanks, President. And I know they're embarrassed that they haven't asked a question, and that it's it's now been Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie has had the courage to ask the questions. Now, can I say this? The Labor Party. The Labor Party is. 100 Thank you, Minister. The time for answering the Prime has Minister. expired. Order. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam President. Australian manufacturing was destroyed by the last government. During their, wait, during their government, we saw closures of manufacturing plants. They forced car manufacturers out. They slashed research and development. They locked apprentices out of work. Will the minister please explain how a deal that doesn't start building submarines for 20 years will help Australian manufacturing today? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, 
Um, look, I agree with you, uh, Senator Lambie. It was a disgrace the way in which the former government yes. uh, uh, forced, forced Holden and then Toyota out of this uh, country. Uh, this government, this government, this government uh, is about is about order. building order, order across the chamber, order across the chamber, order, Senator Farrell. Uh, this government is about building things in Australia again, and I take your point. I take your point that um, the delay, the ten years of delay, the ten years of delay under the former government about. Uh, announcing when these submarines would uh, be built, Senator of course, Henderson. has uh, pushed back the date of uh, the um, construction of those uh, submarines. But can I say this? There's a whole lot of other aspects that um, you have to build before Senator you get to Henderson. building the submarines. And I'd be happy to host you down in uh, Osborne in South Australia to see some of the construction that's about to start. Well, I'd like to thank go you, there Minister. Too, but... The time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'll ask you to come to the state of Tasmania and I'll tell you why. In my state of Tasmania, we have apprentices learning their trade in TAFEs that are underfunded and under-resourced. This morning I heard from a young electrician apprentice in Tasmania. He's being taught his trade on 1950s equipment with, val with valves from the Soviet Union. So when will this government make sure that our TAFEs have the equipment and resources required to adequately teach our kids to build submarines? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Well, well I, I, I will happily come down to Tasmania, as I just did uh, recently, to um, look at uh, some of your um, wonderful uh, tourism. Um, um, no, no, there's more than vineyards. There's more than vineyards down there. I went to a, a mushroom uh, um, production. I went to the wooden boats, uh, the wooden boats um, exhibition. But um, we, we're about, we're about creating Order. jobs in the areas that you've specifically mentioned, uh, um, Senator Lambie. And I, I'm pleased you're asking questions about manufacturing jobs because I haven't had. I haven't, I haven't had a single question. I haven't had a single question from the co the, uh, the coalition on this uh, on this issue. Uh, but we are all about creating jobs in Australia. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Lambie. Uh, sorry, Madam President. I just wanted to know um, when this government will be making sure our TAFEs have the equipment and resources required to adequately teach our kids to build submarines. Is there a date or timeline on that? That's all I'm looking for. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I'll just remind the minister of the question that you asked. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you President. And, um, we're doing this right now, Senator Lambie. We've revitalised the TAFE system in this country. Uh, thank it was... you, Minister. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Polly. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister explain how the Housing Australia Future Fund will improve housing outcomes for Australians and make them affordable? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Polly for the question and also acknowledge um, her um, long um, advocacy for um, housing and housing support for um, people doing it tough in Tasmania. Um, the Albanese government wants every Australian to have the security of having a roof over their head. And we know that too many Australians are being hit by growing rents and also those struggling to buy a home. And sadly, there's far too many Australians who are facing homelessness. Part of this situation is brought about, of course, because of the decade of inaction and lack of leadership we had from those opposite when they were in power. But we were elected with a plan to clean up um, the mess that was left behind and deal with some of the country's housing challenges where we can. Fundamental to our plan is increasing the supply of new housing, and the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will be the largest boost to social and affordable housing in a decade. The homes that will be delivered through the fund over the first five years are one part of our ambitious housing agenda, which also includes broadening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, the Housing Accord, the $1.6 billion per annum National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, the, Interna the Interim National Housing Supply and Affordability Council, a new National Housing and Homelessness Plan. We'll also implement the Help to Buy scheme and the Regional First Home Buy Guarantee. 
I think it is something again that will come to this chamber in the next, um, as part of this fortnight, and we are hoping that we can have the support of the whole chamber in making sure that we are supporting the injection of resources and capacity into the social and affordable housing sector. It's important for women fleeing domestic violence. It's important for single women who are at risk of homelessness. It's important for veterans who are facing homelessness. Uh, I think this is a bill that we need to pass through this Senate and hopefully with the support of everybody. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that uh, answer. Can the Minister provide an update on the support demonstrated by those working on the front line with people experiencing housing stress for the Housing Australia Future Fund? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Polly for the supp supplementary. We know that too many people are paying the price for a former government that didn't believe the Commonwealth had a role in addressing the housing needs of all Australians. However, in the Senate last week, housing experts working at the coalface of Australia's housing challenges gave their view of the Housing uh, Australia Future Fund. National Shelter called it the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward in the past 10 years. The City's Future Institute said it's a timely reassertion of national leadership on housing and Power Housing described it as a transformative reform that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. There was near unanimous support for the bills to pass by um, representatives and stakeholders of this sector and acknowledgement that any delay would greatly impact those Australians who most need the housing that it would provide. I would urge those senators in this place, considering their position on this bill, to listen to the views of those that work in the sector about what needs Thank to you, be Minister. done. Uh, Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, we on this side of the chamber understand the urgency of this fund, but can the minister please explain why it is urgent for the Housing Australia Future Fund to be delivered? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank Senator Polly for the question, the supplementary. So, after no Commonwealth leadership for the last decade, we have taken substantial steps in the last 10 months since forming government to turn the tide. When asked if the Senate should act more quickly to support our government's package, the Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent. The Housing Industry Association said we have to put something in place right now, and the Property Council said the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. Every day we hear from stakeholders about the need in the sector and the importance of the passage of these housing reforms to ensure that we are getting resources into the sector. And again, I would urge those, including those opposite, that say no to everything. They say no to wage rises. They say no to the industrial relations reform. They've said no to renewable energy. They say no to help with the power bills. They say no to the safeguard mechanism. They say no to the NRF. They say no to everything. No. Don't say no to the Housing Australia Thank Future you, Minister. Fund. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Did Labor make an election promise to older Australians that every aged care home would have a registered nurse on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by the 1st of July 2023? Uh, Minister Farrell. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank, thank, uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Um, well, I think it's um, there's a certain irony, I suppose, is the word that I would use uh, in the uh, coalition raising the issue of uh, aged care when uh, we saw such um, tragedy uh, and uh, well, that's the word neglect uh, by the. Uh, former uh, former government in this uh, in this uh, in this area um, under uh, under the Albanese government we intend to turn things around in the uh, aged care uh, sector um, unfortunately we can't wave a wand and solve all of the problems that we inherited from the former government uh, but but um, uh, but we're we're working on it and of course um, the first thing we're doing, of course, is putting nurses back into nursing homes, yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, we're putting dignity and respect 
uh, back into the centre of, uh, of aged care, something that was not done by the uh, previous uh, government. Now, um, residential uh, aged care homes will be required uh, to have a registered nurse on site and on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the 1st of July 2023, in line with the government's uh, election uh, commitment. Um, it's, this, it's in this way that um, uh, neglected uh, older Australians uh, um, um, get the respect that they didn't get that they didn't get, that they didn't, that they failed to get uh, under the uh, under the previous uh, government, um, and of course, um, the promise I've just uh, referred to there was a recommendation. Thank you, Minister. Of Your time for answering has expired, Senator Rustin. First supplementary. Mm. Um, thank you, yes. <clears throat> thank you, President. Wow. Noting yes. that this was a key election commitment, which you have just reaffirmed, yes. Minister. Mm. Yesterday. The Minister for Aged Care conceded that the government mandated requirements for nursing cannot be delivered. Is this a broken promise? Order, order on my right, Minister Farrell. Shame. Um, well, again, I um, thank you, President, and thank Senator Rustin for her for her question. Um, again, I. Um, I'm surprised that this is an area in which the opposition um, are asking questions. Given, given the lack of action uh, and the lack of uh, uh, respect for um, um, the aged care sector in the uh, former, uh, for, former government, uh, we committed to implementing a new 24-7 nursing standard in residential aged care in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission. Uh, thank you, Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you. On, uh, on relevance, um, Madam President, um, I was actually asking uh, the Minister in relation to a comment that was made by the Minister yesterday in reflecting on his answer to my primary question and just wonder whether the minister would like to correct the fact that he appears to have m misled the chamber. You raised the point of order. The um, <coughs> minister was being rele relevant to the first part of your question. I'll remind him of the second part. Thank you, Minister uh, Farrell, which was in relation to comments the aged care minister made yesterday. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Um, look, I, I can understand why um, the opposition is embarrassed uh, that this government is taking action in respect to uh, restoring some dignity. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Birmingham. President, in your previous ruling in response to Senator Rustin's point of order, uh, you indicated the minister had been relevant to the first part of her question but directed him to the second part of her question. Instead, Senator Farrell has got to his feet and simply begun reflecting upon things that are completely irrelevant to the second part of Senator Rustin's question, which went to statements made by the Minister for Aged Care yesterday. I ask you to draw the minister not just to Senator Rustin's question, but to comply with your ruling, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll remind Senator Farrell of the second part of the question on which I directed him. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President. And um, um, look, the. Um, th this is a very Thank you, simple. Minister. This... The time for answering has expired. Senator Rustin, second supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, President. Minister, hoping that you understand the workforce challenges that are particularly acute in rural, regional, and remote Order. Australia, Order. will you guarantee that no more aged care facilities will close as a result of the actions of your government? Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, uh, thank you, uh, President, and thanks, uh, Senator Rustin, for the uh, the question. Um, look, we're um, we're putting dignity and respect back into the centre of uh, of the aged care system in Australia. Uh, and as I said uh, in response to your first question, um, we're putting nurses back into nursing homes. We we want the neglect. We want the neglect of the previous government to end. 
Um, and uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your uh, seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Again, on relevance, my question was very specific about a guarantee that the actions of the government. Senator Polly, just a moment, Senator Rustin. Order on my right. Please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, as I said, on relevance, um, my question was very specific uh, in relation to uh, a guarantee by the government that no nursing homes would close down as a result of actions of this government. I don't believe the minister has gone anywhere near the um, question. Thank you, Senator Rustin. You also talked about workforce challenges, and the minister is being relevant to the question. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President. Um, <clears throat> false and misleading claims that aged care homes will be forced to close are irresponsible and not based on any fact they cause unnecessary alarm, and I'm disappointed in you, uh, Senator Rustin. They cause, they cause unnecessary panic, stress, and alarm. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, all, all I, um, uh, President, I just uh, ask you if you may ask the minister if he reflects on the accuracy of his answers. Uh, uh, that's not a point of order, Senator Rustin. Please continue, Senator Farrell. I, I, I am happy to reflect on the accuracy of my uh, uh, answers, and uh, I think they, uh, they, uh, uh, Thank you, they are accurate. The time for answering has expired. So that further questions be put on the notice paper. Thank you. Um, Senator Farrell, is the documents that uh, Senator Birmingham sought to table? The, that very fine speech by and senators, I just want to make a statement in relation to um, a review I was asked to undertake yesterday. So, senators, I was asked to review the hands out of the debate of yesterday's first urgency motion. Having done so, I wanted to make two points about the mechanisms that support orderly and respectful debate in the Senate. First, I remind all senators that it is not in order to impute improper motives to other senators. In relation to their reasons for presenting motions or bills to the Senate, or in relation to their reasons for supporting or not supporting motions or bills. Having said that, I do not consider that senators are in breach of this rule if they are making the point that a proposal aligns with a particular political view. As President Ryan noted in a statement to the Senate on 14 November 2019, consequences can be attributed to policy or views without ascribing a particular motivation to those with opposing views or priorities. Odgers' Australian Senate practice identifies the rationale for the rules of debate. They are designed to ensure that debate is conducted in the privileged forum of parliament without personally offensive language. We all have a role in upholding that standard. May I also remind colleagues to address their remarks to the chair and not directly to other senators. This practice acknowledges the role of the chair in maintaining order and is also intended to guard against any tendency to lapse into unparliamentary language. While the Senate is rightfully a place for robust debate, these rules provide the foundation for that debate to be conducted in a respectful manner. They are particularly important when we are dealing with complex and sensitive topics. I thank the Senate. Senator Cadell. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I rise and seek to uh, take note of answers to all questions by the government to coalition questions. You have the call. Thank you. It's uh, another day, another question time, and here I am again. I was looking for something original to say in my take note, but same old story over and over again. We ask the questions and we get a history view of what happened nine years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, 
30 years ago. But that's not what the people of Australia are after. They're after what is the vision, what is the hope, what is the optimistic view of what will happen in five years, what will happen in two years. How will their lives be better in one year? How will they meet their mortgage payments, their interest payments, their energy payments? How will they do that in next month? But we don't get that here. We are a long way from getting that here. I know Minister Farrell was talking about the years and years and years ago of other policy when avoiding saying the number $275, because that's what we are doing. We are avoiding talking about what we can do in this chamber, what this government will do to make the lives better for the people of Australia. And that's a scary bit, because saying something isn't doing something. Saying we will put nurses into nursing homes isn't getting it done. Saying we will drop $275 on your energy bills isn't doing that. And I like that every time it comes up, we're reminded that we stood in the way or we, we didn't supply the, the gas cap. This is like when your dog is attacking your cat and the answer of someone else is to shoot the dog and you're accused of not supporting the cat. It is a wrong thing to do. Your energy policy is wrong. To cap this thing is wrong. It is, you don't, just by not supporting something doesn't mean you're trying to get the outcome. It is a wrong policy. It is a wrong thing to do, and that poor dog. There are people out there, and they are, they are suffering 30 to 50 to 60 per cent energy rises. And that's what's going on. And a gas cap isn't helping them. And they can say what it would have been, what it could have been. You know, I wouldn't be here. I'd be having a lovely week off if I had the lotto numbers last week, but I didn't, and I'm here. But this is what we get every time from this. We get avoidance of what actually happened. We get avoidance of the policies. We get a history vision. It's almost like Minister Farrell is auditioning for a sequel, pitching to Hollywood the inconvenient truth to the avoidance. Well, we can't do that forever. The Australian people need more. We talk about wage growth, and it's talking about how it was a preset policy of the government for wage growth to be low, but it was wage growth. And we note in December the highest real wage drop on record. Not in 10 years, not in five years, not in a month. On record, the highest real wage growth was just in December. That is the difference between a government doing things and saying things. And this is a government very good at saying things. It is not a good government that is very good at doing things. And that's where we can come together. There are very good people in this room. There are very good people in the other room. But we are stuck in the hype and the hyperbole of the election promises and of, of beliefs and of philosophies and this sense. The practical things aren't happening. We have seen that so many times when there are simple practical steps that can make people's lives better, whether we can be talking about it and we're not talking about it. We talk about the irony of what happened over the last, let's even go back three years, where we had COVID, where we had these things. There was failures in, in aged care. Let's, we can own that. It was acceptable. It was never put under such pressure as what we had. What we are looking for is a way forward. Every time I stand up to take note, that is why we all came here. We didn't come here to hurl abuse across the chamber, Mr Acting President, or Mr Deputy President, sorry. It's a bit of fun. We have a bit of theatre for an hour, but it's not why we came here. We came here to try and improve the lots for people in our electorates, in our regions, in our states, in our families, around our, around our people who care to us and we know. And that isn't done by not taking responsibility. And so we always stand here, we always hear, ask the questions, we never get the answers, but the sad thing is the Australian people don't get the answers. They don't get the answers to what this government is going to do so that they can pay their mortgage, with interest rates going up nine times since this government was elected. Not all their fault. I'm not saying it's their fault. We don't have to apportion blame. We have to create hope. And we aren't doing that. And we need to do things better. We aren't seeing how we're creating enough energy to put downward prices on energy prices, downward forces on energy prices. That is the things we need to do. That is the things we should be doing. And I look forward to this government realising that and doing more. Senator Krogan. Um, Senator Cadell, I agree with so much of what you said. Um, there are some great people in here, and we really should be working together 
to get the kind of outcomes that the Australian people deserve. It's very sad that you're leaving the chamber, though. Um, and we have laid out a vision. We have laid out a vision for one year, for five years, for ten years in many of those areas that have been traversed across throughout this question time. History is important because we look back on history to try not to do the things that did not work again and to do more of the things that did work, to learn from that experience. And when we are faced with accusations that we've you know, killed the housing sector, I have to tell you that you cannot kill the housing sector in 10 short months. It's actually not possible. It's just not possible. The kind of neglect that you have to have to end up where we are now started long before 10 months. So, Senator Cadell, I will just remind you that a lot of that history piece is about understanding what's moving forward. But what we did see today was a definite theme, definite theme of across the chamber just saying no. No to every issue that was brought up. No to wage increases as we've gone along. In fact, a deliberate policy to stagnate them. And, and, and that was an admitted intent while those opposite were in government. No to action on climate change. And in this chamber, you're not alone. There are those on our crossbenches and in the Greens who have done the same, have chosen not to take action to move this country forward, to deal with one of the biggest global crises we've ever seen, to protect the future for our children and our society. We must make change. But no. No is the answer. And specifically, no to the safeguards mechanism. And that is just bizarre. It is a structure that in 2015 you were fully behind. Now, you put it in place in such a way that it actually achieved nothing um, and, in fact, um, could be held responsible for increasing emissions by letting people off the hook on their emissions. But it is the same theory that you spouted at that time but then failed to deliver on because you did not structure the mechanism sufficiently. Now, what we have done is taken that in a bipartisan way and made it stronger, strengthened it so that it will actually achieve those outcomes, that it will actually reduce emissions, so that it will actually get us to our targets and help us save the future effectively. We've heard a lot in this chamber in the last couple of hours about the IPCC report. And yes, it is alarming. This is a global alarming crisis. And it is about time that we did something about it. But no, that's the word we hear most. No, 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 and a bit more no. So you said no to 230 average savings to household power bills. Those opposite said no to changing the law. Uh, sorry, said, said, said no to so many different measures over and over again, leaving us in the situation we're in now, where we do not have sufficient action. This constant rewriting of history, the sense that in, in the nine plus years that you were in government that you didn't actually contribute to any of the challenges that we are now facing. So when you say that the questions through question time are not being answered by the Labor government, I can assure you they are. The problem is you don't like the answer, but that does not mean that the answer was not given. So I will just wrap up by saying that we must work together at some degree to get change, to make this country better. There is a point where you have to put aside the rubbish and actually get on board with progressive change.
Uh, Th thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, the motion before you, Deputy President, is to take note of the answers given by coalition senators. Uh, but what we've seen today is, a, 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 sadly, a, a, a display of not answering questions that are before uh, those on the other side. And uh, I don't know if uh, maybe those up in the gallery aren't aware, but today is broadcast day. That little light up there uh, is broadcasting from the Senate uh, to radios uh, right across the country and online. And uh, people, instead of if they're tuning in and, and listening to Question Time today, they, they had the opportunity to hear some answers to questions that were asked by uh, well-meaning uh, coalition senators. And, and what we got was just non-answers, uh, avoiding answering questions. You know, there were questions about what will the government do, and they just reflected on what the previous government did. Uh, there were questions to the heart of uh, very serious issues across this country, uh, the cost of living. Uh, there, were, there were promises that were made before the election that people would see a reduction in their electricity bills. We heard it 90 odd times throughout the election campaign from the government that, that, the, that, that Australians would see their electricity bills reduced by $275 if, uh, if, this, uh, if, if this government was elected. And they've walked away from that. They've broken the promise on, on that commitment that they made. Uh, and and that's, that's why you're hearing non-answers on this side, because they don't want to admit the fact that they, they, they actually told the Australian people a big fat lie, because they wouldn't be able to actually deliver on it. And they've done nothing to actually address cost of living. One of the best ways that they could address cost of living is actually to reduce spending. But we've seen no measure whatsoever from this government to actually uh, cut the, the expenditure of government, because that is uh, the surefire way of reducing inflation. That is the surefire way of addressing cost of living issues for Australian households. Instead, all this government is doing is leaving it up to the RBA to uh, increase interest rates to ultimately restrict the availability of, of, of people's uh, availability of cash to be able to fund their, their, their expenses uh, because it's hitting people's mortgages. So it's the mortgagees of this country that are making the big decisions instead of this government. And it's a real shame because there are some very, very serious issues that this government is contending with and they're, they're actually walking away rather than facing up to the issues that are before us. We heard questions today about uh, what, what this government was going to do in relation to the promise that they made that there will be 24-hour, uh, seven days a week coverage of re re um, registered nurses in in our aged care homes, and we heard a question, a very serious question, was asked to Senator Farrell about uh, whether or not uh, the, the, the words from the minister uh, that's responsible for aged care uh, made yesterday about the, uh, what it seemed to be walking back from that commitment that was made. Uh, a question was asked of Senator Farrell as to whether or not uh, he stands by that question, whether or not maybe, maybe the minister misspoke, maybe the minister didn't quite get it right. But instead of facing up to the scrutiny of that question, the minister just avoided it completely. And so what we've seen on broadcast day for the Senate is a, is a show, is a demonstration of how to not answer questions. And this government is proving quite effectively to be very artful in breaking promises and very artful in dodging questions. And the Australian people expect more. The Australian people deserve more from this government. But you're proving time and again to be quite adept at dodging questions, at breaking promises, and it's having a real impact on Australian people. It's affecting them. Because while you're doing that, you're not facing up to it and you're not actually putting in place measures that might actually help people. Because we've got a cost of living crisis in this country, and by your arrogance in coming in here and not answering the, the, the scrutiny of questions here in this place, you're actually saying to the Australian people that all you're interested in is power, 
All you're interested in is just getting into on that side of the chamber and not actually taking your job seriously. So take your job seriously, Labor. Uh, Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I kind of enjoyed Senator Cadell's contribution before, but found it a little bit confusing. Um, and I'm Anyway, I've had a cat and a dog before, and I don't remember uh, those sorts of issues being raised. I'm not sure if we need to check on the welfare of Senator Cadell's dog or cat. But anyway, interesting, um, interesting metaphors used. But uh, Senator Cadell also suggested in his contribution that if Senator Parrell was uh, pitching a, a film to Hollywood, it would be called The Avoidance. Um, just like to reflect, if, if that's their view of uh, Senator Farrell's contribution to Question Time, then perhaps uh, their questions would be pitched as a film called The Irony. Maybe the irony or um, the audacity might be another good one um, if we're going to be, be naming these contributions as filmed. I mean, aged care, come on, that last question. Like the Royal Commission report into aged care, which came down under the previous government, was literally called neglect. Like it does not get, uh, it does not get clearer than that. And the failures under the previous government, under aged care, were blindingly obvious for all of us to see. I won't repeat some of the horrific details which came out of aged care homes during that time, but I think everyone in this country could agree that the aged care sector was in absolute crisis. And that's why we came to the election with an ambitious plan to fix it, because frankly, it deserved nothing less. You can't receive a report, or we, as Labor people, can't read a report called neglect and not seek to respond to it without the utmost ambition. 24-7 nurses in nursing homes is a high ambition. And you know what? We're 80 per cent of the way there. 9 per cent of services are close. And we are hopeful that we will get all the way there. But it is likely there will be exemptions for some, because workforce is a serious, serious challenge. It's a real challenge. It's a challenge which didn't start 10 months ago. It's a challenge which started 10 years ago under the previous government. We've been in government 10 months. They were in government for almost a decade. So the workforce challenges are serious. They won't be fixed overnight. But what we have done is supported a wage increase for aged care workers. Not only supported it and backed it in, but are paying for it. Are paying for it. Because this sector and the workers within it have not felt valued, and it's very hard to attract workers to a sector where they don't feel valued and where they're not paid appropriately for the work they do. So that's part of fixing the workforce challenge. And I don't make any apologies for having high ambition in this space. And frankly, if you have anything short of high ambition in aged care, I mean, honestly. So, Phil, there you go, Senator Cadell. The audacity, the irony, you choose. And not just on aged care today. I mean, then we got to, to energy prices, to climate change. I mean, 22 failed energy policies over the term of their government. <laughs> If you are serious about taking action on energy prices, if you are serious about supporting the investment in renewables and other forms of power which would help alleviate pressure on electricity, alleviate pressure on energy, you would have pulled the show together and delivered an energy policy that could stick. We have had a decade of inaction and disunity on climate change and energy policy in this country, and we are staring down the barrel of more because you're not coming to the table on safeguards. These guys aren't coming to the table on safeguards, as it seems. I mean, if we want another decade of failed energy and climate policy, that's what you do. The audacity and the irony, the audacity and the irony, and on wages more broadly. There could not be a clearer indication in the difference of, of values of our government and the opposition than wages, and the sheer fact that low wages were a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture, and we wanted to see wages increase. It speaks for itself. Actually, it speaks volumes about the values of the, of the modern-day Liberal Party and the values of the Labor movement. We came in and we backed an increase to the minimum wage. We supported increases for aged care workers to get that sector back on track. Being a government of high ambition, 
of strong values, consistent values. Being a government that gives a damn is not something I will ever apologise for. The irony and the audacity of the questions today. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, it's it's you know always the same from those office opposite. It's all bluster. It's all bluff. It's all looking backwards and pointing the finger, not quite realising that they're in government, uh, that they're more interested in virtue signalling than they are in actually delivering any plans to the Australian people and those Australian families who are doing it so tough at the moment. And I guess today what we've seen in the New South Wales state campaign is just another example where the much lauded electric bus that was uh, developed in Western Sydney, but the much lauded electric bus that was going to be taking the Labor uh, wannabe Premier and his team and the media and staff around Sydney to campaign uh, has broken down. The bus that is supposed to have a 300 kilometre radius uh, travelled 60 k's and then broke down. So in what is you want to talk about irony, then a diesel bus had to come out and pick everybody up. And so we know, we know that those opposite, and their safeguard mechanism, the safeguard mechanism. I mean, I, I know this is take note, and we're here to take note of answers. And, and Senator Farrell, I say this with much love and affection. The ums, the ahs, the bluff, the bluster, the prevarication is really quite something to behold. It is an Academy Award winning performance of not answering a question. It is absolutely something that, you know, I think actually some of your colleagues have taken on because I've listened to a couple of the speeches today that uh, your colleagues have made in response, and no wonder the galleries have emptied. I have never heard a bigger load of rot, of people saying nothing, of addressing nothing, and of not putting forward an idea to the Australian public. All the Labor Party is capable of doing is putting forward broken promises, and the Australian electorate is starting to wake up to that. But I guess the bus is just a great example of a broken down opposition at the New South Wales uh, state uh, as they approach their election this weekend, and the broken down bus, the electric bus that didn't go anywhere, a reflection of those opposite and the plans they put forward or the policies they put forward before the election to the broken promises and the litany of lies that have been told to the electorate since then. We know that we went into this election with the Voldemort number of 275, the number that shall not speak its name if you are a member of the ALP. Ninety-seven times the Australian people were told that their power bills would come down by $275. Well, we all know that is now a furphy. We were told that there would be no changes to superannuation, not modest changes not tinkering around the edges, no changes to superannuation. We were told that there'd be no changes to franking credits. We weren't going to make the mistake of, of Minister Bowen, uh, as he did in the 2019 election, that if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. Very sound advice that the Australian electorate took up. So they, they learnt from that mistake, so they lied to the Australian people about franking credits, because now we're looking at you can't pay a dividend once capital raising's occurred. We've got farmers absolutely petrified because these modest changes means that family farms that have passed from generation to generation that are part of uh, self-managed super funds, we know that they're now under threat because of this absolutely economically reckless and ridiculous unrealised asset being taxed. And for those that are you know, watching on the broadcast, by taxing an unrealised asset, that means something that's not sold. It's, it's actually a paper profit. And so if you own land that you've worked hard and invested in and saved for your family and it somehow tips over $3 million on paper, hasn't been sold, you don't have any money in the bank, hasn't been sold, it's just in the paper, on paper, you will have to sell that to pay the tax bill, the grab from those opposite who hate retirees, who hate farmers and absolutely have their hearts set on destroying the self-managed super funds because their union mates make up the bulk of the big super funds. And of course, the biggest issue, though, facing Australians is cost of living pressures. Now, energy promise was broken. There's no 275 reduction. In fact, from July 1 this year, we're going to see a further 20 per cent increase on gas and electricity bills. We know there's going to be gas shortages, which is going to put further pressure. And whenever you do market interventions around price caps, what you do is you actually make it worse in the long run. And that's what we've seen from this government. They have no plan. But what they have 
is lots of absolutely unfounded and ridiculous rhetoric pointing back to the previous government. The word COVID never passes their lips. Apparently, and as I've said this, according to Senator Polly, we had calm economic waters because COVID was calm. This is an insult to every Australian family, and your rhetoric isn't making one iota of difference to a family budget. I put the question, those are the questions say aye against no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, um, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's woeful response to my questions about racism and racial justice. We are not a post-racist utopia. The climate crisis is a racial justice issue. Those who contributed least to the crisis, this is black and brown people in the global south, are and will experience the worst of it, from the floods in Pakistan to the drought in the Horn of Africa and water lapping at the door of our neighbours in the Pacific Islands. They are living through untold suffering. Australia's insatiable appetite to dig up to burn and to ship out fossil fuels is turbocharging climate change for the most vulnerable communities across the globe. The relentless pursuit of profit and power by wealthy colonial countries and multinational corporations has put the world on track for a global climate catastrophe. And yet this injustice is completely neglected and denied in the climate change discourse in this country. Yet rather than stand up to coal and gas lobbies, Labor capitulates and will allow them to buy their way out of their climate obligations with unfettered, cheap and dodgy offsets. Today, the world's climate scientists gave us a terrifying final warning. The message from the IPCC, from the UN, from scientists and other experts globally is clear. Stop opening up new coal and gas. This is the only way to stop dangerous climate change. The IPCC report makes clear that a livable future means no new fossil fuels. If we don't, we risk a global catastrophe that we cannot undo. The UN Secretary General is telling us our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yesterday, over 50 Australian environmental and climate organizations called on the federal government to listen to evidence from the world scientists and end new coal and gas developments in Australia. It follows a similar open letter signed by over 100 Australian scientists and experts just a few weeks ago. New research by the Australia Institute tells us that pollution from the 116 new fossil fuel projects in the federal government's major projects list would add 4.8 billion tonnes of emissions to the atmosphere by 2030. Despite all this, Labour's plan for climate action, their safeguard mechanism, safeguards coal and gas profits, not the climate, not the people, not the planet. This is not climate action, this is mere greenwashing. Without ending new coal and gas, this is just smoke and mirrors. The public gave us a clear mandate at last year's election. They want us to take serious, effective action on climate change. In this progressive parliament with the Greens, Labour has the numbers for a strong climate policy that delivers deep and rapid greenhouse gas emissions cuts. We can change course right now. Scientists and future generations are begging us to do, to do this. This is what climate justice, social justice and racial justice demands. Prime Minister Albanese must listen to the science and reject the fossil fuel industry's desperate attempts to keep its business model alive at the expense of people and the planet. Prime Minister Albanese, show some gumption. Take some responsibility. End new coal and gas. I put the question, those the question say aye against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices to be given for another day? No. Nope. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you. President, uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for a senator. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, I Senator I move Urquhart. that leave of absence be granted to Senator Billick from 21 March to 24 March 2023 for personal reasons. So the, 
the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Nampajimpa Price for Monday the 20th of March to Tuesday the 21st of March for personal reasons. Senator Hughes for Wednesday the 22nd of March for parliamentary business and Senator Rustin for Thursday the 23rd of March for parliamentary business. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I move that general business order of the day number 35, uh, improving access to medicinal cannabis bill, be considered on Wednesday 22nd of March at the time for private senators' bills. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. President, no postponement notifications have been lodged, but committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senators. Um, I'll just check. Is uh, are we still dealing with business of the Senate number one? I think Senator Chisholm has something to do before Senator Chisholm. Okay, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for Friday sittings scheduled in 2023. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Chisholm. I move the motion as circulated. Senator Roberts. Uh, President, I uh, seek to move an amendment that's being circulated in the chamber as we speak. And um, I think I'd like to seek leave to make a few comments. Oh, you can speak to the motion, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, we see the need for meeting on Fridays to, to cover more of the bills that the government wants to uh, push through the Senate. Um, Fridays, in my opinion, should be for government business to deal with the bills. As it is now, the government is proposing to deal with the bills for four hours. With the amendment that's being circulated in my name, it would be seven hours, almost doubling. Uh, that would cut back the time, the, the need for guillotines, and give proper debate to to um, two bills that the government is putting up. And instead of theatre, we would like to see debate completed on those bills. So, uh, whatever the will of the Senate is, Senate is, of course, I uh, will abide by. But I think it is prudent to to remind the Senate that, they, that we are masters of the Senate and it's up to the Senate to decide whether to seek my amendment, support my amendment or not. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I'm now going to put the amendment. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Roberts uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Do you, division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Uh, senators, before I put the voice, uh, the, the amendment is moved by Senator Roberts. I remind senators that when a division is called, it requires more than one voice. On that occasion, I am fairly certain that the second voices came from the Jackie Lambie network. Understanding Order 100, uh, you, there, you can't seek to vote for an amendment uh, and then vote against the amendment. So, um, at this point, the, uh, that amendment uh, is not carried, and I'm going to put the substantive motion. But I am uh, happy, Senator Roberts, uh, to record um, the opposition of the, uh, your support for that motion. Yes, thank you. So that has now lapsed. I'm now going to put the substantive motion, which was the hours motion as moved by Senator uh, Chisholm. Um, which was an hours motion in relation to Friday the 24th, which has been circulated. So uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. All of those that, of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator Roberts, um, business of Senate number one, do you, if you go back to your spot, do you? Yeah. Okay, so we'll deal with that later. I advise senators there may be further divisions. So I'm now going to move to general business notice of motion number 180, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge. Senator Shoebridge. General business notice of motion number 180 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any uh, opposition to this being taken as a formal motion? There being none, I call Senator Shoebridge. I move the motion. So the question is that general business, Senator Chisholm. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. The government will be opposing this motion. The disclosure of material of the nature requested by Senator Shoebridge would be contrary to Australia's national interests, including because it may be prejudicial to the security or defence of the Commonwealth and could prejudice international relations as well. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 180, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Thank you. Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 180, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order. There being 14 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 183, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I seek leave to postpone the consideration of general business notice of motion 183 to tomorrow, the 22nd of March. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Thank Askew. No, I now not. move to general business notice of motion number 181, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Senator Bragg. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion 181 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Bragg. Sorry. I move the motion. Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. The government will be opposing this motion. The government notes that the complaint, investigation and ruling all occurred under the previous government and was not disclosed. As the government has previously explained, it would be inappropriate for a report into a confidential workplace investigation to be tabled in the parliament. Even with redactions, there is a risk that tabling of such a report would have implications for the privacy of the subject, complainant and witnesses and could act as a deterrent for further complaints as well. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is, uh, Senator McKim. Thank you. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator thank, McKim. Thank you, President. The Greens will not be supporting this motion, but I want to be clear that we do not accept the government's public interest immunity claim on the grounds the document contains legal advice. However, the government's claims in respect of the privacy of individuals, the integrity of investigations and undue prejudice have some merit. But this is not necessarily the end of the matter. I intend to raise this issue at the next meeting of the Senate Economics Committee to examine whether the committee might be able to assure itself whether this document is confined to a workplace relations matter or whether, and if so, how it has any broader public policy ramifications. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 181, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, those against say no. no. The noes have it. No. We'll now move to general business. Yes. Uh, I'm going to put it again, and I, senators, we are in business of the Senate. We do it. Every day of the week, people should be well versed in it. I called it. There was one voice. In fact, there were no voices. Uh, and beg your pardon. There was one. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I properly. I am going to put it again. But I urge you to pay attention. I find it extraordinary if you didn't hear me call that seriously. So the question is that um, general business, notice of motion number 181, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Yeah. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 181, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There be 32 ayes and 34 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 186, standing in the name of Senator Henderson. I'll just allow people to get back to their spots. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 186 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, of course, Senator Henderson. I move the motion. Senator Chisholm. To make a short statement. Uh, leave granted for one minute, I believe, Senator Chisholm. Uh, this is an unnecessary motion. The Department of Education is engaged in a process of clearing submissions from the consultation process and de-identifying student survey data for publication. This is a standard process to address privacy issues. The process is ongoing and it is expected that it will be completed in the coming days. The Minister's Office has been responsive to the Shadow Minister's Office on this bill, going so far as to prepare at their request a bespoke markup of the bill for their consideration and pointing to where public copies of certain submissions are already available. This motion will be opposed as cleared submissions will be available in the next few days. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 186, standing in the name of Senator Henderson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. <clears throat> so the question is that general business notice of motion number 186, standing in the name of Senator Henderson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 46 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 182, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham. <laughs> Senator Dunningham. Well, she thinks it's her, but it's. My word. Uh, I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 182 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Dunia. I'll move the motion. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Chisholm. As the Senate will already be aware, these documents are both sensitive and cabinet in confidence and as such cannot be released. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I ask that the question at Power C put, be put separately. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll just get the actual motion, Senator Lamb. No, it's fine. <clears throat> So the motion uh, is, is uh, listed as A, B, C and D, and you've asked for C and D to be put separately, Senator Lambie? Um, uh, no, no, Madam President. I've asked that the question regarding Clause C of the General Business Notion, Notice of Motion um, be put separately. Sorry, just C. Thank, Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 182 standing in the name of Senator Dunningham, clauses A, B and D be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No, have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute.
order of the doors. So the question is at general business, notice of motion number 182 standing in the name of Senator Dunningham, clauses A, B and D be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 46 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I am now going to put um, clause D, uh, C of um, Senator Dunningham's uh, motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 182, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham, clause C only be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 182, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham, clause C only, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 31 ayes and 37 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of, mo notice of motion number 184, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Now, I believe this is the last motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 184, standing in my name, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 184, standing in the name of Senator Rice, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. If uh, senators can leave the chamber orderly, please. <laughs> Senator Thorpe has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today. It is shown as item 12 on today's order of business. It is, proposed, is the proposal supported? There's, there's only one person. Four people. Come there on, Babbitt. There Help is me not out. four Help people me out. standing. With, with, the, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. First Nations deaths in custody are a national crisis. In 1991, we had a Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, yet here we are 32 years later, more than a generation later, and more and more of our people are dying in custody instead of putting an end to this crisis. When I first walked into this chamber, I carried this message stick engraved with one life for each death Senator, in custody since the Royal Commission, Senator, which was supposed Senator to put an Thorpe, end. Senator Thorpe, you know very well that we don't allow props to be used in the chamber. I was allowed so to I'd bring it in you, when I walked in to that this That was when you in. walked in. 441 you, deaths in custody Senator I Thorpe, this place. I ask you to be seated. Now we've got... Senator Thorpe, are you going to continue? Proper way, yes. Yes, can I continue? You can continue. That stick, when I walked in here, had 441 deaths in custody. Now we have over 540 deaths in custody. At least back in 91, this got public attention. But not now. Nobody wants to know about it. Even though Labor's own father of reconciliation, Senator Dodson, has called the government out about its inaction. In the last three decades, we have seen government after government letting us down, clearly showing that they don't care. You didn't care, now you don't care. Each and every one of those lives matter to us and to many people. Some of these people whose lives you're throwing away were not even sentenced or held for even minor offences, as was the case with Tanya Day, being arrested because she put her feet on the train seat. She died because she put her feet on the train seat. A white fella wouldn't be arrested for that. Labor and the coalition are in the race to the bottom. 
to the bottom to be tough on crime. However, we all know that the social factors are the first and foremost determining crime rates. Most of the recommendations of the Royal Commission were on social factors to make sure that our people are not being left behind. Every government comes up with new buzzwords on how they are going to deal with black people in this country, closing the gap, introducing advisory body after advisory body. Yet there's no changes on the ground. More of our people are being incarcerated, more people dying in custody, and more of our people are taking their lives. I talked to blackfellas in prisons and they told me about the hanging points. They told me exactly where the hanging points are in the prison cell. The recommendation talks about the hanging points in these cells and these young men are telling me where they are and how they'll tell each other how to hang themselves. You can't blame them. What does their future look like in this country? The system knows about these hanging points, but nothing's being done. Not a problem if another one of us dies. Worst of all are the privately operated prisons, those operating the criminal circo, which the government love having on board and paying them. But circo are the real criminals here. They are the ones hurting and killing our people. All this is allowed because there is still wide-ranging systemic racism in this country, in all institutions, first and foremost the police, the police violence and against First Nations people is off the chart in this country. All your voices to parliament, all your closing the gap gammon statements all worth nothing because you ain't saving our people's lives in this country. So do it. Get the 339 right recommendations from the Royal Commission that this country paid for. Implement them now because black lives matter in this country. Stop killing us. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Little. Thank you. The last project I worked directly on before being elected to the Senate was to put in place a custody notification service in South Australia for the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement, ALRM. The custody notification service, CNS, provides round-the-clock support to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people taken into custody by police. The service required notifying ALRM as soon as practicable on arrest that they have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person in custody. The benefits were for assisting police to discharge their duty of care and reducing risk for everyone. The service facilitated communication between the arrested person and ALRM, who provided a holistic wellbeing check and basic legal advice and communication with police for those who were held with or without charge. It was a simple step in reducing preventable deaths in custody and related harm. One of the saddest stories I've heard was when in the NT a few years ago a woman was taken into custody after police responded to a domestic and family violence report. A baby left behind died. The CNS assists disclosure of issues related to medication and or mental health issues or personal issues that might create risk for a person held in custody and or others. It was funded by the coalition while in government and the NIAA website advises that an evaluation to determine the effectiveness of CNS uh, and is underway to identify the gaps and opportunities for improvement. It has been that way since September 2022, and I very much look forward to finding out what the future of CNS is. I want to talk about the fastest growing cohort of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in custody. It's women. Although Indigenous Australians make up 3.2 per cent of the general population, they make up around 32 per cent of all prisoners. The Australian Law Reform Commission suggests the rate at which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are imprisoned is a reflection on the multiple and layered nature of disadvantage they face. That is, the links between entrenched disadvantage, including social, cultural and economic forms, 
and increased rates of criminal justice contact. These are well established. These must also be tackled too. It is the reason I argue so strongly for improving expectations, performance and accountability of service provision everywhere, because improving these outcomes will provide the foundations for people to build their own lives and their own futures. Where these fail to deliver as they should, the people who rely on them struggle. The Law Reform Commission provides evidence that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are frequent victims of crime, particularly interpersonal or violent crime. Female Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners are likely to have been victims of crimes themselves, particularly family violence and sexual abuse. When I was in Alice Springs recently, I went to visit a, the um, Alternative to Custody Life Skills Camp, run by the Drug and Alcohol Services Australia organisation. There I met a number of women, young women, mothers, women who while behind a high fence and with ankle bracelets, generously and confidently shared their stories and hopes and desires for building a better, a different future on release. They explained how their decision to participate in the Alternative to Custody program enabled them to live in a 10-unit complex, learning cooking skills, literacy and numeracy, and getting relevant support from counsellors. It's a six-month program, a community model to address behaviour, and it recognises cultural and individual needs and values. Women can self-refer or they can come directly from custody. The women shared their greatest fear on leaving custody was finding housing that would support them to maintain a stable home from which to anchor and rebuild their lives and the lives of their families. They were also concerned about remaining safe and free from the scourge of domestic and family violence. While addressing deaths in custody is important, it is also equally focused, important to focus on prevention, and that means children going to school, the expectations of parents to send those children to school, teachers who are focused on high expectations for those children because they turn up to learn, and opportunity for reward and training and a job when they finish learning to ensure they are on a much more positive life trajectory. It's quite simply not complex and it's not too much to ask us. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dotson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Acting President. Uh, any death in custody should concern us all. And it's clear that the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples dying in custody is a sad matter for families and reminds governments things need to change. I was a commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which reported more than 30 years ago. More than 500 Aboriginal people have died in custody since that time, and that is a statistic that I know unsettles us all. But as the Royal Commission found after its exhaustive four years of inquiry, it's not the death rates of Aboriginal people are higher than non-Aboriginal people in custody. It's the rate at which they are taken into custody that leaves Aboriginal people so grossly not only represented in our prison populations, but vulnerable to death in custody. The root, what's the root cause of this dreadful statistic? It's simply too many Aboriginal people are being locked up. Imprisonment should be the measure of last resort, as the Royal Commission said. The Productivity Commission reported last year that First Nations peoples are 13.5 times more likely to be in prison than non-Indigenous Australians. First Nations people make up only 3.8 per cent of the Australian population, but they represent 32 per cent of the adult prison population. These figures are completely unacceptable. There have been dreadful examples of neglect and abuse in our state and territory criminal justice systems, in lock-ups and prisons and custody more generally. And it's long been my position that those who have responsibility for care and supervision of people in custody must be held to account. I was particularly disturbed by the findings earlier this year by the Victorian coroner who inquired into the horrific death 
of the lady who died in spite of having sought help from custodial officers more than 30 times. I do note that the coroner found that if all the recommendations of the Royal Commission had been implemented, her death would likely have been avoided. But I reject the premise of this matter of public importance, public interest, that the government of which I am a part of is unwilling to take action. We are serious about reducing the number of First Nations peoples going to jails. That's why in October's budget last year, we committed $99 million to fund First Nations justice package. And that, of that money, $81.5 million will be invested in up to 30 community-led justice reinvestment programs across the country. We've already identified two priority sites uh, for early intervention in Alice Springs and Halls Creek. We want to build, a successful, build on the success of initiatives like those people at Burke in New South Wales. There the Aboriginal community has worked with governments, service providers and with great success to support local initiatives. That's what's, going to, that's what's going to have to happen across the country if we're going to meet the justice targets under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap for both adults and youth. Of course, this is not the only approach required if we are to make progress. Our federal system, many of the levers of change sit with the states and territories. They are the ones with control of police, prisons and health care that is provided within them. But national leadership is critical. The previous government was intent on abdicating responsibility back to the states and territories. This government will not shirk from its duties. This government has reinstated the Standing Council of Attorney Generals and made Indigenous justice a standing agenda item. It's working with states and territories to develop a proposal to raise the minimum age for criminal responsibility. It's funding for the first time legal representation for families at coronial inquest and it's advancing real-time reporting of deaths in custody to ensure better accountability across the country. We need to keep First Nations peoples out of jails and out of lock-ups. That's our goal and we're determined to achieve it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this motion on behalf of the Australian Greens. As a First Nations woman, I know all too well about the unacceptable rates of deaths in custody in Australia's history and also at present, particularly being from Western Australia, which has the highest number of First Nations deaths in custody. I want to acknowledge the family and the descendants of the town of Roeburn in Western Australia, my home state, which was the catalyst for the Royal Commission after the death of John Pat. We don't know exactly how many First Nations people have died in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission because it just keeps happening, but more than 520 First Nations people have died in custody, and that is what we do know in the last 30 years. I want to take a moment to acknowledge those 520 families and communities that have lost loved ones from which have been taken from them all too soon. My heartfelt thoughts are always with them as we continue to do this work, which in itself is unnecessary and cruel lack of action results in their loss. Unfortunately, this is not a new issue either. I mentioned earlier the, 99, uh, the 1991 Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody, which has produced a list of 339 recommendations, at which 36 per cent of those have not been fully implemented. So we've got a report. What are we going to need to do now? And why aren't we doing this? It's absolutely shameful. And the Greens have continuously called for Medicare in prisons. The coroners of state this could actually help to reduce deaths in custody, and our deaths while in custody are from health conditions which are in fact treatable, meaning that many deaths are entirely preventable if there is adequate community controlled and culturally appropriate health care available in custody. Identifying these presenting health issues and maintaining people's health whilst they're in prison is vitally important in playing a key role in preventing deaths in custody. I want to finish by speaking about my time as a police officer in the West Australian Police Force. During this time, I was responsible for transporting, caring for and processing people in custody. The continuum in this care is important to contextualise and understand the fundamental human right frameworks that are based on the human rights, uh, UN human rights principles for people in custody. And these include all prisoners shall be treated with respect, 
due to their inherent dignity, dignity and values as a human being. There shall be no discrimination on the grounds of race, colour, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or either status. This, an example of this is the requirement for police officers to conduct cell checks every 20 minutes unless they get an alarm raised for whatever issue that may be presenting. And a clear example of that is the case of Miss Jew. Everyone has the right to be treated with humanity, dignity and respect, and this includes people who are in custody regardless of time, Order. place and circumstance. But unfortunately, Your this is not the case expired. for First Nations people. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Acting President, I just rise to speak briefly on this um, uh, matter of public importance. I um, thank the uh, speakers who have contributed to this debate, and particularly can I acknowledge um, my colleague, Senator Dodson. Um, he um, has asked me to speak on this important motion, and I do so acknowledging his long-standing um, work in Aboriginal affairs, particularly as director of the Central and Kimberley Land Councils, and, of course, in, in relation to this important um, matter in, as commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Um, it's clear that um, there has been um, little to no um, change in some of the facts and figures that have been cited by those um, uh, in this debate, and that is a case of national shame and a case of national tragedy. Um, but we certainly um, are not on this side of the chamber um, uh, sitting on our hands or ignoring um, Senator Dodson in his calls for action or um, ignoring those in the community who want to see change. Um, First Nations deaths in custody are a national shame and a major marker of the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. They cause devastating and intergenerational trauma for families and communities. Um, I'm, uh, I live in far north Queensland, in north Queensland, and <clears throat> it's fair to say that, the, um, that deaths in custody in our region have um, formed part of the identity of communities um, and, of course, the tragedy of communities as well. And I speak without naming the person um, about the death in custody in 2004 on Palm Island, which has um, caused so much heartache um, and despair in that community. Um, our government is listening to communities about taking steps, um, something that the previous government failed to do. The government is absolutely committed, absolutely committed to addressing the ongoing tragedy of First Nations deaths in custody, and it is uh, completely, completely um, uncalled for and inappropriate for those opposite or, or anyone in this chamber, chamber to um, uh, insinuate that this government is ignoring these recommendations or even the Royal Commission itself. As the Royal Commission has made clear, there are many reasons um, that Indigenous deaths in custody occur, but of course the main reason is that the, um, the rates of uh, incarceration in the Indigenous community are so high. Too many young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are, in particular, are being robbed of their futures by a system that has completely let them down. First Nations people are 13 times more likely to be imprisoned, making up to 30 per cent of the adult prison population, but only 2 per cent of the Australian population. And certainly we know that um, uh, young Indigenous people make up a, um, a major um, proportion of juvenile, people in juvenile detention. So, um, our, our government is taking steps. That's why we've invested $81.5 million in 30 community-led justice reinvestment initiatives across Australia. And we're establishing an independent national justice reinvest reinvestment unit. Uh, this was a recommendation from the Australian Law Reform Commission, and we are putting it in place. This is the largest funding package in justice reinvestment ever committed by the Commonwealth. Justice reinvestment will involve a community-led and holistic approach to keeping at-risk individuals out of the criminal justice system in the first place. It's such an important step to be taken. Justice reinvestment is something that the former government failed to do. 
and we are righting that wrong by investing in this important, important strategy for First Nations people. Uh, these projects will address the underlying socio-economic drivers that increase First Nations people's risk of contact with the criminal justice system by working with local communities on local solutions. And that really is key, can I say, to achieving any type of reform or change uh, in this area of policy or um, in this uh, space is, is working with local communities. Um, we need to listen to what the solutions are on the ground and we need to implement those solutions. That's why existing justice reinvestments programs have proven record, re record reduced incarceration, reduced crime and reduced recidivism. It's incredibly important that these programs are supported and we Order. seek that support from those across the chamber. Time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. If we want real solutions to our country's problems, we must deal with facts. With deaths in custody, the data shows there's no crisis. The rate of deaths in custody has been steady for 20 years, at around half its early 90s peak. These are indisputable data from the Australian Institute of Criminology, the government agency tasked especially with monitoring deaths in custody. Adjusted for population, non-Indigenous prisoners were twice as likely to die in prison than Indigenous. Yes, you heard that right. If you are not an Indigenous person, you are twice as likely to die in prison than an Indigenous prisoner. Due to the small numbers, deaths in police custody fluctuate from year to year. The data on Indigenous deaths in police custody per Indigenous population has drastically reduced since the 90s and has remained steady at this low rate for nearly 20 years. The real crisis is of male deaths in prison. On a population-adjusted basis in the last reported year, men were 60 per cent more likely to die in prison than women. Senator Shoebridge. The sickening regularity of deaths of First Nations people in custody is a cause for national shame. It's indeed a cause for international condemnation of our country and our government and this place. More than 540 First Nations peoples have died in custody since 1991. This is not an accident. First Nations deaths in custody are the product of a racist criminal justice system which over-polices First Nations communities, of systematic disadvantage, of courts that are more likely to send First Nations people to prison and of prisons that are unsafe in structural and systemic ways. And these, as Senator Cox made clear, are all the result of political decisions from parties in this place who won't stand up when powerful police associations demand more powers and more resources, from those who are more interested in funding new prisons and new cells than programs to support communities or even listening to communities in the first place. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was announced in 1987, more than 35 years ago. And in response, it was in response to the shocking and awful deaths of First Nations peoples, including 16-year-old John Pat from WA, who died in a police cell in 1983. John Pat was brutally murdered by police, who beat him to death outside a police station, and no one has ever been found guilty for his murder. In fact, in the 234 years since the invasion of this land, not a single prison officer has been convicted for a black death in custody. This is why the common chant at First Nations rallies rings across this country, and it rings so true. They say accident, we say murder. The Royal Commission made, re made crucial recommendations to make prisons less dangerous, an obvious one being the removal of hanging points in cells. A simple matter, you think, to undertake when we're seeing billions and billions of dollars spent on new and expanded prisons. But 32 years later, there are thousands and thousands of prison cells in this country that still contain hanging points where desperate people can and do hang themselves. And so when we're told by the former government or by this government that it's fixed, that the recommendations have been implemented. It's a downright lie, and it's a lie that is killing First Nations peoples. The lack of proper medical care in prisons is also a deadly assault. It's a deadly, and it's a, and, and it's, it's a deadly assault on First, yeah. Nations, on First Nations inmates. Our supposedly yeah. universal health care system literally stops at the doors of a prison, and, those, and often therefore fails to meet those who, who most urgently need the help. Like Douglas Shillingsworth, who died in a New South Wales prison following an ear infection. Mudija means the strong one, which was, which was uh, his name in Murrawari language. He was killed by an ear infection because of inadequate care. 
We need to urgently put Medicare into prisons, and we need that Medicare delivered by Aboriginal-controlled health organisations so it delivers the culturally Order. safe care Your that First Nations people need. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Hughes, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements that have been made by the Whip. Senator Hughes, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the government has made some very grand promises to the people of Australia before the election. They were promises that we on this side warned were either ineffective or not so simple to implement. But this Labor Party and the Prime Minister said, let's throw caution to the wind turbines. We'll just legislate now and work out how it all works later. And until then, we'll just blame everybody else. Well, sadly, those empty promises worked and the electorate bought them and got them into government because these lofty goals understandably sounded wonderful. But once again, we've seen the reality that Labor has no real plan. Labor has no detail, only ideology. And when that ideology hits reality, well, then we know what Labor does next. It comes for your hard-earned money. It uses your income to prop up its own failures. This government has had more than enough time now to either deliver or come clean to the Australian people on its election promises. They said, we'll bring down your mortgages. But all Labor has managed to do is make a mess. To deal with inflationary pressures, we have seen nine consecutive interest rate rises. Nine. But when the Treasurer and the Prime Minister would rather write essays and go to music festivals than work in tandem with the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, what else can you expect? As Australians with mortgages buckle under the pressure of a tenth consecutive interest rate rise, the Albanese government's only solution is to break promises and increase taxes. A person with a typical mortgage of $750,000 is now paying $1,700 more per month than they were when interest rates started rising in May. That's an extra $20,000 a year to the average Australian family. Interest paid on mortgages grew by 23% during the December quarter. Families are therefore being forced to pull back on other spending and household savings are plummeting. Many, many mortgage holders are starting to feel the pinch. They're struggling to find the money necessary to just make the repayments. So what we're staring down the barrel of is an increased number of defaulted loans in the months ahead. Australians are being forced to tighten their belt on their budgetary spending as household bills continue to skyrocket. Research has shown that nearly half of all Australians have cut back on purchasing things like takeout, while a third have resorted to buying less meat and seafood. So why is this government sending the country back to the dark ages? I mean, that could become a literal statement this winter if energy prices and supply continue down the path they're on. Blackouts for the East Coast. Australians have been warned by IEMO that there'll be energy rationing and blackouts in the coming years due to the early retirement of coal and gas generators, along with construction delays to Snowy 2.0 and the Curry Curry gas plant. When the coalition left office, there was no reliability gap. Labor's lost control of Australia's energy system. This government has harped on about championing the cause of the elderly, but we've seen more deaths in aged care, care than during the first two years of the pandemic under this government's watch. More deaths in aged care since this government came to power than during the first two years of the pandemic. Just let that sink in. They're hard numbers. They're not things you can fudge they're not something you can yell about and point the finger backwards. These are hard figures. More people have died in aged care since you came to government than occurred during the first two years of the pandemic. That is the hard, cold truth. And the reality is, though, as we head into this winter, and it's an absolutely appalling thought, these blackouts that are being predicted, this energy shortage, this supply shortage, I sincerely hope it is not a very, very cold winter because very cold winters, high energy prices, budgetary pressure on family incomes means people don't put the heater on. 
And what does that mean for the elderly? It means there will be deaths. We know that there are dire consequences when elderly Australians do not provide heating for themselves in their home because they cannot afford to do so. And that will be firmly and squarely on the shoulders of those opposite due to their recklessness, the fact that they have no plan, and when they do attempt anything, it is market intervention that is going to make every single problem worse, as market interventions all too often do. Senator Foley. I'm proud to be part of the Albanese Labor government. Why am I proud? It's because we are addressing the mess that those people opposite created over nine very long years. It's all very well for us to have a fairy tale contribution to this debate, and next will be goblins and witches that are going to come out and, the, and we're going to rewrite history once again. But the reality is we were left with a trillion dollar debt. That's what those opposite left for the Australian people, not just the Labor government, but the Australian people. Trillion dollar debt. And then we had a contribution just then about aged care. I'm gobsmacked. I really am. That anyone from that side of the chamber would come in here and question Hello. and question the Labor government's commitment to aged care after 10 months of being in government. And what have we seen on that side? What we saw over nine years was a failed government, five ministers who failed in aged care over nine long years. They were so bad they had to call a royal commission into their own failings. And what has Labor done since we came into office? We have put respect, proper care, we want to put nurses back into residential aged care. These are the things that we are doing. We are addressing, and there's no getting away from the, the fact that, yes, there is a cost of living crisis. People are doing it hard. If you are really sincere about addressing this crisis, then you would support the Housing Future Fund. That's what you do on that side of the chamber because the biggest cost Senator of living crisis for the Australian you, community. Order, remind you to put your remarks through the chair. I wasn't talking to anyone. I was saying those on that side of the chamber. But I, Senator if you Foley, think I you did, you're using the word "you" several times. You. Address your remarks through the chair. I, I then apologise, Chair uh, President, Acting Deputy President. But the reality is, those opposite, those under Mr. Dutton will not agree to supporting the Housing Future Fund, which will change the opportunity to get women and children off the street into their own home. Order. It will get older women off the street from being forced into living on the street. It will also ensure that women who are leaving domestic violence situations, you can't come in here and do your fake tears when it suits you. These are real issues that are facing the Australian community. People cannot afford the rent. They cannot get affordable housing. Support Order. the legislation that is coming before this chamber. Then you will actually have a reason to come in here and you can make your contribution. But if you're not prepared to help resolve the issue, you can't just come in here blaming the whole world events is on this government after 10 months. But what we have done since we've come into government, we have reduced the cost of medicine. We have put forward cheaper childcare that Order. will benefit $1.2 million. Polly, Senator Polly, resume your seat. Standing Order 197. Interjections disorderly. Senator Hughes, you've had your opportunity to make a contribution. Senator Polly will be heard in silence. Senator Polly. Thanks for that protection. I don't really need it because I know when they start interjecting, you know that the truth hurts on those on that side of the chamber. We will be introducing electricity bill relief with the key feature of the May federal budget. Direct support for households and businesses that the opposition tried to block. Let's put this on the public record. They tried to block it. We have invested 180,000 fee-free TAFE places that are now available to tackle the skill shortages. 
unlike the previous government, and we know from the contribution that was made in question time today that the uh, the attributes that was displayed by those when they were in government of having a finance minister and then he didn't even know that the Prime Minister had taken over his portfolio, come in here and try and lecture us about the cost of living and what needs to be done for the economy. Now we know that there has been difficulties. We know that some of that has been contributed to the Iraq war and what's happening there in terms of energy prices. But those on that side had nine years to come up with an energy policy. They had 26 of them, but delivered not one. Not one. So you can rewrite your fairy tales as often as you like when you come into this chamber, but the Australian people, they saw right through you. They are reliant on the leadership of Anthony Albanese and the Labor government who will do what is necessary to protect and to support those doing it tough in this country. Well, your time has expired. I notice from mine senators to address remarks through the chair and to address members of the other chamber by their correct title. Senator McKim, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I've got a memo for the Labor Party, and that is this. People voted for change at the last election. People voted in a new government because they wanted you to be different to the former government. But what have we got? We've got more of the same from a Prime Minister who every day is looking more and more like Scott Morrison light. Because Labor is pushing Senator ahead. Senator McKim, I've just reminded senators about using the correct titles for members in the opposite house. We well, can't use someone's full name anymore, Deputy President. Is that your ruling? You either need to use a title or their seat that they represent. We can't use their full name. Not alone, no. That's never been the case. Senator McKim, you have the call. Well. Memo to the Labor Party. People voted for change at the last election, and what that means is they wanted the government to be different to the former government. And what you've got is a Prime Minister who is just more and more every day looking like a pale version of the former Prime Minister. You've got a Prime Minister who jets overseas to hand over $368 billion worth a new submarine deal where he is, as former Prime Minister Keating said, the only one paying. But of course it's the Australian taxpayers who are actually paying. You've got a Labor Party that is pushing ahead with the $250 billion worth of tax cuts for the wealthy that were put on the table by the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. You've got a Labor Party that is pushing ahead with the safeguard mechanism, a policy designed to fail by the former LNP government. And all the while, interest rates are going up in contravention of a direct promise made by the RBA, and real wages are going backwards at the fastest rate on record, faster than they were going backwards under the former government. I mean, how can the Labor Party look the people in the eye who voted for them and defend tax cuts for the wealthy and a $368 billion expenditure on nuclear submarines. They are ghastly, indefensible po policies and they perpetuate social in injustice and they will make it harder for everyday Australians to get by. Poverty doesn't have to exist in this country. It is a political choice that policy exists in this country, and it is a choice that wasn't only made by the LNP, who I would expect every time to make that choice. It's now a choice being made by the Australian Labor Party, because they would prefer to give tax cuts to the wealthy than to end the prospect of someone starving on income support in this country. That's how far the Labor Party's fallen. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank Senator Holly Hughes for uh, bringing this very important matter before the Senate here today, an opportunity for us to 
make a contribution as senators, and I stand today uh, in solidarity with uh, everything that Senator Hughes uh, said in her uh, contribution. Uh, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis, that's for sure. Uh, every Australian is experiencing that, obviously some uh, far more than others, uh, but it is a crisis, and I, I don't think that is putting too strong a word on it. I don't tend to use language, uh, uh, alarmist sort of language. Uh, I try to be as measured as I can. Sometimes I have a little flourish here and there, but uh, it is a crisis that Australians are facing. Uh, cost of living is, no doubt, the number one issue, the number one issue that Australians are facing. Now, when the government was in opposition, they repeatedly said that they were going to make cost of living easier, mm -hmm. easier for Australians. Well, it's clear that the Albanese government has no plan at all to deal with this cost of living crisis or indeed inflation. I mean, inflation is running out of control. And I don't think there's been a single policy that this government has brought forward yet that goes to addressing it. They've left it all up to the RBA, the RBA, who will just put interest rates up, which of course impacts uh, the, the amount of money that people have in their household budgets because their mortgages have gone up. But they're not doing anything to reduce inflation by putting downward pressure on government expenditure. Uh, they've said that uh, wage growth should match inflation so people don't go backwards. Now, with no plan at all to place downward pressure on inflation and chasing inflation with wage rises, inflation is only going to continue to rise. Now, as I said, instead of working in tandem with the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, the government is putting all its energy into breaking election promises and taxing Australians more. Now, someone that would know something about the impact that Australians are facing, particularly those that are in, on lower to middle incomes, uh, is the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army's general manager of policy and advocacy, uh, Ms Jennifer Cacaldi, said, what we have found is that the people who are already doing it tough are now experiencing extreme hardship. The people we work with, especially those reliant on government payments, are making impossible decisions between food and rent or essential medicines and school supplies for their children. Now, the current situation is unsustainable, she said. Immediate action is needed to relieve pressure on the most disadvantaged in our community. But everything that this government does, frankly, is only making matters worse. We're now up to the 10th consecutive interest rate rise. An Australian with a typical mortgage of $750,000 is paying $1,700 extra per month. That's $20,000 per year. And late last year, the government hurried in their new enterprise bargaining laws just before Christmas, claiming it as a Christmas present. Well, it was only a Christmas present for the union movement. It certainly wasn't a Christmas present for workers for people that were struggling to pay that extra $20,000 a year on their mortgage. And what we've seen is the Productivity Commission just this last week tell us in its five-year productivity inquiry that new multi-enterprise agreements pose some risk that could constrain productivity growth and hence the scope for enduring real wage rises over time, forcing unwilling employers or employees into multi-enterprise agreements uh, in which they had no bargaining role may limit these shared productivity and other benefits. This may not just affect individual employers, but employees too may relinquish beneficial changes in working arrangements or higher wages. So this government is actually putting in place policies that is increasing hardship on families, increasing hardship on families, just because they needed to pay their masters within the union movement, just because they don't actually understand how to manage an economy, to put downward pressure on inflation. And what we're seeing is this government is unwilling to make tough decisions. They'll just allow Australian households instead to bear all the burden. Order. Senator Roberts. President Ronald Reagan once said, quote, the top nine most terrifying words in the English language are, 
I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah. The words, I'm from Labor and I'm here to help with your cost of living, are even more terrifying. Labor lied and promised the world to get elected to government on less than a measly third of the vote. Instead of a Labor utopia with rainbows and unicorns, Australia is waking up nearly a year later with a mother of all hangovers. Inflation is roaring out of control. Mortgage payments have skyrocketed. Fuel's still $2 a litre. We've just grown to expect it. And electricity bills are positively shocking, driven higher by climate policies, pushed by both major parties. We said it wouldn't be easy under Albanese. I don't think anyone thought it would get this bad this fast uh, or Senator be this Order. arrogant this fast. Senator Roberts, remember you need to address members in the other chamber by the correct title. Thank you. One Nation advocates getting back to basics on energy, taxes, manufacturing, food production and value-added mining. Richest country in the world, uh, let's the use the resources for the expired. people. Senator White. The government understands that the rising cost of living is hitting a lot of uh, Australians hard. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer know that it's not easy. The government knows that it isn't easy. I know that it isn't easy. The Australian people understand that we didn't create these challenges, but Australians elected us to take responsibility for addressing these challenges, and we are. After 10 years of failed energy policies, 10 years of Liberal Party debt, 10 years of wages either stagnated or going backwards, backwards Australians had had enough. Now we're embarking on the long road of trying to right the ship after the Liberals, trashed, uh, the Liberals national government trashed our country for the best part of a de decade. We have heard a lot about electricity prices recently from the opposition. I want to talk about en energy prices too and put on record what is really going on. Last year the Albanese government legislated to, to, to cap wholesale energy prices on coal and gas. We did that in large part because we had to deal with a wasted decade of failed energy policies from the coalition. We did it in part to respond to the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has put enormous pressure on global energy markets. We called the Parliament before Christmas to deal with this situation. The government took it seriously and acted. We legislated the Energy Price Relief Plan. Now, just three months later, we are already hearing from the Australian energy regulator that it has, had we not acted when we did, energy prices would be 40 to 50 per cent more expensive than they are now. Without the gov that government intervention, Australian families would have paid an extra 300 sorry, $530 for energy. Without the government's intervention, Australian businesses would have paid an extra $1,243 um, per year for energy. That is what real action to address the cost of living is about, uh, and that is what it's about for Australians. When given the chance to support cheaper pro power prices, the coalition said no. When asked if they would support Australian households and business by st stabilising the energy market, the Liberal and National Party said no. The coalition voted against cheaper energy prices and voted against support for Australians feeling the sting of inflation. If the coalition had been in charge, Australians would be paying hundreds of dollars more for electricity than they currently are. What makes it worse is that, that it was their 20 failed energy policies over a decade of inaction that put us in this mess. When we came to government, there was no plan from the coalition to deal with what was coming down the pipeline. No plan to deal with high domestic wholesale energy prices. No plan to shore up and stabilise our domestic energy market, even though the war in Ukraine had been raging for months when they were in government. And now it's up to us to fix the mess, and that is what the Albanese government is doing. More than just stabilising power prices, we are taking action to both fix the budget and provide Australians with targeted cost of living relief. Our budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation. That's the most important thing. What we're also doing is cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicines, more affordable housing and getting moving, uh, wages moving again. Getting mo wages moving uh, in particular is important in the face of the inflation challenge. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill that the government legislated last year is already doing that. Employers and employees are sitting back down at the bargaining table in good faith and re reviewing their arrangements. Zombie agreements that were way out of date and unfair are gone, and that is a very good thing because the, there were many more out there than we first thought. We also gave the Fair Work Commission the ability to facilitate industry-wide and collective low-paid bargaining. This will give the lowest paid workers in society who need the most help an opportunity to get a pay rise. 
It really is a bit rich that the co coalition raises what we are doing to address the cost of living and responding to inflation. Their track record is one of saying no and distorting the truth about their 10 years in government. The Labor government is working every day um, to make Australia a more productive and fair place to live. We are working hard to solve problems and being honest with Australians. Australians recognise that the Albanese government has a plan in contrast to the coalition, which is why, as Taylor Swift would say, when it comes to the coalition, you've got to shake it off. And Australians at the last election j did just that. Senator Babette. Thank you. As a member of Generation Y, I often hear older generations reflect on the late 1980s and home loan interest rates of 18 per cent. Now, I have no doubt that these were very tough times. Well, following 10 consecutive interest rate rises, excessive money printing and government debt accumulation, we now live in even tougher times. Now, the reason is quite simple. It's short-sighted government intervention that only stimulates the demand side of the equation and it has resulted in households which are overburdened with debt. It is an unsustainable reality of modern society. Now, economics reporter Stephen Johnson recently wrote that a rich Australian in the top 3.6 per cent of earners bringing in $180,000 a year is in more mortgage stress than an average income borrower who bought a typical home in 1989. Now, I urge the Treasurer to acknowledge that the government spending drives inflation and to put the brakes on now. We just can't take it anymore. Stop spending money. Your time has expired. Yeah, yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, yesterday in question time, I asked Minister Farrell if the Labor government would deliver the 275 power bill reduction uh, they promised the Australian people no less than 97 times before the election. He didn't answer. I then asked if he would admit that the Labor government broke their election promise to make no changes to superannuation. We now know that one in ten Australians will be impacted by their superannuation changes, one in ten, far from the modest broken promise uh, that Minister Gallagher keeps talking about. But again, of course, he had no answer. I then asked if the minister would admit that his government broke yet another election promise to lower the cost of PBS medicines after they removed a life-changing uh, life diabetes drug from the PBS. That is a fact. And of course, he had no answer for this either. It is very clear that with this Labor government, as with every other Labor government, you never ever listen to what they say before the election and to the promises they make on what they will do and what they won't do, because there is nothing more certain, and this uh, government has now demonstrated that truism. They'll say one thing before the election and they'll do another thing afterwards. In fact, the very same Minister Farrell said in response in estimates to questions about the NDIS, he admitted on behalf of Minister Shorten that they said one thing before the election and suddenly uh, new facts were revealed that made them change their position and break promises. In this case, no cuts to the NDIS. So they say one thing and they do another thing. Now, let's have a look at the facts and how they say one thing, do another, and they break promises without shame. They promise to, to lower electricity prices, broken. The promise of cheaper mortgages, broken. The promises of no change to super, broken. The promise to lower inflation, broken. The promise that we're not touching franking credits, guess what, broken. The promise that industry-wide bargaining is not part of our policy, we know that that was broken too. The list goes on and on. The promise that we will be doing our bit to assist real wage increases, broken. The promise not to raise taxes, broken. The promise to cut the cost of consultants and contractors, broken again. Western Australians who I represent in this place are seriously struggling already in less than a year under this Labor Party and this Labor government. Everything but everything is going up except their wages. There is no relief in sight. And listening to those opposite in this chamber again this week, 
They are blaming everybody else. We didn't know the state of the economy. Well, let me tell you, the fact is that we left the Labor government, if not the best, one of the best and strongest post-COVID economies in the OECD and, in fact, in the world. That is a fact. And now, with the procession of Labor Party members and senators and ministers saying, oh, we didn't realise that we'd actually have to govern, we actually have to make decisions to deliver the promises we made Australians. And it's somebody else's fault. It, oh, it's somebody else's fault. We didn't actually read the budget papers for, you know, last, for the last year or the year before or the year before that. We didn't actually read any of the documents to actually understand the state of the economy. And they supported at the time the decisions we made to save Australians' health and the economy during COVID. You supported all of those at the time, and now you're saying, Order. oh, Senator now Reynolds those from... opposites Thank you. are saying, oh, we didn't really realise that that meant we'd have to make some hard decisions and we'd have to do things, some tough things, to deliver on our promises. Instead, they're just breaking promise after promise after promise. And the impact is severe for people in Western Australia. Western Australia has experienced the biggest jump in their grocery bills, which have now, since this, uh, those opposite came into government, by more than a third, more than a third in less than 12 months. Increases in grocery prices add up to an additional just under $2,000 per year per household for Western Australians. It is money they cannot afford. With nine consecutive interest Order. rate rises, Western Australians expired. are suffering. Resume your seat. The time for the discussion has expired, and I'll now proceed to the consideration of documents, uh, which are listed at items one to six on page four. Does any senator wish to take note of any documents? Senator Scar. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I rise to take note of the Treasury Laws Amendment Black Economy Task Force Measures No. 1 Act 2018, statutory review of the operation of Schedule 1 to the Act dated December 2022. Mr. Acting Deputy President, this uh, legislation dealt with what is referred to as sales suppression technology when it was first introduced. Uh, into the Senate. And what is sales suppression technology? Sales suppression technology is technology that is used and marketed to be used at point of sale in retail businesses to essentially change, change the records of sale. Why do you do that? You do that in order to bring down the records of your revenues in terms of your sales information in order to avoid paying tax. Simple. And this sort of technology has been deployed all across the world. Uh, in the United States, it's referred to as zappers, and also applied in Canada, Scandinavia, across the whole of the OECD. So this place, before I, I came to the Senate uh, in 2019, adopted some laws which came out of the Black Economy Task Force report undertaken by Mr Michael Andrew A.O into the black economy in Australia. And we should note, we should note the size of the black economy in Australia is substantial. And it was estimated, and this is back in 2012 at the time of the report, to be at least $25 billion or 1.5 per cent GDP. So this is a material issue in terms of the raising of tax revenue for the Australian people. But it's also a material issue in relation to all those small businesses, especially small businesses who are out there doing the right thing, who aren't using this sort of technology, who meet their obligations under industrial relations laws, workplace health and safety laws, incur the costs involved, involved in meeting those laws and discharging those obligations, and who are disadvantaged, materially disadvantaged, when their competitors adopt schemes, scams, ways in which to avoid their lawful obligations. So it is interesting to read this report and the impact that the legislation, the penalties that were adopted, has had in relation to the promotion and use of this sophisticated electronic this sophisticated technology. And what have we learned from the report that has actually been provided by the ATO and by Treasury? There are a number of interesting observations in this regard. There's actually been a total of 31 cases 
prosecutions and penalties levied against Australians in relation to the possession, 10 cases, use, 8 cases, aiding and abetting possession, 6 cases, aiding and abetting use, 7 cases, total of 31 cases where this sort of electronic or what's referred to as ESST technology has been utilised, has been discovered and where enforcement action has been undertaken. And I think I'd like to actually take this opportunity to really commend everyone in the ATO who's been involved in these compliance activities. It's estimated the total amount of revenue that's been recovered or preserved as a result of this activity undertaken by the ATO. It's estimated to be over $7 million. So we're actually talking about quite a significant amount of revenue. Another thing, another observation that can be made is that following the COVID-19 pandemic and the increase of the digital economy, this sort of technology is becoming more and more prevalent. So those who are marketing this sort of technology are actually pitching it to, to businesses as they enter into the digital economy. So this is becoming a more, a more prevalent issue and the technology is becoming far more advanced which means that the ATO needs to be appropriately resourced with the capability to uncover this sort of conduct. Because the first thing, of course, that occurs when the initial discovery is made is that the perpetrators actually try and destroy the audit trail and make it extremely difficult for investigators to actually build a case. The other thing I should note, and apparently it was raised in debate, I'm not sure if it was raised in, in debate by any of my colleagues who are here in the chamber, um, but legitimate question to raise. Uh, the concern was raised about penalties being applied uh, for accidental possession or use of ESST software. So maybe you've got a software system, it's been uploaded to your system, you really didn't know what it was, you weren't using it, um, and you're discovered to be using this sort of software. The ATO has found that it has not received any complaints about penalties being apply, applied despite accidental possession or use of ESST. T software. So I'd just like to take the advantage to opportunity to commend everyone in ATO and Treasury on this important reform where the work's law's working as it should. You seek leave to continue your remarks? I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Any other senators wish to take notes of documents uh, one to six on page four? If not, I will move to the consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports on the examination of annual reports tabled by 31 October 2022. Uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the advisory report of the Committee on the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and Other Legislation Amendment Modernisation Bill 2022. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's 86th annual report. And finally, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the committee's 207th report. Thank you. Do any senators wish to take note? Those reports, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report into annual reports number one of 2023. Uh, and I, in doing so, I'd like to first commend uh, the Secretariat of that committee in relation to the preparation of that report, and of course the, the usual collegiate way in which uh, members of that committee uh, conduct themselves under the chairmanship of uh, Senator Nita Green. Uh, I would, the particular point I'd like to make around this report is the performance of the Attorney General's Department, and, uh, and colleagues in the chamber will quickly realise uh, the reason why I'm making these observations. If one turns to paragraphs 2.6 to approximately 2.12. You will see that the Attorney General's Department, under its rigorous reporting standards, um, actually, and I quote here from paragraph 2.11 of the report, of its 24, 29 performance targets, 73 per cent were achieved, 21 targets, and 10 per cent were partly achieved, three targets. The Attorney General's Department reported that 17 per cent 
of its targets were not achieved. Five targets. This is a lower rate of achievement than reported during the previous reporting period. During the previous reporting period, 87 per cent of targets were achieved, 11 per cent were partly achieved, and one target was not achieved. The Attorney General's Department explained that the lower rate of achievement is due to the reduction in the number of targets under its performance measures and the rigorous system of assessment it applies to the analysis of each performance measure. And in the first place, I'd like to make the observation I think it's incredibly important that our government departments, whether or not it's the Attorney General's department or whichever department, adopts, adopts performance measures which are appropriate, fit for purpose, uh, and are set at a reasonably high level and, import, importantly, are rigor, rigorously assessed for performance. So that's the first point I want to make. Second point I want to make is that there are a number of explanations given with respect to targets which were not satisfied. And as I said, of its 29 performance targets, 73 per cent were achieved, 21 targets, 10 per cent were partly achieved, three targets, but 17 per cent of its targets were not achieved. One of these targets is target 1.5.2, satisfaction of government lawyers with initiatives provided by the Australian Government Legal Service. Greater than 80 per cent is the stated key performance indicator benchmark greater than 80 per cent. Results from the department's stakeholder survey indicated that 66 per cent of respondents were somewhat or very satisfied with the Australian Government Legal Service and its initiatives compared to 32 per cent of respondents in 2020 to 21. So that is quite a reasonable uplift from 32 per cent to 66 per cent, and uh, that is a pleasing result. Now, what confuses me what confuses me, Mr Acting Deputy President, is that in that context, and I look at those results in the Attorney General's own department, and then I look at the results in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal annual report, which is referred to in this report, and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the AAT, actually performed better, actually performed better on some of the relevant analogous key performance indicators than did the Attorney General's department. The AAT actually performed better. They performed better. And let me give you an example. In terms of the AAT user experience rating, the result was 74 per cent, 74 per cent against a benchmark of 70 per cent. So 74 per cent of users, and that includes practitioners. It also includes those who were individuals whose case was coming before the AAT, a 74 per cent, a 74 per cent approval rating against a benchmark of 70 per cent. And then I compare it, I go back to the quote I gave in relation to perceptions of the performance of the Australian Government Legal Service, and the benchmark was greater than 80 per cent, so a more aggressive benchmark on that stakeholder user experience rating than the AAT had, 80 per cent versus 70 per cent, but the result was only 66 per cent. So they failed to meet that benchmark by an amount of 14 per cent. They're going in the right direction. I'm not critical of the Attorney General's department. What I'm critical of, what I'm critical of is, a government, is a government which, notwithstanding the performance of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal based on key objective data, based on key objective data, key performance indicators, which indicate that the AAT is actually performing in the face of that key objective evidence that the AAT is actually performing, they're hell-bent on a course of abolishing the AAT. They're hell-bent on abolishing the AAT. If the Attorney-General applied the same rigour to his own department, he would abolish his own department. He would abolish his own department because the satisfaction with his own department is less, is less amongst government lawyers than the satisfaction of lawyers and users of the AAT. If he, applied, if he applied the same logic to his own department, he'd look at his own department first before looking to abolish the AAT, before, before looking at abolishing the AAT, which, in my view, demonstrates that the motivations in relation to the abolition of the AAT are political. They're not based on objective evidence. They're not based on objective evidence. It's political, not based on objective evidence. During the course of estimates, when I put to the minister at the table, what objective evidence had the Attorney-General Mark Dreyfus obtained 
with respect to the performance of the AAT, which was contrary to the objective evidence contained in the, in the annual report of the AAT, I was told the Attorney General is in contact with his community. He gets feedback all across the community. General waffle, 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 waffle. There was absolutely no objective evidence whatsoever provided. No objective evidence. So, Attorney, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, Attorney, if you think the AAT should be abolished for actually meeting its performance metrics in relation to stakeholder perceptions of its performance, what about your own department? What about your own department? What do you say about your own department? Let's go on in terms of the AAT performance. In its annual report, which is referred to in this report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, and to me, this is a key. This is a key benchmark. Proportion of appeals against administrative appeals tribunal decisions allowed by the courts. Now, the benchmark of the AAT, the KPI which it set, was less than 5 per cent. So less than 5 per cent of appeals <coughs> should be successful to the federal courts. That's a reasonable benchmark, less than 1 in 20. And what was the result the AAT achieved? Less than 1 in 50. Less than 1 in 50 was successfully appealed against in a federal court. An outstanding result. An outstanding result. And if you look at the data over time, the, result have, have, the results have actually been improving. The results have actually been improving. So the Attorney General, the Attorney General is going down the course of abolishing the AAT. He's made extraordinarily prejudicial comments about many, many, many members of the AAT, and one cannot accept the proposition that the attorney should be in any way involved in terms of assessing the performance of those members over which he has cast a general slur. He shouldn't be involved in terms of assessing their performance at all and should recuse himself absolutely from the process of considering those members. But one is left to ponder how is it that on the one hand you have an agency in the same portfolio, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which, which is actually exceeding its target regarding satisfaction, um, perceptions of satisfaction from its users, actually exceeding its target at 70, 74 per cent. And then on the other hand, within the same department, you've got perceptions of the Australian Government Legal Service not meeting its target and, in fact, 14 per cent under its target. So, Attorney, why are you picking on the AAT? Why are you picking on the AAT? It's, it's become a monomaniacal obsession. Of the, of the attorney. He's like Captain Ahab and Moby Dick the whale. It's become a monomaniacal obsession of the attorney general, and it is not based on any objective evidence. It isn't based on any objective evidence. I agree with the attorney when he says the AAT is absolutely crucial, is absolutely crucial as an institution to protect the rights of Australian citizens. Absolutely agree with the attorney. But if you are going to embark on a great reform such as this, where you're actually abolishing this body at the cost of millions and millions and millions of taxpayer dollars, base it on objective evidence. Base it on objective evidence. And this report from the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee demonstrates that the Attorney General's policy in this regard is not based on objective evidence, and he should reconsider. Thank you, Senator Scar. Is any other senator seeking the call? There have been none. I'll put the question. The question is that the Senate take note of the reports tabled. All those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I'll call the minister. Thank you. I present government response to the report of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the Data Availability and Transparency Bill 2020 and a related bill and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Anyone seeking the call? There have been none. I'll put the question that the Senate take note of the report. All those that opinion say aye. Aye. Those that opinion say no. The ayes have it. Is any senator moving to take note of the of item seven on page four? There being none, we'll move on. Uh, there have been no ministerial statements or committee memberships or messages from the House of Representatives. We will now move to business of the Senate. So I'll call the clerk.
Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, relating to a reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many amazing people who make up our one Queensland community, Sorry, I Senator move Roberts. the motion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You've moved the motion. You may continue. Food Standards Australia and New Zealand are processing an application right now to approve laboratory grown meat known in Australia as in vitro meat. It's called cultured meat, although I can see nothing cultured about it. It's slop. I'm horrified that bureaucrats, university academics and representatives of the business sector that will make bank out of this move could decide this once in a century shift in agricultural production. Conflicts of interest. Today, One Nation has submitted a motion to refer in vitro meat to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee inquiry. This reflects that FANS, for SANS, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, reports to the Minister for Agriculture. There are 450,000 people employed in the red meat industry in Australia, working in 63,000 businesses who collectively are the lifeblood of the bush, the lifeblood of our country. This does not include the poultry industry, which is the subject of this first fake meat application. The poultry industry produces 1.3 million tonnes annually of high quality, affordable meat, white meat. This contributes $7.9 billion to our economy, employing another 58,000 Australians. Seafood is another industry where in vitro technology is being concocted. Seafood contributes $3.1 billion to the Australian economy, employing another 17,000 people. Australia exports beautiful natural produce, which is in strong demand worldwide because of its high quality and reasonable price. The livelihoods of half a million Australians and their families rest on the outcome of this inquiry. The economic welfare of rural Australia rests on the, on the outcome of this inquiry. In vitro meat has many issues that do need an inquiry. The cells that are cultured, yes cultured, in an intensive near urban industrial production facility are obtained using a painful muscle biopsy on a live animal. Every year thousands of biopsies will be required to get the muscle cells needed to grow enough fake meat for project projected production. At the same time, the Red Meat 2030 plan provides for a doubling of the price of red meat, pricing natural meat out of the reach of everyday Australians. This is an attempt to force consumption of fake meat, like it or not. In vitro meat is a seismic shift in health, nutrition and culture. We don't know what issues will arise on the production line for these products, what diseases, what fungi, what bacteria will creep into a facility like this? Most likely meat will still need antibiotics and chemicals to control such contamination. With in vitro meat, the cancer risk is high. The cancer risk is high as cells are replicated over and over, increasing the chances of a cancerous mutation being packaged for sale. Real animals have a self-healing system, though, that hunts down and kills cancer, cancerous and precancerous cells every minute of every day. In vitro cells do not. An alternative technique to in vitro replication of muscle cells is to use a bioreactor to use cornstarch, plant skeletons, fungi and gelatin to engineer fake meat in an immortal cell line. What a name, an immortal cell line. The final product has all the nutrition contained in whatever nutrient supplements or additives can be added to this slop before it is formed into fake meat. It is slop with nutrients. The environmental credentials of in vitro meat are suspect. In vitro meat still needs food, hormones and growth factors to grow. The equation is still energy in, stored energy out. The faster the growth, the more profit is generated, and there will be a lot of profit. The billionaires who are lining up to bring in vitro meat to the market are the same billionaires who are telling us how much damage cows are supposedly doing to the environment. Nobody is apparently concerned with the, with the obvious conflict of interest. 
Livestock production is not bad for the environment. Livestock farts, burps and belches are part of the biogenic carbon cycle which works like this. Plants absorb carbon dioxide and through the process of photosynthesis harness the energy of the sun to produce carbohydrates such as cellulose. Cattle are able to break down cellulose for food, releasing methane into the atmosphere. Methane is CH4. Note the C for the carbon atom. Over a 12-year period, the methane is converted back into carbon dioxide through hydroxyl oxidation, a naturally occurring process in our atmosphere. The carbon released in that, in that process is the same carbon that was in the air prior to being stored in a plant and then released when the plant consumes it. It's a cycle. For a constant herd size, the cattle industry is adding no additional methane to the atmosphere. None. Insect-based fake meats and lab-grown in vitro fake meats are a solution to a problem that does not exist. I know why this is happening. Fake meats offer a scalable production system in a controlled environment located right next to major markets, offering high profits on a predictable, stable cash flow, independent of weather conditions, natural weather conditions. No wonder the billionaire predators that run the world are lining up for their slice of this new multi-billion dollar market. All they have to do is to get their mates, their underlings in government and the bureaucracy, to persecute farmers out of existence and the market for fake meats will present itself. Look at Holland, New Zealand, and now look at America, Britain, Canada, and now with this application, Australia. Why should we even let them call this rubbish meat? Meat is a natural product brimming with goodness. Fake meat is a chemistry experiment that has more in com common with pet food than human food. Flavorless cells cultivated in a test tube with additives for taste, additives for so-called nutrition. It's fake. As Senator Macdonald's inquiry into the definitions of meat and other animal products recommended, this stuff should not be labelled or sold as meat. Clarkson's farm on Prime Video has been, I'm sure, an eye-opener for city dwellers who have no clue how bad the persecution of farmers who grow our food has become. After watching the very entertaining Jeremy Clarkson teach himself farming, contending with the rules, the paperwork, the long hours, the lawyers, the activists, the heartbreak and the never-ending expense, one has to ask, why would farmers do it? That, senators, is the idea. If billionaire predators can get decent, hard-working, salt-of-the-earth farmers to walk off their land walk away from the love of pro providing the public with nature's bounty, then they can sell their Frankenstein food from their factories and make out like bandits, while wrecking the health of everyday citizens. I hear people say that fake meat will be dearer than natural meat, yet the billionaires promoting this putrid slop are not spending all this money just to make a product that is less tasty, less nutritious, less safe and dearer than the competition. Production volumes will soon ramp up and quality and safety checks will be compromised to ensure the product is cheaper. The war on farmers will keep ramping up until room in the market has been conjured for their fake meat. Now I understand that Labor, the Greens and Teal Senator Pocock will oppose this motion. How can the Labor Party possibly still consider themselves the party of the people when over and over and over they sell out the people? The further left the Teal, Greens and Labor Party march, the less relevant they become to the lives of everyday Australians. Worse, the more harm they do to the lives of everyday Australians. I thank Senator Macdonald for her comments and ask the Senate for your support for this motion. As long as we have amazing farmers bringing us natural, safe, nutritious protein, the world will never need dangerous food grown in a laboratory. One nation is now the party of the people. Thank you. I'll go to Senator Stirl first and then we'll, would you keep going either side of the chamber? Mr. Yes. Acting Deputy President, I do appreciate that and colleagues, I, I'm hosting a road safety thing upstairs, so if you allow me to just get out of the way, I appreciate that. 
Uh, I just want to talk to, the, to, 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 this, to the, this motion. And what we do know is the food sector, Mr Acting Deputy President, to you is seeking rapid innovation and, and change in products and markets globally. We understand that. We understand by 2050, the Food and Agricultural Organisation estimates we will need to produce 60 per cent more food to feed an expected 9.7 billion people. That's scary figures. Now, across the world, we know enterprises are looking at opportunities to diversify protein supply to meet global demand. Uh, we know the Australian government is committed to ensuring we are well placed to meet this demand through the expansion of both traditional livestock and alternative protein industries. Now, Australia has some of the strongest food safety provisions in the world, and we want to keep it that way. The Australian government, with our state and territory counterparts, is committed to keeping food safe through legislation and regulations such as the Food Standards Code. And um, the primary role uh, of food standards is to ensure safe food supply so Australian and New Zealand consumers can be confident the foods they choose to buy are safe to eat. God knows we all want that. We know Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, which we refer to as FSANZ, F -S -A -N -Z, is responsible for setting food standards in the Food Standards Code. Now, in February of this year, Fazance accepted its first application to permit cell culture quail as a novel food. And it is the only cell culture meat application currently being assessed. Now, Fazance follows a rigorous process for assessing the safety of food. The assessment of cultured quail meat application will include it talks about chemical, nutritional, microbiological and dietary exposure assessments. They talk about detailed examination of the applicant's production process and review of the food science to ensure that the product is safe to consume prior to it going on sale. Now, uh, Fazance's assessment will also involve two rounds of public consultation. In fact, I think it should be more. We should be talking a lot more, but they're going to do two at this stage. Details will be made available on the Food Standards website as consult consultation dates are set, and we'd hope that they are too. It is expected this assessment will take approximately around 12 months, so who knows how long that will take. If Fazance approves the product, Australian and New Zealand food ministers will have 60 days to review the decision. And the government views Fazance as the appropriate body to deal with matters of food standards and safety and would suggest inquiries of this nature go to Fazance directly. But I was sitting there earlier and I have to be honest, we talk about, I'm only always honest, what am I saying? but I'm sharing it with you more. I thought, what the hell is sow culture meat or cultured quail meat? And I was on the committee that Senator Macdonald drove into what is meat and some of the nonsense that we call meat, and, and I'm on Senator Macdonald's side on most of this stuff. But I thought, I've got to look this up. And with modern technology and the help of my good friend, Senator Payman, I said, how do you Google this? And she found this for me. And I've got to share, I want to share this Oh, Senator Sullivan, you're going to love this, OK? Now, now um, I've got to share this with the Senate. This is what I found. And bear with me, because I'm reading it on an iPhone, and I've forgotten my glasses. But it says, several continuous tissue culture cell lines were established from methylcochalanothrene-induced fibrosarcomas of Japanese quail. Clear as day. I mean, you don't have to be Einstein to work that out, but it's helpful that I could read that. Have I got a worried look on your head? I'll keep wow. going. The lines consist either of fibroblastic elements, round refractile cells, or polygonal cells. Simple. They show transformed characteristics in agar colony formation and hexosuptake, and most are tumoregenic. Of course they are. What else would they be? Their cloning efficiency in plastic dishes is not increased over that of normal quail embryo fibroblasts. Goes without saying, as day follows night. The quail tumour cell lines do not produce endogenous avian oncoviruses, thank goodness, and fail to complement the Brian Heyer titler strain of Rouse sarcoma virus. Phew, dodged the bullet. Uh, Brian High Tyler strain of Rouse sarcoma virus 
This test was tested to lack the P27 protein of avian oncoviruses. Most of the cell lines are susceptible to subgroup A, avian sarcoma viruses, but are relatively resistant to viruses of subgroup C, E and F as compared to normal quail embryo fibroblasts. What have we got to worry about? It's in the hands of the experts, seriously. So I see no problem. I rely heavily on Fazant's. I mean, that says it's clear as day. You know, and I understand Senator Roberts's concerns, and we do have to have concerns. But if anyone can't understand what I've just read out there, we shouldn't even be in this joint. <laughs> you coming back truck driving with me? <laughs> thanks, thanks. I thought it was just me. But I got on a serious on a serious note. Um, and, and Senator Roberts, I understand your passion, and I get, I understand where you're going. And uh, unfortunately, Labor won't be supporting. Uh, when I say unfortunately, unfortunately for you, sorry mate, and, or unfortunately for me, the others will and will be doing the inquiry, I don't know yet, but we won't be supporting it. We do have faith in Fazant's. We have faith in our scientists and in our uh, specialists and our um, um, uh, you know, experts in this field. But uh, if we do do the inquiry, by well, looking forward to going through this with you, Senator Roberts, and we can share some of this info together while we're um, you know, waiting to question uh, uh, people because, you know, I just found it's, it's, it's clear as day. It's not a problem. So thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, th thank you very much, Senator Stowe. I think we're picking up what you're putting down. And I'll go to Senator Macdonald and then I'll come back on this side. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, I want to stand to support Senator Roberts' uh, motion because I think that transparency in the decisions we make around food are critical. They're important. Nobody should be afraid of transparency and inquiries mm -hmm. into something like this. And, and so I congratulate Senator Roberts for bringing this forward. The food we eat is the most important thing that we think about each day. Some of us think about it better than others. Uh, I'm afraid that I fall off the wagon uh, regularly with uh, things that are certainly not approved uh, on, the, on the, um, you know, the healthy foods list. But generally, particularly the food that we give to our children, that we put on plates to share with our families and friends, we think about that a lot. We think about it in terms of cost. We think about it in terms of nutrition. We think about it in terms of when we plate up are we going to be regarded as a superhero? And I learnt a lot about that running butcher shops. That is the sort of decisions that we as humans make as we decide what it is that we're going to, to feed our loved ones, our in-laws and our, uh, ourselves. Now, this idea of having an inquiry into what cell-based meat or protein is, what in vitro food is, is, makes complete sense. It makes complete sense to provide an environment where Australians and other people around the world can see a very open and transparent discussion. There is nothing to be afraid of, I believe, from either uh, the meat industry but also from the cell-based uh, cell meat industry because we should welcome consumers feeling confident in the food that they buy. Now, last week I had the benefit of being at a summit with a, uh, a very interesting panel of people, but one of them researches humans' desire for food and what the future of food will look like. And there is a great deal of data that shows that consumers are looking for an understanding uh, of what they eat, of trust in what they eat. Now, Australian farmers uh, are very high on the list of trusted professions. I, I believe at the moment it is doctors, nurses, farmers. There has been a huge investment into uh, people understanding where their food is grown and how it's grown, uh, and we should celebrate that. But if there is new entrants to the market, they are actually seeking that same tick, that same quality understanding, that same desire from, from humans to know that this is something that they should feel confident about. And this application for in vitro protein that's in process uh, has gone before Fazan's. 
And I have to tell you that I am not satisfied that this is a transparent organisation. Because in 2016, they allowed an application from a major food manufacturer to go through to change the definition of meat. And they allowed it to become so broad that you can now have processed vegetables, processed uh, plant protein uh, being called meat. Put a picture of the animal on the front, talk about meat, uh, and that's branded and the product. I'm not afraid of that, but it's not right. We spend so much time demanding that consumers have truth in label labelling, that they can trust the claims that are made, and yet we allowed through a process that allowed for consumers to be, frankly, misled. So the idea of this, this referral that Senator Roberts is making is about transparency, about confidence, and I would hope that one element of that will be about the definitions of what this is. One of the people who I met during the process of the inquiry was Professor Paul Wood, AO. Now, Professor Wood, just this week, or just last week, addressed the Rural Press Club in Queensland, and he talked about exactly this topic uh, of, of the production of cell-based meats. Now, this is an important topic, uh, not just because of consumer sentiment, not just because of nutrition, but we have seen a whole lot of start-ups recently that take the hard-earned uh, dollars of mums and dads' investors uh, and of taxpayers' dollars, and very sadly, those start-ups have not been able to support the claims that they have made. And there have been millions of dollars that have been wasted, not on not the problem not being that a project is not worthy of investigation. It's that their claims have been too great, too outlandish, too. Uh, uh, you know, it reminds me of of, um, of when you get a rush on a market. This is so exciting. We're going to pour money into these things, but there runs the very real risk of cell-based claims doing what has already happened with plant-based claims and people losing a lot of money. And these claims that are being made about the production systems do bear to stand up to the scrutiny of a Senate inquiry. Because if they have nothing to be frightened of, then they should welcome this. And for a government that has come in based on, we believe in transparency, we believe in a new kind of government. Well, this is just one more example of how hypocritical that is, because the moment that we want to try shine some light on a very important topic, no, we're going to shut that down. We're going to shut down any transparency uh, into this examination. There is no risk. I believe that these new uh, plant-based proteins or cell-based technologies are going to drive out the production of traditional farming methods. It just won't. This is not as much as some people, uh, like my good friends in the Greens, uh, like some industry people would like to have us believe, this is not about a competition between red meat, between farming organisations and these new products. Please do not think that is the point of what I'm trying to say tonight. I'm trying to say that there is a new technology coming to town which, if it was successful, could potentially feed uh, poorer parts of the world, uh, parts of Africa, South America, to provide a different form of protein. But billions of dollars are being poured into this new technology into an estimated 150 cultivated meat startups around the world, because they're betting that investor money that they'll be able to produce lab-grown protein alternatives at a commercially viable scale while also attracting customers. Now that is a noble and fair pursuit of commerce. That is the way the world works. New products come to market, uh, they're invested in, and then consumers make a decision about where, whether or not that is going to go ahead. 
But given, uh, given some of the technical, technological issues, uh, that has got a very real risk of actually uh, sending a lot of these investors to the wall and these companies to the wall. Because the uh, science is very difficult. It is very challenging. So some cell-based meat startups have publicly announced that they have commissioned fermentation vessels of up to 250,000 litres in size. The biggest that has ever been done to date in cell culture is about 10,000 to 20,000 litres. So this is the first example of a commercial claim of a company that is attracting investor dollars that is not supported by any technology, any manufacturing process in the world to date. I think that it is only fair that we start allowing people to have a transparent a discussion into what these technologies are and whether or not they are a whole lot of hype. I've got no doubt the technology works. We've seen it in Japan. They can produce uh, pieces of, of uh, protein that look like uh, meat grown from an, from an animal. I've got no problem with that. But what I do have a problem about is these products being sold as if they are an investment certainty. And if that is not worthy of a Senate inquiry, uh, with the full public examination that we have the benefit of having in this country, then I don't know what is. And I want to know what the government's frightened of. And I want to know what the Greens are frightened of. When did they become frightened of transparency and good public decision making? This is the point of the Senate. This is the reason why our forefathers designed an upper house to allow us to have in-depth looks at legislation, about government investment and about issues that keep Australians awake at night. And this is a perfect example of a new technology where an application is going to Fazan's and there will be absolutely no scrutiny from Australians. And they deserve to know. They deserve to know, is this a good idea? Does this work scientifically? Is there manufacturing schemes that allow this? And most importantly at all, should they risk their hard-earned dollars about going into this? These fermenters run at 37 degrees, which requires a lot of energy, generates a lot of heat. The room needs to be cooled down, which requires more energy. Uh, these facilities uh, are going to need uh, a lot of electricity, um, a lot of inputs, they will not have a low environmental footprint. This is a process uh, that is not easy to grow cells. Extraneous agents such as bacteria or fungi can quickly outgrow and destroy the culture if it is allowed into a sterile uh, environment. So, you know, I just think that if you have the time, I recommend that you go and read um, Professor Paul Wood's uh, AO's address uh, that he gave to uh, the Rural Press Club. It's been widely reported uh, on Beef Central, uh, and that was only last week, the 17th of March. This deserves an inquiry. If this new technology is so good, then the, pub the publicity and the transparency should be welcomed. But if it is not, why don't Australians get to see that? Why cannot we have a discussion about new food, uh, food products? Because as I said, as I started at the very beginning, what we put in our bodies is the most important trend happening in the world at the moment. For those of us fortunate enough to live in a first world country, we get to decide about whether we have organic food, whether we have uh, food that's grown free range, whether uh, our food has been grown in an environment that has been ticked off by accredited agencies. But when we move into new products, new lines, we should be able to allow consumers to have the same confidence that they expect from a farmed product. That is all I'm saying. 
they should be given an appropriate definition. We should understand, are we going to use the same food definitions that we use for, for meat, for vegetables? This is, um, this is a far bigger and more serious issue than I think is being fobbed off. And it's being fobbed off Senator Stirl, who I have the utmost admiration for. He is a man who is very genuine and fights hard for his parts of regional Western Australia. Uh, and he calls a spade a spade. I enjoy that. But he has been sent in by the government to fob off transparency and an examination of a new technology. Uh, so instead, send it off to Fazans where it will happen behind closed doors. And we should be ashamed of that because this is our job. This is our job is to come to the Senate and examine these serious issues. So good on you, Senator Roberts, for coming up with this motion for making sure that it is examined properly. But I think that the, uh, the government, who continues to say they believe in transparency and open government, well, I call it out for the lie that it is. Because when they vote against this tonight, be clear, they are voting against investors having transparency, consumers having transparency and the broader food industry. I think it is shocking and they should be ashamed. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, senators might not be aware. Uh, it, was, it was referenced in Senator Macdonald's contribution tonight, but the Rural and Regional Affairs and, and Transport Legislation Committee just produced a big, thick report into uh, the definitions of meat and animal products that repeatedly looked at this issue. Repeatedly. It came up across a number of experts, and the evidence, as I passed on to Senator Roberts today, was that the commercial application of this technology, if it is successful, is decades away. We know there are some products that are grown uh, in vitro, but their commerciality is decades away. So I'm not exactly sure what we would be examining. And let me tell you, I'm a little bit scarred from this. Senate inquiry because it, contrary to what Senator Macdonald said tonight, it was a not so thinly veiled attack on the plant protein industry, who I believe suffered damage because of this Senate inquiry. Uh, it was pointed out to us in evidence, and I am glad Senator Macdonald has accepted it because I didn't hear her acknowledge this in previous contributions around this inquiry. But there is plenty of growth potential for the plant-based food industry and alternative meats and for traditional industries. Both, according to CSIRO, ABARES, a number of experts have massive growth trajectories. It is not a, an and-or thing. They, they both have big growth trajectories. Plant-based foods, be they uh, any kind of alternative protein, are a massive opportunity for farmers. And when I go back and have a look at this inquiry and have a look at the submissions, they were evenly matched. There was Ausveg and some massive industry bodies that gave the Senate evidence that they, 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 they were happy to see some changes to some labelling standards, but they didn't appreciate the not so uh, the thinly veiled attack on their industry and the growth potential. And that's, that's what this is, having listened to Senator Roberts' contribution here tonight. This is just another way to uh, raise the issue of, uh, you know, I don't know whether Senator Roberts might be up for election next time around, wants to get some uh, Senate action out in country areas, wants to call in some farmers to give evidence. But I can tell those farmers now, it'll lead, it's a road to nowhere, this inquiry. There is no evidence before us to examine. And if there is, there's other good ways that we all understand as senators to get that information, starting with the estimates process, starting with estimates process, questions on notice, and of course using FOIs and OPD. So if Senator Roberts is having a go at Fazant's for its lack of transparency, well, start putting in some FOIs and some OPDs and start building that information base, and then come back to the Greens if you want our support, if you believe there's something substantial to see here. 
Seriously, we've got a number of inquiries before the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee, uh, and I believe that this inquiry that we just did well and truly dealt with the issue. But if we want to help farmers across the board, be they vegetable farmers growing chickpeas for vegetable burgers or uh, peas for alternative proteins in uh, products like uh, Beyond Meat burgers, which are obviously very, very popular and very successful. If we want to help farmers, then the most important thing we can do for all of them right now is take meaningful climate action. There is no bigger threat to the farming community in this country than climate change. The costs have been estimated by CSIRO, $29,200 per annum per farm in this country loss from climate impacts. We know the whole, uh, the, uh, the whole chain, agricultural supply chain, gets impacted by extreme weather events. We've seen copious evidence in recent years around the impacts that floods have had on uh, supply chains and farmers' livelihoods. Sadly, we've seen evidence over decades now that the, about the impacts that droughts are having, extreme droughts are having on farming communities right around this country, including the mental health of farming families. And all sorts of issues, biosecurity issues that our committee is also dealing with that are directly related to our changing climate. If we actually wanted to do something substantive for farmers, why don't we look at fracking in prime agricultural farmland? I think it might have been Senator Canavan that famously said a few years ago, the Nats don't represent farmers anymore, they represent mining communities. Well, farming communities need to be represented in here on issues like fracking. Non-traditional gas is a major threat to the water in these areas, as it is to damage to agricultural land and access to agricultural land. As we're talking in the Senate today, there's hundreds of farmers out protesting in New South Wales trying to stop companies like Santos and Origin from fracking their land with thousands of wells poisoning land and water. Why aren't we discussing that? Why aren't we standing up for farming communities in this country? Why aren't we taking meaningful climate action? And we saw the IPCC synthesis report last night, the sixth and final report. We're not going to get another report for a decade. We're not going to get another report until 2030. And it was dire. It warned that we need to act now. Time is up. We need to act now. And it said action means deep and meaningful cuts to emission, bringing forward rapid transition out of fossil fuels into renewable energy and other energy sources, fast tracking the development of renewable energy projects and deep and significant cuts to emission. And it also said no more fossil fuel projects, including leaving existing fossil fuels that have already been discovered in the ground. It couldn't have been more clear. That is what the science tells us. But Senator Roberts doesn't listen to the science. He honestly doesn't give a fig about science and he never has. He can laugh all he likes. The joke's on you, Senator Roberts, to you, Chair. These are the world's most eminent climate scientists who have been working on this for decades. Decades they've been Senator plugging Wish away, Wilson, looking at the data. Your seat. Senator Roberts, do you have a point order. of order? We, we, point of order, Chair. The, um, the President herself gave an announcement that we are not to impugn other senators in statements we make in this parliament. Senator Wish Wilson, uh, what, do you have a response on that? I didn't impugn Senator Roberts at all, Chair. <laughs> he said I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'll just take some advice from the clerk, Senator Wish Wilson. Just resume your seat. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, I think your intention is to clarify that you did not uh, seek to impugn Senator Roberts, and so I just ask that you continue 
uh, in the spirit of a respectful conversation in the chamber, you have the call. Thank you, uh, President. So let, let, me, let me clarify my comments. Anybody who denies climate science, like Senator Roberts does, doesn't respect the science. I've seen him come into Senate estimates and embarrass, uh, embarrass uh, um, if you could both public re servants. Both resume your seats, please. Both resume your seats. Senator Wish Wilson, I did just give you the benefit of allowing the call to continue on the basis that you would effectively move through these comments and just continue your remarks, uh, perhaps going back to you know, the topic at hand. Um, so if you could do that, I think that would be in the interest of the Senate. Senator Wish Wilson. I don't know if it's in the interest of the Senate, President, but I'll do it, I'll do it for you to, to uh, assist you as, as, as chair. Um, this is important because it goes to Senator Roberts' disregard for the science and empirical evidence. The same will apply Senator to Wish this Wilson, resume top. Your seat. This, this Senator Wish Wilson, resume your seat. Senator Roberts, do you have a point of order? Yes, I do. He's continuing to impugn me. He's taking, telling lies about me. Um, Senator Roberts, r resume your seat. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, um, I'm going to return the call to you, but on a couple of occasions I've tried to draw you away from your current line uh, and back back to um, the broader topic of the reference, and I'd ask that you do that in your comments. Thank, thank you, Chair, but that's exactly what I was doing. I was pointing out that someone who disrespects science is hardly going to use the Senate process effectively, efficiently. This, this, is, this, is, this is very important for my contribution. And you can, you can, <laughs> you can Wilson, also... Resume your seat, Senator Roberts. I assume you have the same point of order, which I I've do, made a couple I of rulings the on. Uh, OK, thank you. I've made, a, I've made rulings, Senator Wish Wilson, so I would just ask that you abide by my rulings and you know, please, please move away from this particular line in relation to Senator Roberts and continue your comments on the broader reference. And please don't dispute my... Decision I won't comments. dispute it, Chair, but I'll ask you to go away and review it, because you can't you can't influence my substantive debate well, when I'm, it is actually I'm in line. I'm just wondering if anybody else would like the call at this point, Senator Wish Wilson. So Senator Senator Davies seeking the call. So Senator Davies, you so you're taking the call off me. No, Senator Davies, you, if you resume your seat for a moment, but Senator Wish Wilson, I've asked you, I think, four or five times to. Um, abide by a ruling in relation to Senate, Senator Roberts' um, points of order. I'm not making a decision either way about you know, the, the, the topic, but I'm asking you to continue for the convenience of the Senate, please. Um, going back to the topic of the reference um, and, and, and avoiding, avoiding um, what could uh, unconventionally be called a game of whack-a-mole right now for the convenience of which, the Senate. Which, which could which you I, just continue which I would point remarks. out Senator Roberts is deliberately playing, so I don't get to finish my speech. I, well, you've got Which, the call. You still have the okay. call. I know, I know okay, that Senator Davies is waiting. As a point of order, Chair, I do that ask that you go away and please review your, your ruling in, in relation to this. Because um, I don't believe I have been disrespectful. I've been very clear about why I've framed my comments, but I will, I will move on. Um, but if we respect the science on climate change, and I hope senators do, uh, we listen to the IPCC scientists, many of them very good Australian scientists, two of them actually very close friends of mine. Hobart, as Senator Dunningham knows, is, uh, is full of some of these scientists that work in the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies and others. They've dedicated their life to studying climate change and its impacts and its costs and its future impacts on this country, including on agriculture. Uh, and on the farming community. So if we talk about food security, then there's nothing more important than acting on climate change. So my suggestion to Senator Roberts uh, is that perhaps he uh, initiates another Senate inquiry and actually looks at, for example, the impact of fracking on farming communities, the impact of poisoning land and water. If he cares about farmers, there's a constructive uh, alternative to him. I would certainly uh, talk to my colleagues about supporting that reference if he was to bring that to Rural and Regional Affairs Committee. So I'll finish my contribution 
uh, acting deputy president by saying, um, I know the government's not supporting this and Senator Stirls offers some, con some constructive ways forward. Uh, I suggest to Senator Roberts that he pursues this directly with the department using his toolkit that he has as a senator to get information that he needs uh, and that uh, perhaps we keep talking. And over time, if there's something substantial, uh, then I'll talk to my colleagues about potentially uh, supporting an inquiry. But I bet my bottom dollar Senator Roberts hasn't read this, uh, this report from the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee that does go into looking at synthetic meats and how they're grown and the issues that were raised and discussed around this. Uh, and I do believe it would be a waste of the Senate's time and resources at this point in time when there's other ways Senator Roberts can get information on this topic. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, while I rise and I thank Senator Roberts for, for bringing this motion to the Senate, um, I will just say that I note what Senator Wilson has just said, um, and I, I just want to make the point that uh, regardless of what he feels about anyone's personal positioning on listening to the science, the whole point of a Senate committee inquiry is to operate as a committee. Um, and to say that one person can hijack or disrespect a committee process actually disrespects the committee process of this place. Yeah. So um, I, I think it is highly unfair to be not supporting a committee referral based on your personal opinion of one, one person's um, viewpoint. Um, now, I, I do. I support this referral not because I'm opposed to cultured meat or lab-grown meat or uh, cell-based meat, as it can be referred to variously, um, but because I do believe we need to investigate it further. Uh, I've, I've got a very interesting um, journal article here from the Quest International Journal and the conclusion uh, while it, the journal article is a very good, outlines the articles titled A Review on Lab-Grown Meat, Advantages and Disadvantages, and it covers off on, on both components. But one of its com conclusions is that large-scale research, clinical trials need to be done to obtain more data to support cultured meat as a climatically sustainable alternative. Based on currently available information, it will be too early to comment on the viability or environmental impact or carbon footprint and uh, necessary rethink for unrestrained culture, cultured meat production and consumption. And now this was written and published in uh, 2021, so it's not, the, it's not an old report. Although it also does identify and I found this very interesting. Cultured meat was first developed in the 1930s. So while our modern technology has improved the processes, the concept, the idea and the ability to produce cultured meat, cell-based meat, lab-based lab meat, was developed in the 1930s. And indeed, um, Winston Churchill actually uh, made a comment that uh, he predicted 50 years hence we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken to eat just the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. I find that absolutely fascinating. And it goes to the basis and the reasoning for lab-grown meat. There are lots of different opinions about why we should be converting to lab-grown meat or not. I do note and I agree with um, Senator Macdonald's comments, this is not an either-or. I do not believe that investigating lab-grown meat will suddenly see the demise of our farming industries and our livestock industries. Um, and I certainly am not of the opinion that uh, lab-grown meat is any 
more humane or kinder or gentler or better and should replace farming because our farmers, our livestock producers, um, on the whole, they're some of the best in the world. They treat their animals humanely um, while they are in the production uh, lines. But um, one of the original concepts behind producing lab-grown meat is we know the world's population is growing, exponentially almost. The world now produces more than three times the quantity of meat as it did 50 years ago. And as developing countries grow in both population and prosperity, global meat consumption has increased by 58 per cent over 20 years to 2018 to reach 360 million tonnes annually. We know as um, some of our developing nations become more prosperous, their meat consumption is going up. We also know protein, protein consumption is a vital component of the human diet. So a lot of the uh, original concepts of lab-grown meat were looking at ways that we can produce an ethical, affordable, sustainable protein particularly to help feed our third world nations. Where we haven't got to yet in the whole uh, lab-based meat production is the cost effectiveness. And at the moment, uh, the only, um, it, is, it is much more expensive to produce lab-grown meat than traditional meat. Indeed, the first lab-made hamburger created in 2012 cost about $325,000 US dollars to produce. I'm glad I wasn't at that dinner party and paying for it. Uh, more recently, Dutch startup Moser Meat estimated that the price of production is about $80 a kilo. Well, you know, if you want marble score five plus wagyu, you can sort of except paying that price. But if you're just going for a hamburger patty at 80 bucks a kilo, I don't think so. So um, my sheep producers aren't quaking in their seats just yet. However, um, there, that's not to say there won't be a role for lab-produced meat in the future. And that is why I support having this Senate inquiry, having this investigation and looking at all aspects, because I do tend to agree with Senator Macdonald. Yes, there's an application in before Fazants at the moment. Yes, Fazants have a role to play in assessing the safety of foods that, uh, that are allowed to be sold in Australia. By and large, they do a pretty good job. But this is also the same organisation that now says it is healthier to drink Diet Coke than orange juice. So um, I do sometimes question when they are purely looking at things through a fixed lens and assessing things according to a fixed formula or algorithm, um, whether they are actually uh, looking at the whole picture. So. Um, I have no problem. In fact, I completely agree that the Senate has a good role to play uh, in looking at this issue and actually evaluating and hearing from scientists, because we do all respect the science, uh, and hearing from some of the technicians. Um, the other thing we could also look at is, you know, there's a lot of claims about the environmental benefits of, of cultured meat or lab-grown meat, and you know the uh, potential reductions in methane production um, from meat grown in a lab. But on the flip side, lab-produced meat is highly energy intensive. It requires more power, and therefore produces more CO2. So while it might be reducing methane production, it could be increasing CO2 production. CO2 has a longer lifespan than methane. So, you know, is it truly 
more environmentally sustainable when we're talking about greenhouse gas, gas emissions. I do think that the conversation is a little bit akin to um, the use of gene technology in our food production systems. And once upon a time, um, there were huge concerns about the roles of a role of genetically modified organisms um, in our uh, farming production systems. Um, but we've also learnt over time that tried and tested methods and thoroughly tested, we can get good outcomes. And there are ways uh, and, and proposals where you can use gene editing or gene modification uh, to improve nutritional benefits of certain, certain foods or in the case of things like um, genetically modified cotton, we have significantly reduced our chemical usage, which is good for the environment. So I do think investigating this um, is better than just saying yes or no, having a thorough investigation so we do understand it, we understand what benefits it could bring, we understand the risks that are involved. And let's not forget, um, Lab-grown meat, it's not a vegetarian alternative, it's not a vegan alternative because it, it is meat, it is produced from taking a biopsy from an animal, taking muscle cells from an animal, putting them in a bioreactor uh, in more often than not um, fetal bovine uh, fluid. To, to produce the meat. So unlike plant-based meat, and I use quotation marks because I would rather call it plant-based proteins, this is a, a cultured meat. It actually is a meat. But it's not grown in the paddocks, it's not fed grain, it's not grazing on pastures. It's a cell that's put into a petri dish in a lab, in a bioreactor, and allowed to multiply. It kind of conceptually it sounds a just a, you know a little bit too sci-fi for my liking. However, um, I do think there may be a role for it, but I think that we should be able to investigate it. And, and I must say, I am actually very surprised that the government and the Greens are not supporting this referral because they like to come here and tell us to listen to the science. Well, that's what we want to do. They like to come here and tell us that they are the parties for openness and transparency. Well, that's what this referral will do. It will allow us to have a public investigation into the pros and cons of lab-based lab meat and to properly assess what impact, not only what impact it would have on, on diets or what impact it would have on, um, on consumers, but also what impact it would have on competing industries. Will it impact our meat and livestock industry or will it have no impact? I haven't got a predetermined idea, and that's why this referral needs to go ahead. Because there are a lot of open-minded people like me out there, but who would just like to learn more. And that's exactly what this referral is about, and that's why I commend this referral to the Chamber. And I would encourage the Greens and the government to actually change their positions and support this referral in the interests of listening to the science and to having an open and transparent process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to support uh, this referral and, uh, and, and congratulate Senator Roberts on, on bringing it forward. It is uh, very timely uh, to have an investigation of this sort for the reasons that uh, other senators have outlined. Um, before I might myself uh, elaborate on some of those reasons, uh, uh, I would like to just make a couple of general uh, comments uh, 
uh, about the need for inquiries like this. Uh, 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 obviously, we have in front of us here a question of scientific development uh, uh, of, in this case, uh, lab-grown uh, meat, uh, something completely new, uh, 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 somewhat uh, terrifying, I think, for some about the uh, possibility of risks and issues that might occur in, in laboratories. And, and I just want to make the point that there must be, there must be, much greater oversight of uh, the endeavours of our scientific community, uh, especially in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this may have been this uh, pandemic we've just experienced, the worst in 100 years, may have been the first pandemic caused by science, caused by scientists, uh, if it did come from a laboratory. Uh, 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 we do not know exactly where it came from, but uh, I think the evidence is 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 building, is growing, uh, that it more than likely did come uh, from experiments at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Certainly that seems to be the conclusion of the intelligence agencies, the Department of Energy in the United States, uh, uh, and the circumstantial evidence is quite significant. Uh, be that as it may, be that all that evidence, all that evidence, uh, I have found uh, in my work as a senator trying to expose some of these issues through the Australian Senate a complete lack of willingness uh, to engage from the scientific community, a complete uh, lack of introspection uh, about what their may, role may be, may be, and in fact worse, a denigration, an, a, an explicit uh, coordinated uh, attempt to denigrate anyone who may suggest uh, that somehow scientists, uh, like the rest of us, uh, can make mistakes or uh, sometimes be conflicted. Uh, 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 and do the wrong thing, uh, because what is, is uh, worse about the potential involvement of the Wuhan Institute of Virology is that scientists in Western free countries were, uh, were definitely involved with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and potentially involved uh, with the experimentations on coronavirus that had led, potentially led to this, uh, this tragic outbreak that has killed uh, six million people around the world and counting. Uh, in the United States, we know that, that uh, United States government funding went through to the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, through, a, uh, through the EcoHealth Alliance uh, based in New York, uh, uh, stuff that seemed to be illegal at the time, but they, uh, Dr Anthony Fauci and the NIH seemed to find a way to get that funding through without scrutiny of their government. Uh, here in Australia, not perhaps as uh, consequential uh, behaviours, but still the CSIRO were involved in training and working with Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, scientists, including on coronaviruses, perhaps not the experiments that led to this outbreak, but they definitely worked with them on coronaviruses. All of this has been exposed uh, through the great reporting of Shari Markson and uh, stuff that I have followed up here in the Senate. And despite all this evidence, despite, despite all this evidence to this day, the Australian government is refusing, and the CSIRO should say, and, 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 and the, the Department of Industry, they are refusing uh, to reveal details of what gain-of-function research they have conducted with taxpayers' money over the past 10 years. Uh, so I have asked for information about that. It's through those questions it has been revealed that 17, we have funded 17 gain-of-function experiments uh, over the past decade. Uh, but apart from some very broad uh, generic descriptions, we have no information about what papers came from that, uh, what were the findings of those, uh, that research. They will not release any of this. For the, because of the trumped-up excuse that somehow releasing this information that taxpayers funded uh, would cause uh, the safety and security of scientists to be put at risk, that they would be potentially at risk of, of having death threats and what have you. Uh, this is ridiculous. These experiments, these gain-of-function experiments, may have led to the deaths of six million people around the world, uh, yet, uh, yet we cannot get basic information about them. Uh, through the Australian Parliament, given even though they were funded by the federal government. Now, that's not exactly what's in front of us before, but there's a, there's a similar situation here, where the scientific community seem resistant to any outside, uh, non-scientific examination of what the hell is going on in laboratories and what are the risks to the rest of us. Because there were certainly risks out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology that impacted on the rest of us, and because of that we deserve to have appropriate scrutiny of what occurs in laboratories here in Australia and, any, and indeed around the world if we are to use the products that come out of uh, those, uh, those laboratories, if they are to be approved here. Uh, the second point I would like to make, the general point I would like to make, is uh, it is quite depressing uh, to see uh, the state of the 
one's proud Australian Senate right now. There is a cabal over there on that side of the chamber that is uh, coordinating uh, to stop and prevent legitimate Senate inquiries occurring, uh, to stop uh, the scrutiny of uh, proper scrutiny of, of government and decision making. We effectively have a Greens Labor alliance in this chamber. Uh, they are one. They almost vote together almost all of the time. And this is a very sensible inquiry being brought forward by Senator Roberts. Not everyone has to agree with the concerns uh, he has raised, uh, but it's, it's clearly in the wheelhouse of what we would typically do in a Senate inquiry. And I, as the uh, chair of the, uh, the committee, this the References Committee on Rural Affairs and Regional, um, Rural Affairs and Regional Transport Committee, that my, myself as a chair, would be happy to conduct an inquiry of this matter. Uh, into this, uh, this issue, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts had checked with me before moving this motion. It's just very unfortunate that we have this, we have this, uh, this protection racket over there on the other side that uh, uh, is working together uh, to stop the Senate doing its uh, proper business. Uh, they, they are li literally only allowing inquiries to occur and to things that aren't going to cause any embarrassment. I mean, this one itself is not actually into really anything. Uh, to do with the functioning and workings of government, uh, or running in a tangential way, it's really into, as I said earlier, about the, the science and, and the developments here that will, of course, one day find their way to a regulator's desk. But, but nothing that would really necessarily embarrass the Albanese government if, if Malcolm or sorry, Senator Roberts exposed anything through that. But still, still, we see this resistance to it um, uh, and, and a combination here to, to not allow legitimate inquiries. I, I think it's uh, very, very sad uh, to see the Senate uh, uh, reduce uh, to being effectively a rubber stamp for the government. It's not what we're here to do. Uh, uh, and it diminishes us all uh, through the conduct of Labor and Green senators combining in this way with the executive to prevent the normal functioning and scrutiny that should occur in this chamber. Because there is, there, there is a need for this in this uh, particular area, because just like the example I used uh, around coronavirus, uh, there seems a level of zeal uh, from uh, those pushing alternative proteins, and in particular in this case lab-grown meat, that concerns me, that really concerns me. Uh, 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 it's one thing to be uh, proud and, and, and uh, 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 forward-thinking about innovations and excited about technological change uh, uh, that can make people's lives better. It's another thing from some of these scientists that, who seem to think that, that uh, the experiments that might happen here or the, the technology that might come out of a laboratory, in this case in lab-grown meat, will somehow save the world. Uh, that's the mission uh, some of these scientists seem to be on, that uh, somehow the need for these alternative protein sources will stop the world from uh, um, instantaneously combusting at some point in the next few decades. And my concern with that is that's, that when you have such a Masonic uh, ideology and approach to life, you're more likely uh, to put aside any potential risks or countervailing issues that might arise in your pursuit of that Masonic goal. Because these scientists think uh, that their work uh, that their developments are the, potentially the key to save humanity, uh, they are less likely then to worry if, uh, if, if these particular uh, products that are cause uh, greater disease uh, or carcinogenic issues uh, or zoonotic disease spread, any uh, uh, issues like that that might crop up in the development of these technologies would seem small against the potential uh, benefit of saving humanity as a whole. Uh, and you see this across lots of different human endeavours and behaviours where the Masonic uh, approach uh, loses perspective, loses all perspective of the fact that there are multiple factors to take into account when evaluating uh, something as techno te tectonically changing as growing our food uh, in a laboratory rather than organically. And so this is a, a, another justification above, above and beyond. Uh, just the fact that we should be scrutinising technological and scientific developments, but in this case there should be greater scrutiny on it because uh, of, of that Masonic approach that uh, I sometimes see uh, from the scientific community. I mean, we have seen, and, and it goes beyond just the lab grown issue, and one thing I wanted to get to is I think this inquiry is needed not just for the lab grown meat issue. I note that the terms of reference do allow for any other related matter, and I spoke to Senator Roberts about the potential that if we did get this inquiry up, we should look at other alternative protein sources as well. Uh, um, there, there's obviously been a plethora of plant-based 
uh, proteins uh, come onto the market. Uh, there's been a lot of labelling issues around those that I know are separate inquiry that uh, Senator Macdonald uh, did fantastic work on. When we were in government, we allowed those sort of inquiries when we were in government. That was uh, not, a, not an inquiry that you know, necessarily the executive welcomed, but we allowed an inquiry into in the Senate to do its work and look into to labelling of meat products. And so Senator Macdonald did an excellent job on that. There are those issues, but there are also health issues as well. These uh, plant-based proteins include enormous amounts of sodium and salt. Uh, are put in them to, uh, to improve the taste uh, of these products, uh, and that, of course, possibly has that deleterious uh, health impacts. You know, I note too that despite all the hype around plant-based proteins as well, they haven't exactly been to the taste of consumers. Uh, uh, the the much-hyped company Beyond Meat has suffered massive reductions in its uh, in its consumption and uh, huge losses of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Its stock is way down. Uh, indeed, uh, the, explaining these losses, um, their CEO of, of uh, Beyond Meat, Ethan Brown, commented that the industry's biggest—this is the plant-based uh, meat industry's—industry's biggest obstacles are taste, awareness uh, of health benefits, and price. Apart from that, it's great. <laughs> Doesn't taste very good. It's very expensive, um, and we're not really sure about the health benefits. But apart from that, they're fantastic. Why aren't people buying it? It's a mystery. That's a complete mystery. Um, and, 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 um, and then um, on, on top of that, we've also seen this very strange promotion of uh, the need to eat bugs. Uh, I don't know if people have been watching this. I thought it was a joke when it first came up. The first, uh, first, no, not those Order. bugs. Not, not, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Scott. Not Morton Bay or Belmain bugs. Uh, they're pretty tasty. But, <laughs> but, um, but uh, I thought it was a joke. It was in Beef Week uh, 2021. I was up there in Rocky enjoying lots of beef, as you do. Too much beef uh, in Beef Week. And, uh, and the CSIRO decided to choose that week to put out a report uh, on the exciting opportunities for Australians to eat more bugs. Uh, and as I said, I thought it was a bit of a joke uh, back then in early 2021. But um, I, see, I see now that uh, all sorts of people, Nicole Kidman and others, are all uh, promoting that we need to, to switch to eating, uh, eating bugs. And I hope if we got this inquiry up, we should definitely look at the bugs. Uh, look at uh, whether this is you know, something to do. I, myself, each to their own. If you want to eat bugs, go, go for your life. But as I say, I do think we should look at these health issues properly and scrutinise them. A recent report uh, from the Food and Agricultural Association, uh, sorry, organisation, I should say, of, of the United Nations, uh, you know, it found a number of particular health issues that could arise uh, from using insects, in particular, um, the, the pathogenic microbes of insects are considered. Uh, uh, potentially vectors uh, for, for viruses. Keep in mind that when you process an animal, one of the first things you do in a meat works is you take out their gut and intestines, because that's where um, uh, a lot of the microbes and potential uh, um, bad things that can do harm to humans could be, uh, could be. So you take all that out. You can't do that with insects, obviously. They're too small uh, to take out all of that intestinal uh, matter, and that's potentially where this bad stuff is. And, and so while other you know, cultures have used bugs at different times, there's a lot of risk here in just translating that into a mass sort of production that should be examined and investigated, and this inquiry uh, could potentially do that. But look, I, I return. I could go on for a long time uh, about these issues, uh, uh, um, that, um, and, and it would have been, I think, uh, quite useful uh, uh, for not only the Senate but, but the entire Australian community for myself and other senators to have that time in the Senate inquiry. Uh, to ask these legitimate questions and, and, uh, and, and uh, expose some of the issues that have been raised. But it would appear that, as I say, this uh, Green Labor cabal over there uh, are combining to uh, ensure that there's not proper scrutiny from this place on these issues. I don't exactly see why. As I say, I'm not uh, asking that other senators necessarily agree with all the concerns that Senator Roberts, myself or others have put on the table, but they are definitely ones that are legitimate matters uh, for investigation and inquiry. And it's very, very sad that the Senate tonight will most likely not do its job uh, to make those uh, appropriate investigations and inquiries. And instead, uh, we, will, we will be mere puppets uh, tonight of uh, uh, others that are presumably making these decisions on carpet that's not uh, red in other parts of this building. Senator Cadell. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, I was uh, going to take a lot more time to have a speech today, but I don't think I can beat my colleague Senator Canavan's it's good other than its price, taste and health benefits. So I'm going to focus on something else, and that is what uh, I think Senator Roberts said earlier about potential corporatisation of our food supply. 
There are many things this is called. It's called slaughter-free meat, clean meat, cultured meat, in vitro meat. There are many things it's called. One thing we know it is not, it is not meat. That happens in a lot of foods that are so unpopular that they piggyback on the, the uh, name and recognition and benefits of other. We've seen almond milk, cashew milk, soy milk, rice milk, um, nut juice basically is what that is, and they're out there selling that as other foods. And we have to get beyond that. But my fear, away from the health constraints, apart from the impact on an industry that is vibrant and good, and I note that Senator Canavan, North Queensland, probably uh, hit me when I say this, Rockhampton, second beef capital of Australia behind Casino in northern New South Wales. But um, what we want to see is, is what happens if these companies, if these labs, if these things hold IP? Do they put in patents? Do they hold the world to ransom because their IP works for protein in the future? We heard about the price complaints and the price drama with some of these things. As we allow governments to ramp up far the, the controls on farming on methane, we've heard these things come in. They put more constraints on how a farmer can do their work. They ramp up the price of meat and meat and meat to make this artificial protein more competitive. Do we then find a big, you know, we've got big farmer we talk about, we talk about these things. Do we find big agriculture, big, big lab food? I hold the patent to something that is, you know, I come across one of the things, I fix taste, and I hold that. Do I then hold the world to ransom because I hold that IP? Pretty sure no one holds IP to a cow or a chicken or a lamb or any of these things. I'm pretty sure they don't do the bugs too, but I don't want to eat those. So what happens if that happens? Who's looking at that? Forget the safety, forget all these other things. What about control of the, foods, of the world's protein supply if this goes wrong? And knowledge is a good thing. We're not asking to, I think Senator Roberts isn't asking to stop anything. For Senator Roberts, we've heard my colleagues in the National say, let's just ask some questions. Let's have a look. It may be good. I notice when we're talking about all the health things and we're talking about some concerns in other spaces, there is no longitudinal study about the health effects of protein meat, none. None in the world. There is a great longitudinal study on what real meat does to you. Since Fred Flintstone went through the burger or got a Brontosaurus burger, we have had from the beginning of mankind, we know what meat does to you. It makes you stronger, it feeds you, it gives you protein. That is a longitudinal study. We are the end result, probably me a bit more so than others, of eating meat and what happens there. But these are the things we could look at. There is never too much knowledge to make informed decisions. This is all we're asking. All we're looking to do is be able to shine a light on a somewhat murky field to look at these things of health, to look at these things of price, to look at these things of taste, to look at these things of commercialisation of world food supply. And Senator Roberts was right when he said the billionaires are behind this to price out the natural occurring foods, these sorts of things because they can't make a buck out of big, big agricultural holdings. There is too many small things. There are too many small countries that they can't make that money and get that around, where they're keeping their bu buffalo, where they're keeping their other meat sources. So it is with sadness that today we think we'll know what will happen. We'll probably vote tomorrow morning now that this will not get up. It is a shame that we can't explore all of these things. And who knows what we'd uncover? The right expert at the right time with the right question may just give us a shining light that all may be better. They may have some answers. They may not. We may be able to move legislation on what we learn that makes it safer for the Australian people. And woe behold that. Imagine us trying to make Australian people safer because we learn something. So, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I just think, probably as the last speaker tonight, we are at a sad point where something that goes to the cornerstone of Australian agriculture to every mum and dad who are feeding their kids some sort of food where we'll be in the future. There is great opportunity in artificial foods, in artificial proteins. It may be the future where we can feed people, but it is not meat. It is not milk when we look at these other things. And knowing more is a way we can path a way through to find the opportunities and separate them from the dangers. And it is sad this will not get up.
Thank you, Senator Cadell. There being no further uh, speakers, I will put the question noting that it is after 6.30 p.m. Uh, and the question is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. Uh, again, I note that it's after 6.30, but ask whether uh, a division will be required tomorrow. Is, will a division be required? Um, so, oh, thank you, uh, thank you. So, I believe the eyes have it. The, is a division required tomorrow? A division is required and will be conducted tomorrow. Uh, I now call the clerk. A couple of business order of the day number one. Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Hume. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, as we move forward, we have to remain vigilant and resolute in our defence of Australia's foundational principles and resist any attempt to undermine our constitution, particularly in today's environment of fake news and foreign interference. Australians are very wisely, naturally cautious in making uh, amendments to our constitution, and it is only fair to the people that we serve in this place that we ensure that they have all of the facts available that they can trust to make their judgment about whether they support uh, the upcoming referendum, so they can make a fully informed decision. Now, in this age of disinformation, it is important that the government takes the lead and provides clear information to Australians and a robust referendum process. The opposition has raised three points with the government to address our concerns on the referendum process. The first is to restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. And again, while the government may have indicated support for that, the devil will certainly be in the detail. Secondly, to establish the official yes and no campaign organisations. And thirdly, to appropriately fund both of these official organisations to ensure that it is a fair uh, and, and a process that has integrity within it. Now, these measures are fundamental to having a referendum with informed voters and, as I said, a process that is transparent and clearly a process that voters can trust because it has integrity. And it's fair to say that this change to the bill, to the legislation in this bill, will actually have profound implications not just for this next referendum but also for those subsequently. So while, as I said, we welcome the government's announcement that they will restore the pamphlet, we have to now see the detail of what that will actually mean uh, for the change of the legislation. On our side of, uh, on our side of the chamber, we cannot support and we will not support a bill that does not have a plan for how to properly regulate donations, how to properly regulate foreign interference, the very real threat of foreign interference, or one that doesn't provide a plan for how the scrutiny of the referendum itself will be conducted. All of this, all of this could be resolved by the establishment of appropriately and equally funded official yes and no campaign organisations. Now, we welcome the engagement from government on this bill, but as we said, we still have concerns. And why do we have concerns? Well, let's have a look at what uh, this bill is designed to do. This bill will determine the settings for how the referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament is conducted. However, the coalition should be of no doubt that the changes included in this bill could also be used for future referendum. The bill, makes, the bill does, and we do acknowledge this, the bill does make a number of non-controversial changes to the Act to bring the operation of referenda into line with the Commonwealth Electoral Act, which hasn't been done, I believe, for nearly 20 years. And it is out of date and it out of step with the Electoral Act. However, 
There are three key concerns and three issues that remain for us on this side of the chamber. The bill as it stands removes the requirement to provide all households with a pamphlet outlining both the yes and the no case for changes to our constitution. The bill does not make provision for official yes and no campaign organisations, and the bill does not outline any official funding for these campaigns. Now, these positions have been advocated consistently by those on this side of the chamber to the government, because while the government is desperate to get this referenda through, um, they keep mismanaging it, and the prospect of that, due to their own um, mistakes and fumbles in this area, is making them more desperate to get this through. But by stacking the deck, as the government is proposing to do in this bill, I believe it will make not only will it corrupt the process, but it will actually make it less likely for this to go through if the majority of Australians and, and, and all voters don't have access to the information that they can trust and that they can make an assessment of both the yes and the no case to cast their vote. Now, people listening might be wondering why we're advocating for the retention of a pamphlet. On the face of it, it seems like it might be a little outdated, you know, a, a, a written pamphlet in the age of modern media. But this sets a very, very dangerous precedent, <coughs> and there is no precedent at all in nearly 100 years for deliberately not providing a pamphlet. So this, in terms of precedent, this is the first time since, since before Farlap uh, won the Melbourne Cup the first time that there will not have been a pamphlet. The requirement for a pamphlet was instituted for a very good reason in 1912. There have been three referenda in 1919, 1926 and 1928 that there wasn't a pamphlet, but that was for very good reasons at the time. In 1919, there was um, literally insufficient time to produce the pamphlet. In 1926, there was no agreement on how to produce, how to produce the yes argument itself. And in 1928, there was overwhelming agreement between parties and governance, and it wasn't uh, thought necessary. But for those three exceptions, None of the circumstances apply here today. We know there's not complete agreement on the issue itself. We have the time to prepare the pamphlet and we can get agreement on how to argue the cases. In 1967 and 1977, only yes pamphlets were provided to the electorate, which again we think is, is wrong. We need to put to the people of Australia the arguments for both the yes case and the no case, and people can then be in a position to make up their own minds. Now, why the pamphlet? Well, we know that people still use uh, and still regard written material, and particularly when that material comes from the government as official material, people still trust it. We've heard from the AEC that when they provided material to electors, in our federal elections, 40% 40 40 of recipients will use this documentation as the main source of information in how to cast their vote. But we also know that electoral events are increasingly influenced by misinformation and from social media, al social media algorithms that provide that sort of echo chamber of thought and ideas uh, into voters' minds, whereas this would be official material that people can trust. Additionally, the ACCC has published data that has uh, reported that 92 per cent of respondents to the ACCC's news survey had some concerns about the quality of news and also of the journalism that they were consuming, and that the analysis has identified concerning uh, consumer and competition harms across a wide range of digital platform services which are widespread, entrenched and systematic. <clears throat> so if you think about that, it is even more important today that we provide, we support and we fund material that people can trust, 
when you have 92 per cent of respondents in the latest ACCC news survey having some concerns about the quality and the veracity of the information they receive uh, on my, in online platforms. So why are we advocating for an official yes and no campaign? We're doing that simply because it will clearly it will clearly increase the trust and integrity of the Australian voters in the process itself, uh, which is absolutely critically important. Having an official yes and no campaign will make things simpler for the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of the referendum itself. The AEC has given evidence to the parliamentary, uh, to the parliamentary committee, JSCEM, that the donations and disclosure regimes remain the most complex part of the Electoral Act. We will be applying that regime in this referendum and, the, and to the participants who are not regularly involved in elections. And an official campaign structure is going to be the best way for our regulators to ensure that the appropriate education and enforcement of the electoral laws are in place for the referendum. Now, we know that there will be a significant number of participants and organisations in this referendum who will not be associated with political parties and or do not have regular events in the electorate. And that is, that is okay, and that is what we would expect in a functioning democracy. But having a single point of coordination to provide education and to commence any audit processes for donations or for foreign interference is the best way to ensure the integrity of the referendum from uh, misinformation and from foreign interference. Uh, as a Senate, we've already heard from officials that there might be people who will fall under donations legislation and other electoral laws who don't know about it because they are not regular uh, political don donors. And the AEC has said the education of participants will be significant given that these events happen so rarely and that they aren't the usual political parties that they will be regulating. They have even acknowledged that political parties who, who do this process all the time or sometimes struggle to get it right. So, on the final point, why are we asking for equal funding? On this side of the chamber, we're seeking an assurance that once these bodies are established and there is a guarantee of equal funding for both cases, if it is provided, uh, that it is provided to each side to ensure that neither side is advantaged or disadvantaged. <coughs> and to ensure that they can comply with the disclosure and regulatory regimes at the referendum. In short, it is a big thing for Australians Senator to consider Reynolds, changing our constitution and the Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I rise tonight to speak on the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, because it is a very significant day in our history uh, when we seek to ask the Australian public um, to make a decision about changing the founding document of our country, and that is our constitution. But when it comes to constitutional matters, I know those on this side of the chamber take that issue very, very seriously. We need to make sure that the approach that we take when we seek to change our constitution is principled, it is underpinned by sound reasoning, uh, it is consistent and it is fair. Um, and I am particularly concerned, as I stand here today to talk about this particular bill, <clears throat> that we are really being asked to change the machinery that sits behind the establishment of a referendum in such a way as never been done before in this country and, in my opinion, seeks to make it an unbalanced uh, activity. Uh, when we're putting this really, really important question to the people of Australia. Because, as I said, um, the principles that underpin our democracy are the very reason why we stand in this chamber. The principles that under underpin democracy are the very reason why our parliament and the Westminster system uh, is the most important in the world. Um, and I believe, as I know many of my colleagues on this side of the chamber believe, that the, the sovereign will of the Australian people is something that we must treat with the greatest amount of respect. So changing the document by which our country lives is one of the most serious things that we will ever be asked to do in this place. 
It's not something that we should be taking lightly, and it's not something that we should be using for our own political purposes. So, <clears throat> in standing here today, <clears throat> um, I raise concerns, as I'm sure um, just about all of my colleagues on this side, when they've made a contribution to this particular bill, have, have raised. And that is the responsibility of a government to make sure that they take a lead and provide clear, consistent, unbiased information to the Australian public to make sure that the strength of our referendum process is not compromised by political interference. There are three main issues that we came to the table with and said to the government that we believe were extremely important for the maintenance of the integrity of the referendum process. The first one was in relation to providing a pamphlet to the Australian public <clears throat> that outlined the arguments that sat behind the case for a yes and the case for a no. And in doing so, and understanding the, the broad scope of, of Australia, uh, the many multicultural um, communities that exist in Australia, to make sure that that particular pamphlet was provided in writing to every household in Australia in appropriate format for that household and the people that live in it to understand what these two particular arguments in relation to this proposed change of the Constitution actually meant. Um, we were obviously delighted um, when the government has agreed uh, that it will restore the pamphlet, because the original bill that went through the other place actually sought to have that pamphlet removed. It sought to deny the Australian population the opportunity to have provided to them in an independent and unbiased way um, an assessment of both of the campaigns as to why they were proposing either the yes or the no case. So whilst um, the, uh, the, the amendments that I believe that are being brought into this place by the government into this chamber to amend this bill to enable a yes and no pamphlet, obviously we'd be very keen um, to see where the government finally lands in relation to that pamphlet. because. It is absolutely underpins that hugely important component of the integrity of a referendum, and that is providing Australians with fair, unfettered, unbiased information about what the government is asking them to do. Um, the idea that a government would seek for our founding document, our constitution, to be changed without providing them with the information about what that particular change was going to do um, I think completely undermines the integrity of the process um, of a referendum. <clears throat> the second issue that we are asking the government, and we think is entirely reasonable, um, is to establish an, a yes and no campaign. This bill does not, in its uh, current form, provide for a yes and no campaign organisations um, to be established. Um, this is a, is a really dangerous um, precedent because we know that um, the campaigns themselves provide us with the vehicle through which we can ensure the integrity of the process. <clears throat> uh, it will make things very simple for the, for the regulation um, of the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of the actual um, referendum. You know, we know when it comes to, to issues such as um, uh, foreign interference that that very vehicle, the yes and no ca um, campaign organisations, will provide a vehicle through which we can test, assess uh, and regulate uh, and make sure that things like foreign interference are not occurring. In the absence of that, there really is no mechanism by which the Australian government can assure itself that though that sort of interference is not occurring. I mean, the Director General of ASIO only two weeks ago again told the Australian, told Australians that are we seeing the greatest level of foreign interference that we have ever seen in the history of this country. Uh, and we know um, that foreign interference is something that is continuing um, to, uh, to grow around the world. So to enable us to be able to put full confidence in the integrity of the process and the lack of foreign interference in this really important decision that we're asking the Australian public to go and, and to, to vote on, um, we would think that the provision of a yes and no organisation through which we can monitor donations, foreign interference, um, you know, just as simple as, as, as finding um, a, an organisation through which we can determine how scrutineers will be able to be made available um, on the night of the counting of the ballots. <clears throat> it seems to me like this is a very simple and fundamental mechanism through which we could 
um, make sure that this, the ease and the simplicity and the streamlining of the delivery of this referendum could, could be assured. But for some reason, those opposite the government um, are denying uh, Australians the opportunity to have uh, that particular provision. Uh, and the third um, matter that we are particularly concerned about um, is the, the fact that um, there is no funding made available for these independent yes and no organisations that will be the vehicle through which we would be able to operate the integrity of this, this particular referendum. So in the absence of any yes and no organisation and therefore in the absence of any funding to that yes and no organisation, um, you know, we are left with a, a half-baked uh, act or a half-baked um, um, uh, bill here that seeks to provide a half-baked act that does not afford the greatest amount of support and integrity to this system. So, as I said in my, my original remarks, I mean, the integrity of the referendum is based on the information that is received by the voters. Um, and the consistency with precedent is something that also should give voters great confidence that this government is taking this really, really seriously and is not using this mechanism um, through which to actually deliver a, a political um, uh, argument. Um, because the reality is this government does have a bit of a track record um, so far of ticking and flicking uh, election promises without any great regard about appropriate process. Um, or the integrity through which um, they seek to deliver it. Uh, so um, it is really disappointing as we stand here today after having had months of, of discussion and negotiation and uh, the putting forward of an extraordinary amount of very good arguments about how um, the, the trust the Australian public can continue to have in the integrity of referendum in Australia going forward. Um, can be maintained. We sit here with a bill that clearly um, is seeking to politicise an opportunity because of the numbers that they have in the other place and, um, sadly, obviously taking advantage of the numbers that, that they have here. So um, I would call on the government to, to really seriously think um, about making sure that you are honest with the Australian public don't stand here with a referendum before us whilst you are basically leaning on one side of the scales uh, and trying to influence the decision um, of the Australian public when I think that if you're going to ask the Australian public to change our, uh, our constitution, you should be allowing them to do it in an environment that is completely open without caveat uh, and is provided um, to the Australian public uh, without political <coughs> influence. I know that tonight um, and in the following day that there will be a number of amendments that are put forward by a wide range of different parties in this chamber. The Labor Party, the Greens, many of the crossbench and, of course, um, the, the coalition will also be putting amendments forward uh, in an attempt to see if we can make sure that this bill um, is actually going to deliver the kind of in an integral process that we believe is essential to ensure that the Australian public are given a fair and reasonable opportunity to be able to make a change to their constitution. Um, but you know, the problem that I have is the track record of this government so far since they have been in government over the last nine months has been a government that has been pretty quick to backflip. Uh, they often don't think through um, very easily, very well <clears throat> the policy positions that they put forward. We saw a lot of headline rhetoric when we came into the election, and now we're seeing ticking and flicking of those particular election commitments without any real regard of the consequences that sit behind it um, and the flow and effects of those decisions. <clears throat> we, know, we know that many of the promises haven't been kept. We've seen broken promise after broken promise after broken promise. And most often these promises have been broken because this government has not bothered to do the hard work to put in place the things that need to sit behind those headline promises to make sure that they're deliverable. You know, today we talked about the 24-7 nurses in aged care. Um, not deliverable because the minister forgot to actually go out there and speak to the industry and realise that the workforce that was needed to deliver her election commitment just didn't exist. <clears throat> um, you know, we made promises, um, promises made about superannuation and franking credits. You know, they weren't going to be touched, but somehow now they are. And of course, you know, the promises that your power bills were going to go down, and all we've seen is them go up. 
So to come in here <clears throat> as a government and say, it's OK, we're not going to give you all of those protection mechanisms that are normally afforded to referendum in the past. We're not going to give you those. <clears throat> we just want you to trust us. Trust us. <clears throat> Excuse me. The trust is that it'll all be fine. The track record so far shows that I wouldn't really be trusting this government. And that's why, as the opposition, we're saying to the government, if you want the Australian public to absolutely trust you, put out there transparently the things that you're prepared to do to make sure that the integrity of this referendum is assured and this is the bill through which you are able to do it. Come forward and support the people's right to vote but support the people's right to a fair vote and support the people's right to have the information that they need in the method and the mechanism that is most able to be understood by them so that when they turn up into the polling booth they have full information to make the decision. Because I've got to say the most disappointing thing would be for this bill to fail, for this referendum to fail, um, because Australians think the mechanism is either unfair or biased. It would be a significant failure um, of this place if it was actually the political interference in the process that was the reason why this particular bill did not get passed and the referendum ultimately didn't get up. So I'll, um, I'll reserve my right, um, as, uh, as others have before me, to see what this final bill looks like after the amendments have been put to the chamber uh, before I make a decision about how I intend to vote on it, because, of course, there is much, much that could change over the coming hours with the amendments that are before us. But, as I said, I absolutely support the right of Australians to vote on important issues. I support the right for Australians to have their say on this particular issue. Um, but I also support their right to have fair and unbiased information on which to base their decision when they can't go to the polls to vote on this referendum. Um, I am absolutely um, a supporter of the appropriate um, institution and the appropriate mechanisms that this institution, the Parliament of Australia, has held proud since its federation. And I think that what we have before us today, what we are likely to see in the coming months, what we've seen from the behaviour of this government in previous days, is a government that's prepared to trash the convention that has held this place in such high esteem for so long in an attempt to try and tick a flick an election commitment that um, they are now um, prepared to provide um, a lopsided, one-sided approach to this. So um, I hope the government will listen to the concerns that have been put forward, some very valid concerns and contributions that have been made uh, in the second reading debate on this particular bill. And I ask them, for the sake of the integrity of this place, for the sake of the integrity of our referendum process, please make sure that you provide a fair and balanced approach to this referendum. Thank you, Senator. Um, Ruslan, Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Until 7.30, sorry, Senator MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Constitution is the guiding document of the nation, and referenda to alter that document are among the most important discussions that we can have. It is the document that has seen Australia develop as the stable and functional society that we enjoy. And it is therefore critical that the government of the day provides comprehensive information to support both the yes and no case, to allow all Australians to make an informed decision. Now, more than a quarter of all Australians were born overseas and almost half have a parent who was born overseas. So the production of this material in other languages is paramount to allow those for whom English is not their first language to make the same informed decision as others. And if Labor is serious about a multicultural society, this should be a priority. In fact, today is Harmony Day, and we heard earlier from a minister about how important a multicultural society was to this government, but yet the very demonstration of how that uh, should happen has been called into question by their decision not to provide uh, a multilingual uh, pamphlet with the yes and no case outlined. So a neutral civic program, the, pro the fat pamphlets, allow Australians to consider their decision in an informed and a deliberate manner away from the din of public debate. And I think this is critical because this is a serious decision. 
and despite the commentary from the Prime Minister around Australians being generous and Australians should do this, it's not fair to expect Australians to make a decision of such import to change our constitution without doing the work that is required. And I've been reflecting on Senator Rustin's comments about the failure of this referendum will be sheeted home to how well this government has provided the clarity and transparency of decision to, uh, to make a decision. That is why this is so important. So the coalition raised three major concerns with the draft bill. We wanted to restore uh, the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. We wanted to establish official yes and no campaign organisations and we thought it was appropriate that they be funded. There be appropriate funding for these official organisations. Uh, so I acknowledge the, uh, the government's announcement that there will be both cases published on the pamphlet, but of course we have not yet seen that amendment to, to understand exactly what they do intend to do. But it is fundamental. It is fundamental to our society, to good, balanced decision making for Australians, that we have informed voters, we have good process, and we have consistent process aligned with the precedent of previous referenda. So this pamphlet is vital to the consistency uh, of referenda. And as I said, we welcome the government signals, but we do need to wait for a final final amendment words. I'm also concerned about there being no plan to regulate donations, to provide security and to promote a fair platform. This is a subject uh, which is a matter of much discussion around the world about foreign intervention into critical uh, decisions of national importance. And so it is important that this government also regulate donations and provide transparency about who is influencing uh, the decisions that Australians make. Because if we were to have no pamphlet, this would be the first time since 1928. That is a dangerous precedent. A pamphlet has been required since 1912. We have had three referenda where there hasn't been a pamphlet, 1919, 1926 and 1928, for three very good reasons. In 1919, there was insufficient time to produce Sorry, a Senator pamphlet. Donald, it being 7.30, I propose the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Askew. Thank you, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Australia is often described as a multicultural country. We have, for many years, relied on skilled migration to support our growing economy, and this chamber has debated those benefits on many occasions. As a nation, we have relied on skilled migrants to help build and expand this country, from the post-war ten-pound palms through to the thousands of workers from over 30 nationalities working on the original Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme in the 50s and the 60s. Australia has been fortunate to benefit from the migration. As an island, Australia is the ultimate migrant destination. Outside of those of First Nations descent, it could be argued that every Australian at some point in their family tree is a migrant from a diverse range of countries and cultures. Migration is what has supported our economy for decades and skilled migrants have helped to stimulate our economy through recessions and the fiscal challenges of most governments in this place. Migration is like moving out of the family home but on a much larger scale. Do you remember what, what it was like to move out of home? Were you nervous or maybe excited? Perhaps I suspect a little of both. Now imagine if the place you were moving to had an economic and social system that was not one you were familiar with, a place that didn't often fully understand or recognise your social customs, or even a place where you struggled to understand or speak the language. While I acknowledge that this is the experience of many thousands of people every year and that many of them navigate it with resilience and grace, it's equally important to note that taking that leap can be destabilising which is why it's crucial to have services in place like those provided by the Migrant Resource Centre of Northern Tasmania. The Launceston-based not-for-profit Migrant Resource Centre recently celebrated 40 years of service. That is four decades of support for Launceston and the region's expansive migrant community from all over the world to Tasmania. 
It provides welcoming and non-judgmental support for migrants, including services such as the NDIS support and settling and social experiences. The organisation is led by CEO Ella Dixon, who has lived experience as a migrant herself, experience that has been crucial for the role. Ella was born in the Philippines and moved to Australia with her family in 1981 when she was a young girl. Ella says the overarching goal of the organisation is to facilitate independence, but what they provide is so much more. They provide a non-judgmental support for migrants which allow them to succeed, find employment and contribute to Tasmania, Tasmania's social fabric. Ella describes it best when she says they do a raft of things to increase people's cap capacity to participate in life. And while that might seem simple to some, it's the Launceston Migrant Resource Centre and Ella Dixon's capacity for kindness that drives this organisation, because sadly, migrants often bear the brunt of racism and antisocial behaviour. But having a support network like the Launceston Migrant Resource Centre means migrants do not feel alone when they arrive in Tasmania and it means they have someone to fall back on when they are navigating things such as finding employment or finding social networks or even traversing government systems like the NDIS. Launceston migrant, Launceston's Migrant Resource Centre assists around 500 clients every year. Clients have come from countries such as Bhutan, Nepal, Afghanistan, Sudan, Eritrea, Burma, Sierra Leone, Iran and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Migration is good for regional economies like those of Tasmania. Skilled migrants help address skill shortages and by relocating they stimulate the local economy and support small businesses. As we are all aware, there are great benefits in increasing the number of skilled migrants coming to Australia. It is one of the main themes to emerge when discussing the current jobs and skill shortage crisis that we face. Helping migrants navigate the cultural and social challenges of moving to a foreign country helps make their relocation so much easier. And I'm in no doubt the Migrant Resource Centre has been responsible for fostering healthy migrant populations in Tasmania and ensuring they have the capacity to succeed. I'm extremely grateful for the work the Migrant Resource Centre does. And so tonight, during Harmony Week, I want to formally thank everyone associated with the centre for their hard work and the worthy goals they pursue in assisting migrants to gain independence and settle into their new communities in Tasmania. Many are volunteers and they do it for the love of the job. So thank you very much to Ella and your team and I look forward to many more years of success of the Migrant Resource Centre. Thank you, Senator Askew. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting <clears throat> Deputy President. I recently had the honour and privilege of meeting a group of young Tamil refugees who have experienced the horrors of genocide in Sri Lanka, which continues to this day. I wish to read a statement that was written by a Tamil refugee to highlight their experience of this genocide, as well as the ongoing violence suffered as a result of our immigration system, which is full of torture. This is his statement. I am 33 years old, but only when I was 10, my father was killed. He was simply a fisherman and was contrib contributing for the Elam Tamils in our homeland. In 2009, in Mali Vekal, our homeland, the so-called no fire zone, a zone the Sri Lankan government said was specifically made to not kill us. But the Sri Lankan government made all of us go to that area and continuously bombed, raped and massacred, massacred us till half of us were killed just for being Elam Tamil. I am a witness to this. I was there and bombs were dropped only metres away. People were shot in front of me while they were still in their bunkers. It has been 10 years since I came to Australia, full of hope that I would have a permanent and safe home. But whilst I am on a temporary protection visa 
and the announcement about permanent visas has been made. Many of my friends are waiting. My friends are not sure and their mental health has decreased. We are worried as some have been admitted to the hospital with suicidal thoughts. We were forced out of our own homeland and came to a land where we have contributed to Australian society. Some have opened new businesses to help others. Only last year in November, my friend died due to suicide with still an uncertainty of his future. We all want to have permanency. It has been more than six months since Labor has come into power. We were all so hopeful. <laughs> what a joke. But now here we are again, slowly losing hope. People on bridging visas are unable to marry, have a permanent job, start a business, or even buy a house with our visas. We are scared we will be sent back and knowing that we will be detained and most prob probably continuously harassed. Our own homeland is being taken away and we have nothing to go back to. We want to live with our families in Australia and bring them to safety. We all deserve peace in Australia and an acknowledgement of the ongoing genocide in our homeland, Tamil Elam. There's so much more to say, but due to time constraints, I have shortened my story. Thank you for listening to my story. But this is a story of thousands of refugees who are currently either outside protesting or in Australia waiting for hope. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I call Senator Antic. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. The previous four ABS provisional mortality statistics data releases reveal that 15.1%, 16%, 17% and 17.3% increases in excess deaths above the baseline average. Now, Clearly something serious, I would say catastrophic, is occurring in Australia and in other parts of the world. Yet strangely, the censorship industrial complex, namely the mainstream media and the health departments in this country, are almost entirely unconcerned about investigating this dramatic increase in excess deaths and why they may be taking place. An ABS, ABS data release dated 31 March 2021, dealing with data throughout 2020. The first year of the pandemic reads as follows, and I quote, 141,116 doctor certified deaths occurred between 1 January 2020 and 31 December 2020 and were registered by 28 February 2021. This equates to an average of 385.6 deaths per day, which is in line with the baseline average of 385.8. Basically, mortality rates didn't significantly rise in 2020, but drastically rose throughout 2022 after most of the population were injected with an mRNA shot for COVID. To put it another way, Australia had 141,116 recorded deaths in 2020 and 174,717 in 2022, an increase of 33,601 deaths over the baseline average. Now, I recall a lot of noise from the media and health departments in 2020 about every single COVID case and the associated deaths in the entire country. So I'm curious as to why the censorship industrial complex are so disinterested in the number of excess deaths that we're currently seeing post-vaccine rollout. One would have thought that this would be a great cause for alarm. Now, COVID-19 is associated with 8,824 deaths from January through to November of 2022, which, of course, doesn't necessarily mean in each case people died from it, but in some instances died with it, meaning another 14,062 of the excess deaths are not associated with the virus. Now, what could possibly be driving this increase that isn't COVID that was around that time in 2020? 
This trend, of course, is not isolated to Australia. Last year, the Scottish Parliament announced an inquiry into excess deaths in Scotland since the start of the pandemic, citing an 11 per cent increase in excess deaths. Many European countries have also seen dramatic increases from the start of 2020 that simply cannot be dismissed as long COVID. Eurostat, the official statistical office of the European Union, recently published an article which read, excess mortality in the EU in December 2022 soared to 19 per cent up of the average number of deaths for the same period in 2016 to 2019, the highest recorded value in 2022. According to Eurostat, Germany saw a 37.3 per cent increase in deaths compared with their 2016 to 2019 average. For France, 24.5 per cent, the Netherlands 22.7 and Ireland 25.4 per cent. Again, the censorship industrial complex and the health departments seem largely unperturbed by what to me looks like a global catastrophe. Over in the US, the CDC's data reveals 300,000 excess deaths above the baseline average, which were not actually attributable to COVID-19. Now, given the hysteria and fear propaganda we experienced two to three years ago, surely such incredibly high excess deaths across the world would spark some interest. Is it due to long COVID? Is it due to climate change? Or maybe it's systemic racism and white supremacy? Who knows? But if there were some way of determining a common factor between all of these deaths, like, for example, if they'd received a particular medical treatment, for, for example, that would provide some clarity as to what's causing this phenomenon and perhaps help us save some lives. Well, of course, there is a way of determining, getting to the bottom of what's happening. It's just that your health bureaucrats, politicians and your blinkered corporate media handmaiden journalists, they don't want you to know. Thank you, Senator Antic. I call Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You know, bureaucrats are costing investment in Tasmania and Tasmanian jobs, all because they keep changing the goalposts. There are some projects in Tassie that have been gathering dust on the desks of state and federal ministers for five years, five years since they submitted their paperwork and they still can't get any developments approved. Some of them do get an approval, though. And just while they're popping the champagne, along comes a new email with a new condition, a new hoop to jump through. So they drop everything, go back to the bureaucrats, blow out the timeline, and the project keeps grinding its gears. Businesses are getting to the end of a marathon, and the finish line is in sight. But just when they're about to break that ribbon, it gets yanked back another few hundred metres. They're always told, it's with the minister, or it's with the department. And that's where it stays, in that black hole of bureaucracy. I'm not saying companies shouldn't have to go through the checks and balances for these major projects. Of course they should. We have guidelines in place for a reason. But they're decision guidelines, because at some point you're supposed to make a decision. Now I'm not naive. Things don't move quickly in political circles. But some projects are over five years in, have spent millions of dollars and still haven't turned a sod of dirt. This red tape is holding up projects for years. It's costing us hundreds of potential jobs. Take the proposed tailings dam at MMG. You talk to the locals in Rosebury and they're all for it. They know the town needs the mine. They're one and the same. You can't have one without the other. And every time I go to visit, it seems like another shop is closed down. The mines has hundreds of employees, most of whom drive in and out every week for work. And without the mine, the place will be a ghost town. And if a decision on the project isn't made by the state and federal governments soon, the decision will be made for them, because it'll be too late. MMG says the mine and the 500 jobs with it will not survive beyond 2024 without this new tailing storage solution. But they haven't got a decision, and crunch time is closing in. Jackie and I can't get a straight answer about who is exactly holding up the process. The state government says it's the feds. The federal government says it's the state. And it's the same with Robins Island wind farm down Circular Headway. ACEN Renewables spent more than four years working with the Environment Protection Agency. They worked to try and make sure the project could still go ahead without hurting the environment. Out of the blue, they've been hit with a condition that says they have to shut down for five months of the year. Find me any business, any industry that can shut down for five months of the year and not operate at a loss. 
That's ridiculous. It's like a business getting approved to operate so long as it agrees to go bankrupt. The project is currently going through an appeals process about this five-month condition. That's more time, more delays. They won't wait forever. They can't. But if we lose them, we'd be losing up to 400 construction jobs and 65 ongoing jobs. I've spoken to three world-class businesses who want to bring work to Tasmania. These are large projects with hundreds of jobs attached and a lot of money behind them. They want to be here and we need them, but they're worried. They've seen what's happened with other projects. They don't want to get years in and have nothing to show for it. They need to get moving now. These businesses are really questioning if it's worth their time and money to build in Tassie. We need to find a way to cut the red tape, to stop the moving goalposts, to stop adding track to the end of the marathon. No business can afford to spend five years and millions of dollars trying to get a project up. And even if they do, they risk getting approved with conditions that make it impossible to operate anyway. Who would invest in Tasmania if we've got bureaucrats doing everything they can to make the process as painful as possible. We aren't the only state that needs investment, but we're just the only state that makes it impossible to invest here. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. I call Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Earlier this month, a motion in the House of Representatives included an acknowledgement of the rise in anti-Semitic incidents in Australia of more than 40 per cent since 2020. It also acknowledged the work that the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance does to promote Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. The need to reaffirm the House's commitment to the great work of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working de definition of anti-Semitism and the compelling justifications behind this working definition. Reviewing that discussion in the other place, this significant rise in anti-Semitic behaviour and the important advances that have been made in defining anti-Semitism causes me tonight to stand up in the Senate and add my support to that motion supported in the House of Representatives. In doing so, I indicate my support for that motion, as well as the importance of highlighting the work that the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance does to promote education about the Holocaust and counter anti-Semitism. The 40 per cent figure I referred to early, earlier, actually 41.9 per cent, almost 42 per cent, was reported by the Executive Council of Australian Jury, who utilised the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism to record the trend. The SBS recently published an article detailing some of the specific instances of anti-Jewish bigotry and listed everything from vandalism to assault. The article reported cases like Orthodox Jewish men in Melbourne being verbally abused and physically assaulted with their religious garments forcibly removed. That happens in Australia. In another instance, a Jewish man in Sydney's Bondi was told he did not belong in the area before having his hat taken from his head and thrown to the ground. That happens in Australia. And in the 2022 federal election, we witnessed appalling vandalism and advertisements of Jewish candidates from both major parties. These problems sadly extend also to our university campuses. As the member for Barawa noted in the other place a few weeks ago, Universities are becoming the epicentre of the rise in anti-Jewish sentiment, even in Australia. There are instances where extremist groups of the left and right join, to force, join forces to attack Israel and Jewish people more generally. In accordance with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition on anti-Semitism, Hostility towards the legitimacy of Israel and the right of the Jewish people to statehood is ultimately an act of anti-Semitic hate. It can be too easy to focus only on the numbers and statistics on issues and matters like these, so we must ensure we recognise that it is a shocking reality. It is the only way we can hope to understand the deeply personal affront it is, is, it is to the dignity of the Jewish community and, by extension, the dignity to our own country. Take a moment to consider some of the elements of our own identity that shapes us, our religious views, our cultural heritage, 
our personal beliefs. The idea of being targeted, silenced or assailed for any of these values and traits is contrary to the Australian spirit. Our identity as a nation is one of acceptance, as a country built on the work of migrants from all over the world. Belonging in Australia is not about where you come from, but rather who you are. One of the contributors to this rising anti-Semitism is a lack of education. Last year, Deakin University found that 24 per cent of Australians over the age of 18 have little to no knowledge of the Holocaust. Only half could correctly identify the number of Jews murdered during the Holocaust. It is why the work of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance is so critical in this endeavour. Through providing educational resources, policy advice and intergovernmental cooperation, it helps to better inform our community. And in order to take the problem meaningfully, we must first define it. And the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance has built this definition as a means of, as a means of specifying what anti-Semitism continues so, to be so that we can do more to identify it and prevent it in our own communities and suburbs. The mission of remembering the Holocaust and doing all we can to counter the very discrimination that led to some of the darkest moments of our humanity remains essential. Each year it becomes more important as the number of survivors of the Holocaust dwindles. When the last survivor passes on, the responsibility falls to all of us to ensure that their story is not forgotten. Thank you, Senator Smith. And I call Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Before I start on my contribution, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Smith in that regard. And indeed, I think it is a great thing that this country, um, with the support of both governing parties, has adopted the definition of anti-Semitism uh, set out by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And I think that is a very, very positive thing, and uh, uh, we should be proud of that unity. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm going to speak ab about a place in Queensland called Ipswich. And as I was thinking about this and about to get up in my, uh, my remarks, and I was hoping to grab your attention too, Senator Watt, um, I was thinking there's some similarities in terms of the infrastructure requirements of Ipswich as there is in the central coast of New South Wales. You've got a, a large population um, who needs to travel quite often to the central business district or to, in your case, Sydney. I should say in your case as the previous member for Robertson. Um, and then uh, in the case of Ipswich, you've got a big population, a growing population that needs to travel to the uh, capital of Queensland, namely Brisbane. So um, I'm pleased you're in the, uh, in the chair to uh, hear my remarks in this respect. I'm also pleased Senator Watts here um, to uh, hear my rem remarks. And I'm always pleased Senator Ciccone's here. I mean, it's just a pleasure to have him around. <laughs> so it's, um, it's been a great thing that today, that today, and I know they had, um, they had some meeting with the minister's office, that there was a delegation from the great uh, city of Ipswich that came to Canberra to uh, make some representations to both sides of politics in relation to, amongst other things, Ipswich to Springfield Central Public Transport Corridor. And I'd first like to acknowledge the members of the delegation, namely the Deputy Mayor of Ipswich City Council, Jacob Madsen, Councillor Sheila Ireland, Mr Dan Heenan from the, uh, from the Public Administration of Ipswich City Council, a representative Sekasui House, Mr Taku Hashimoto, and Sekasui House is the developer of one of Queensland's fastest growing suburbs called Ripley. And lastly, uh, oh, actually, two more representatives, representative of Multicultural Australia, Ms Christine Castley, and I should note Ipswich has a very, very large multicultural community and the president of the Ipswich Show Society, Mr Darren Zarnow, who has just done a tremendous job as president of that show society. So congratulations to the delegation, uh, and I'm sure their representations to other members of this place in the lower house was as persuasive as the representations that they made to me. But their representations fell on fertile ground when it came to, uh, when it came to this senator, uh, and in particular, their representations with respect to the necessity for the Ipswich to Springfield Central Public Transport Corridor. And I was very, very pleased that prior to the last federal election, both the previous government, uh, through its decision uh, and input into the South East Queensland City deal, and the opposition, the then opposition and now government, supported 
$10 million being allocated for studies for the Ipswich to Springfield Central Public Transport Corridor. And I just want to outline why this is such an important piece of infrastructure and why this needs to be built as quickly as possible. And as I said, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sure you will, you will uh, you, you'll be able to draw analogies with your area on central New South Wales coast. Well, now your area is the whole of New South Wales, of course. Uh, so in the strategy paper in 2020, which was released in relation to this uh, proposal, and I just want to quote from it, connectivity and transport inequality is creating disadvantage across Ipswich. Ipswich is currently serviced by two heavy rail lines and several suburban bus lines. The rail lines are not connected, and only one of the bus services provided in Ipswich is high frequency. The existing public transport provision in the Ipswich local government area is not servicing the region efficiently, with close to 40 per cent of residents dissatisfied with the available public transport services. So what does this mean in practice? And when you consider the arithmetic in this regard, it is quite profound. In the strategy paper, and I quote, uh, $1.4 billion per annum congestion problem. That's what's quoted in relation to this congestion problem. The impact of not delivering critical new transport infrastructure is demonstrated in the cost of the problem analysis. It found that the estimated cost of total congestion in the study area would be $466 million per year in 2026, rising to $1.4 billion per year in 2036. So just reflect on that. This is the cost as a result of congestion, cars on roads, because the public transport is not sufficient to service the growing population in the Ipswich region. And that congestion cost is predicted to rise to $1.4 billion per year in 2036 if nothing is done. So that is why it is so pleasing that in the South East Queensland City deal on page 23 there's a reference to the $10 million of commitment from three le levels of government and from both, both major parties in this country, which is a great thing. And I'd like to personally take this opportunity to also uh, acknowledge the role that the Hon. Paul Fletcher played in terms of ensuring that this Springfield to Ipswich transport corridor was contained in the South East Queensland city plan. So thank you very, very much. I went through the presentation which was delivered by the representatives from Ipswich city earlier today, and it is just profound when you look at the growth in population that is occurring in this area of Queensland, this wonderful area of Queensland, which Senator Ayres should take the opportunity to visit as soon as possible. I'm sure he'll be extremely impressed with this area of Queensland. And just to let, just to get you, let you know the uh, the figures in relation to uh, population and job growth in this the fastest growing city in Queensland, it is estimated that between 2011 and 2041 there will be an extra 416,000 people in this region, nearly half a million extra people in this region, and an extra 65,000 jobs. So this is one of the fastest growing areas in Queensland, but it needs infrastructure to support that growth, infrastructure to support that growth. After I was elected as a senator, at the earliest opportunity, the earliest opportunity, I escaped from the central business district of Brisbane to move my office to one of the fastest growing areas of Australia, namely the Ipswich region. I, my office is in a wonderful place called Springfield in Queensland, Springfield City. Everyone's invited to come along and visit me in Springfield. It's a great place. Um, and the reason I did that, the reason I did that was so I had a better appreciation of the issues facing the people in what we refer to as the Southwest Corridor of Queensland, the fastest growing, the fastest growing region in Queensland. And when you speak, when you speak to the people, the local people residents, say. they tell you, what do you need? What do you need? More roads, more rail, more bridges. Road, rail and bridges. They're the issues. Infrastructure, transport infrastructure is what the people need. And if we're going to provide, if we're going to provide opportunities for young families to buy homes at affordable prices, we need to develop and provide the infrastructure in regions like Ipswich. So the Ipswich Central to Springfield Central Public Transport Corridor is a crucial piece of infrastructure. There are actually nine stations 
that would be constructed between Ipswich Central and Springfield Central to close that rail loop in this part of Queensland. And I'd also, also like to make it clear that it is so important it is so important for the people of Ipswich to have the same opportunities to access services, to access jobs, to access study as other people in Queensland have, and they need the public transport to actually assist in that endeavour. I would like to pay uh, my regards to uh, Multiculture Australia for their work in relation to in relation to the Red Bank Plains Community Centre, Multicultural Australia has actually done a great, uh, a great job in terms of promoting what's referred to as the Red Bank Plains Community Centre. That job, that community centre provides a great service to the people of Red Bank Plains. In their social impact ass assessment of that area, they found that some of the major issues were limited public transport, isolation, mental health pressures, financial pressures, pressures of rapid growth. That's why they need this infrastructure. That's why they need this infrastructure. And lastly, I'd also like to pay tribute to the wonderful president of the Ipswich Show Society, as I said, uh, President Darren Zarnow, and they have a proposal to actually construct a convention centre on the Ipswich Showgrounds, which would be connected by this public transport corridor. And I think that's an idea that deserves a lot of close attention. So uh, it's great. It was wonderful to see the delegation from Ipswich. Uh, they presented their case well, and let's get the Ipswich to Springfield transport corridor done. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The most recent flood in northern Australia has seen floodwaters extend from the Gulf uh, south for hundreds of kilometres. And it is shocking and it is frankly distressing the complete lack of interest and support from this federal government. And in opposition, Minister Murray Watt was full of advice on the speed of response and what the government should do. All, all advice that he has now completely forgotten. As Australians, we care about this region. It grows a huge amount of food. It extracts significant resources. It is a critical front line for defence for Australia. And it has, yes, only a few, but they are proud communities. Flooding is not new, and neither should the government's response be. Owners of the Tirana Springs Roadhouse, 34 kilometres southwest of Burktown, Jill and Tim Wilson, their children, Hunter Six and Holly Four, and their brother-in-law, Mick Wilson, were rescued off the back of a truck by a mustering chopper. They have lost their home and their business. The fences are flattened or missing. The generators and pumps are gone, their home and business is saturated, and all their hard work over the past five years lies covered in mud. Three horses, pigs, potty calves and poultry all drowned. But now they're worried about the insurance company paying the $3.2 million reconstruction bill. I can tell you other stories about Roxburgh Station. The young woman, Courtney McMillan, has done a terrific job about talking about what they have done, uh, building a levee around their property uh, in order to protect the homestead, the station workers' uh, quarters, and trying to protect a little bit of their country uh, there. Yurindanji, where the floodwaters swept that town away as well. There are stories like this right across the top of North Queensland and into the Northern Territory. There are people who have been rescued, plucked out of the waters uh, by mustering helicopters, by neighbours who have come to the aid of using uh, heavy equipment to try and build defence walls, uh, and communities have come together. And in 2019, we learnt lessons from flooding in the north. When the northwest monsoon event happened, uh, we learnt lessons and we learnt them fast. Disaster relief payments were made quickly. We didn't have to wait uh, the, the week or more until that $1,000 per person and $400 per child was announced by the, by the Emergency Services Minister. The Prime Minister came. The Defence Force was called in. The army choppers dropped fodder to save stock. 150 Australian Defence Force members were involved. 
70 were working in Richmond, Julia Creek and Cloncurry, and they delivered 32,000 litres of fuel to affected communities using transport aircraft. Defence planners and advisers working with local, state and federal government at Julia Creek. And the ADF team it included three engineering officers, an aviation officer, a vet, a logistics officer and an environmental health specialist. The RAAF delivered personal protective equipment and fuel drums were where needed. The local transport department finally got approvals made to allow stock that were washed up against fences to be buried. The coalition pledged $3.1 billion in aid all up for North and North West Queensland. So why didn't the Queensland government ask for help this time? Why didn't they ask for the army to be called in? People are angry. They're asking, where are the Premier's regular press conferences? Where's the Prime Minister? They're saying to me, cattle don't vote, and they're feeling abandoned. It doesn't matter what the government says it's doing. It's the perception of the people on the ground that's damning, and that's important. We have to address this debacle that is preventing people from accessing, fun accessing funds. And it's been nearly a week to allow them to release the special $1,000 payments for people who have lost everything, whose houses are gone, whose motor vehicles are underwater, who can't get work. So what is needed now? Well, in the most immediate time, we need mechanics to go on to remote communities, stations and uh, other places, to repair generators, to get the power back on, to fix farm equipment, to get Toyotas and, and other equipment running. And I thank most sincerely the civilian mechanics from as far away as Toowoomba who have volunteered their services. We are truly grateful. And in the future, we have got to start thinking about what the infrastructure requirements are. To, uh, Normanton had been cut off since the 3rd of January because of the wet season. Can you imagine saying to Canberra, giddy up everybody, you'll be out of contact for at least two months. You will not be able to drive out of this town because of seasonal floodwaters. And yet that's what the people of Normanton are facing. We need better culverts. We need the Birkenwills Roadhouse and the adjoining airstrip. We need that sealed and we need wet season drops, 5,000 litres of diesel, 5,000 litres of jet fuel, just to start to make sure we have a, a launching pad for floods into uh, the far north region of Queensland. Because these communities are cut off every year. Kaunyama was cut off for six months of last year. Six months! Where else in Australia is that acceptable? Well, I can tell you it's nowhere else. They need that road sealed. They need bridges built up to cross rivers to allow them for longer crossing periods. This strength of being resilient, which is what happens in North Queensland and other parts of Northern Australia, I'm afraid is also a weakness because regional people have learned to just get on with it and not wait for help. But it is not good enough to let these people be isolated each wet season and then completely forgotten in a flood event. Regional and remote Australians are used to having to, have a go, having to go to each other's aid and look after themselves. And this flood has proved no different. I could stand here for hours and tell you stories of neighbours assisting neighbours. I could tell you of rescuing families, of moving stock, of protecting properties. The importance of Northern Australia must be reflected in this government's policy making and planning. And I'm afraid that it is sadly, sadly lacking at present. The Northern Australian Minister couldn't even be bothered commenting to the media about these floods. And Senator Watt turned up last Friday. The latest media release from the Minister for Northern Australia about Northern Australia was on the 2nd of February. There has been radio silence since. And in that 2nd of February media release, it was about floods in northern Western Australia. There has been nothing about the Territory and nothing about North Queensland. Why? 
Why? What signal does that send if the, if the Minister for Northern Australia doesn't even care about these things? So it is sad that this Labor government has spent years politicising natural disasters, demanding more to be done, and yet when the responsibility lies with them, missing in action, full of excuses of what, why they are doing less, and after so zealously and viciously attacking the Coalition's response to the Lismore floods, you'd think Labor might get its own house in order takes a special lever of hubris to follow such strident criticism with what they have offered in North West Queensland. We know that state and federal Labor do not care about the regions. We know they will not fight for regional communities. and These recent flooding events have just highlighted that once again. People feel that Labor has gone missing in action when regional Queensland has faced a crisis. Why is it that the Premier can so quickly respond to floods in South East Queensland, a region full of Labor seats, but takes the time to say anything else about regions that they don't hold any seats in. And When people have been through a disaster like this, they need to feel that their government is standing with them. And When they don't see any serious presence from the, from the Prime Minister, from the Premier, what do you think they feel? Why have they not been? to Burketown, to Doomagee, to Urundanji, to offer real assistance to those people in need? Is it because there's no red carpet to roll out, no flashy press conference? Why is Murray Watt not calling out the Queensland Premier for not visiting these towns and communities? I can quote Murray Watt all night, but in his very own words, no more excuses, no Thank more you. obfuscation, no more blaming the states. Thank Just you, take responsibility. Senator Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I've said it before in this chamber and I'll say it again. Hypocrisy is just the latest virtue of green left activists and politicians to signal, and there's nothing more hypocritical than the destructive climate change ideology. The price of this hypocrisy is being paid right now by the Australian people, not the green left politicians themselves. This self-appointed elite is doing just fine. Thank you very much. And they don't give a damn that their actions are destroying this country and hurting the people who live in it. The rising cost of living in Australia are literally forcing families into homelessness, into greater debt, into making greater sacrifices to keep their children fed and in school. And the biggest component in the rapid inflation we're experiencing in Australia is soaring energy costs. Labor lied directly to the Australian people. No government in Australian history has, has more rapidly broken a promise than Labor's pledge at the election last year to reduce household energy bills. Labor knew it couldn't deliver the promise, and they never had any attention trying because it was totally incompatible with their obsession with reducing human-caused carbon dioxide emissions in Australia. This is nothing new. Energy bills have risen around 300 per cent since the large-scale penetration of renewable energy began some 20 years ago. It's no coincidence that as more wind farms blighted the landscape and more solar panels were installed in wealthy homes, all with hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer support, the energy bills paid by less fortunate Australians went up and up and up. And it's only getting worse. It's these same people now looking at a 56 per cent rise in electricity costs and a 40 per cent rise in gas costs over the next two years, thanks entirely to the green left obsession with human CO2 emissions. This obsession, pushed on by the corrupt UN and the IPCC, is also forcing the reliable power generated from coal and gas out of the system and our energy-rich country now faces serious shortages that will cripple farming and industry while leaving households in the cold this coming winter. What do the Australian people get in return for the enormous price they are forced to pay? Surely all this tremendous sacrifice and pain in Australia is achieving what the Green Left hypocrites say is their intention to save the world from temperature increases, sea level rise, 
droughts, floods and cyclones. The short answer is that it's achieving nothing at all. 97% of the world's CO2 comes from nature, from the soil, from the sea, from volcanoes. Only 3%, 3% is caused by humans and Australia's contribution is barely 1% of that 3%. Tell me how the hell shutting down our coal, gas and fossil fuel use is going to compete with more than a million volcanoes above and below the ocean surface. Now, um, and, to, and just to state some facts here to you, is the IPCC used a unique carbon chemical fingerprint of carbon dioxide in the air to determine the amount of human emissions from burning fossil fuels, gas, stubble, timber, forest and peat. However, there is just one slight problem. The carbon chemical fingerprint of carbon dioxide dissolved in the oceans from past volcanic activity and later released to the air by ocean degassing is the same as that released from the burning of fossil fuels and vegetation. Now they're attacking our cattle. I'd be more worried about solar cycles and the occasional impact event than farting cows. No amount of money or sacrifice can change this. None of this matters to the green left hypocrites looking down on us from their energy intensive mansions, their fuel guzzling four wheel drives that never see a dirt road and their high polluting private jets. They just continued with the lie that unless Australians act as they dictate, the entire planet is doomed. They lie while reaping the dividends from taxpayer fund money invested in this global green scam based on faulty computer models, doing their best to scare Australians into giving them this misinformed um, and to giving them their misinformed votes. Why don't Labor and the Greens condemn China? which emits more than CO2 in two weeks than Australia does in a whole year and is planning to build a 1,000 new coal um, power plants. Can you imagine the idiot activists who are vandalising works of art and gluing themselves to roads in Australia going to China to do the same? Well, neither can I. That's because they're not only hypocrites but pathetic, gutless cowards too. For them, China deserves leeway as a developing nation. Never mind it has the world's second largest economy, nuclear weapons and an active space program. This green left hypocrisy is on display in so many ways. Thousands of hectares of natural vegetation is cleared to build wind farms. Massive environmental damage is caused by producing the materials used for wind turbines, solar panels and rechargeable batteries. They refuse to even consider permitting the use of one of the low emissions technology which will deliver reliable energy, nuclear power, which is safely used in 30 countries around the world. And despite the fact that global CO2 emissions continue to rise, this hasn't even remotely led to the disasters we were promised by the green left prophets of doom. Remember when Tim Flannery promised our dams would run dry and our coasts would be permanently flooded by the sea? Our dams are full and our coasts remain exactly as they were. Flannery also implied so-called climate action was futile in a radio interview in March 2011. These were, his, these were his words. If the world as a whole cut all emissions tomorrow, the average temperature of the planet is not going to drop in several hundred years, perhaps as much as a thousand years. These green left prophets of doom were big on wild scaremongering. We were promised huge storms of unprecedented intensity would destroy our homes and infrastructure. It hasn't happened. Storms are no worse than they ever were and, in fact, have become less intense over the past 50 years. These are the hypocrites for which the Australian people are being forced to pay and sacrifice so much. Yet it's not enough for the green left political elite who can't even tell us what net zero actually means. It's never enough for the gutless activists. 
They will not be satisfied until Australia is a third world country in which only they are secure and comfortably well off. They are already destroying what's left of Australian manufacturing, crippling it with energy shortages and high energy costs and allowing them to be held hostage by union thugs. They are already killing off mining industries, a mainstay of our economy for centuries, employing hundreds of thousands of Australians. They are already attacking our world-leading agricultural industries, taking away their water and forcing higher production and input costs on farmers, that is, when they are not selling off our land to foreign interests. I despair for the future of this country held captive by the Green Left, while they work their hardest to make everyone poorer and more dependent on government handouts under the guise of saving the planet. It is the Australian people who need saving from this hypocrisy and patronising arrogance. Energy policy must prioritise affordability, reliability and resilience, not reducing human caused CO2. Energy policy must prioritise the use of a range of technologies from renewables through to nuclear to make sure we don't put all our eggs in one basket. Energy policy must leverage the advantages provided by our abundance of natural resources, coal, natural gas and uranium. Energy policy must put Australia and Australians first, not loyalty to the cult of climate change. Like all cults, the cult of climate change is ultimately about to turn Go, um, control. Climate change is used as an excuse to control energy production, control manufacturing, control travel and freight, control trade, control food production and control water supply. When this is achieved, they will have total control of the people. They will control where we live, the work we do, even the food we eat. Today's report by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change spells it out. The UN Secretary General's statement was full of the language of doom. He demanded that countries like Australia place more controls and restrictions on energy production. And we are listening to them. No, we're not and shouldn't. Stand Thank up you, for Senator Hanson. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I speak as a servant to the many different people who make up our amazing one Queensland community. I have not yet had a chance to make fun of Treasurer Jim Chalmers' Ode to Soviet Glory, titled Capitalism After the Crisis. So let me start there. A treasurer with no real-world business experience, no first-hand knowledge of free markets and no life outside the machine of politics has decided to tear down Australia's economic system and rebuild it, hammer in one hand, sickle in the other. Reinventing capitalism is not visionary, as Jim Chalmers hopes. It's a cliché. Senator Roberts, can I just remind you to address uh, people in the other place by their correct titles? Please. Mr Jim Chalmers. Uh, I believe he's the treasurer. Treasurer. Thank you. Minister. Worse, it confuses political theory with economics. The Treasurer has studied only one of those and it's not economics. Mr Jim Chalmers has studied political science and now sees every problem as a political one. The Treasurer knows nothing about economics and clearly dismisses the need for it. How ironic that Mr Jim Chalmers' now legendary article opens quoting the Greek philosopher Heraclitus when he says, quote, no man ever steps in the same river twice for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. What? It's not without merit that Heraclitus is known as the obscure philosopher. This nonsense may take the treasurer, make, make the treasurer sound smarter to dinner party for pseudo-intellectual lefties, yet to everyday Australians struggling with the rising cost of living, falling real wages and a housing shortage, it's nothing more than intellectual masturbation. When you hear command capitalism, out of the Treasurer, what he's really saying to the Australian people is, I don't trust you. I don't respect your choices. I don't recognise your freedom. Everything you have belongs to the state and you will do as we command. Commentators refer to this fantasy as Jimbonomics. That's their view. In reality, it's about threat, force and regulation designed to herd businesses into supporting fringe activism that rewards the elites at the expense of the everyday people. It's about control over we, the people. Rather than the state owning everything directly, all the wealth in the Treasurer's economy will be owned by the billionaires that own the UN and the World Economic Forum. Already woke politics has engineered a rapid descent into employee privacy to governments ranking a business based upon the race, religion, sexual preference, gender and disability status of its staff. Human beings have become commodities in the implementation phase of the Great Reset, the New World Order. 
the recent Workplace Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2023 from this government actually requires an employer to know the vaccine status of their employees and bar those people from the workplace if they are not vaccinated. Inhuman. And Pfizer says, cheers for that bill. Thank you. Treasurer Chalmers has lit a fire at the heart of Parliament that seeks to destroy everything good and prosperous that everyday Australians across the 235 years of Western settlement in Australia have built. As many have said in criticism of the Treasurer's treatise to communism, there can be no democracy without capitalism, and there is no capitalism without the free market. It's time we start asking, is Labor planning on reimagining democracy itself? Is it? The Albanese government has introduced legislation that clearly shows this is their intention. So at least the Treasurer has been honest about his intentions. Listen to these. The Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022 was nationalising the gas industry. The National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023 represents the government distorting the free market, taking it upon themselves to direct investment in manufacturing, using government money and stopping key investments in our future. The Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2022 imposes egregious controls on industry with ministerial direction to provide all of the details in the future unfettered, unfettered power. I'm sick of these bills that are all shopping bag and no shopping. It's not the purpose of the state to give the government of the day a bill with nothing actually in it so the government can fill in all the important bits later as it wants. Shame on the Greens and Teals for going along with this insult to the Westminster system of government. It must now be clear that George Carlin was absolutely correct. It's a club and everyday people, everyday Australians are not in it. Australians have never wanted the economy to be subservient to its political leaders. We have never wanted that. Command capitalism is anti-competitive. It allows the Albanese government to decide which Australian businesses get to succeed and which fail. Why does Mr Jim Chalmers feel the need to reinvent capitalism? Why does he feel that he is the first treasurer in Australian history that must take this step off the cliff into the abyss? I'll tell you why. The free market doesn't like what Labor is selling. The Australian people do not want to spend their money on inferior eco-products and self-serving CEOs who would happily see Australian families, families starved or freeze so long as they achieve their carbon dioxide footprint. Net zero policies are all fun and games until the lights go off and the bugs are served cold because, well, gas is now selfish and the power has gone off again. So cold it is. Why is it that the only environments the Labor Party doesn't want to help are the investment environment and the human environment. If the market doesn't want Labor's globalist vision, then the Prime Minister and his Treasurer must accept that. They have no right, and they were not voted into power, to dismantle capitalism, reimagine it, or duct tape it to a chair in the basement. It took Mr Jim Chalmers 6,000 words to explain that values-based capitalism means you will do as we say. The Soviet Union fell 30 years ago but Treasurer Chalmers is doing his best to drape its banners all over our parliament. Treasurer, give it up. Russia has. Jimbonomics, as some call it, will, will harm small and medium businesses and transfer wealth to the big end of town, whose market power allows them to comply with the Treasurer's demands. To comply is easy for them. Pass the cost on to the consumer, that's all. From the perspective of everyday Australians, green is the new red. From the perspective of the billionaires that Shadow wrote the Treasurer's Opus, green is the new gold. The only part of the Treasurer's Opus that was not lifted from the World Economic Forum Great Reset was the part that was deliberately left out. You will own nothing and you will be happy. Who will own what everyday Australians are no longer allowed? The houses, cars, furniture and re electricals. Why the predatory billionaires for whom Jim Chalmers is just a mouthpiece? Commanding the market during COVID has wrecked the market. Wages are falling, inflation is out of control, economic activity is down. Exports have grown to countries that ran their economies better than we did. They have the demand and the economic strength. Now Jim Chalmers wants to use more command economics to get us out of the hole in which command economics has buried us. Australia will not survive a second round of abuse from a treasurer who is handsy with other people's money. Markets do not belong to Mr Jim Chalmers and they do not belong to the Labor Party. Markets belong to the people and their private businesses. They belong to Australia. 
The big business investors in whose pocket the Treasurer so often resides, bankers in particular, would like nothing more than to kill off their market competition, to bury the small and medium businesses in a new mountain of controls and regulatory bondage. Their deaths will be celebrated in the name of saving the planet. Make no mistake, destroying small and medium business is the goal, not the un unintended consequence of green politics. For Labor, dealing with a handful of powerful CEOs is easier than 10 million small directors. But those directors are the ones keeping Australia back from the brink of ruin. The safest economies in history are the nimble free markets, repeatedly proven. They adapt to disasters, bounce back after injury and seek out the best solutions for the future. Free markets are far smarter than is Jim Chalmers. The beauty of free markets is that they are smarter by far than any individual or group. And sensible, honest people know this. Competent people know this. Jim Chalmers and his tr Soviet counterparts are too arrogant, or maybe that's too fearful, to understand that basic truth. The secret to being a truly great treasurer is to step back, to relinquish power, cut regulation, lower taxes, and let Australians do what Australians do best lift themselves up through their own hard work and enterprise. Businesses are not ideological vessels to carry Labor's election slogans tied to the Greens and the Teals. Businesses are not fodder in the insatiable thirst for more money, more power, more influence from the billionaires at the World Economic Forum. Control. Shame on the Treasurer for reaching well beyond his mandate. Put your greedy paws back in your pockets. It's time for the Treasurer and the Prime Minister to tell your billionaire masters, no. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, founded as a penal colony, and be damned if one nation party will let you take us back there again. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9am.